Section 1 of The Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray. Section 1. Introductory. Botany is the name of the science of the vegetable kingdom in general, that is, of plants. Plants may be studied as to their kinds and relationships. This study is systematic botany, an enumeration of the kinds of vegetables, as far as known, classified according to their various degrees of resemblance or difference, constitutes a general system of plants. A similar account of the vegetables of any particular country or district is called a flora. Plants may be studied as to their structure and parts. This is structural botany, or organography. The study of the organs or parts of plants in regard to the different forms and different uses which the same kind of organ may assume, the comparison, for instance, of a flower leaf or a bud scale with a common leaf, is vegetable morphology or morphological botany. The study of the minute structure of the parts, to learn by the microscope what they themselves are formed of, is vegetable anatomy or histology. In other words, it is microscopical structural botany. The study of the actions of plants or of their parts, of the ways in which a plant lives, grows, and acts, is the province of physiological botany or vegetable physiology. This book is to teach the outlines of structural botany and of the simpler parts of the physiology of plants, that it may be known how plants are constructed and adapted to their surroundings, and how they live, move, propagate, and have their being in an existence no less real, although more simple, than that of the animal creation which they support. Particularly, this book is to teach the principles of the structure and relationships of plants, the nature and names of their parts, and their modifications, and so to prepare for the study of systematic botany, in which the learner may ascertain the name and the place in the system of any or all of the ordinary plants within reach, whether wild or cultivated. And in ascertaining the name of any plant, the student, if rightly taught, will come to know all about its general or particular structure, rank, and relationship to other plants. The vegetable kingdom is so vast and various, and the difference is so wide between ordinary trees, shrubs, and herbs on the one hand, and mosses, molds, and such like on the other, that it is hardly possible to frame an intelligible account of plants as a whole without contradictions or misstatements or endless and troublesome qualifications. If we say that plants come from seeds, bear flowers, and have roots, stems, and leaves, this is not true of the lower orders. It is best for the beginner, therefore, to treat of the higher orders of plants by themselves without particular reference to the lower. Let it be understood, accordingly, that there is a higher and a lower series of plants, namely, phanerogamous plants, which come from seed and bear flowers, essentially stamens and pistils, through the cooperation of which seed is produced. For shortness, these are commonly called phanerogams or phenogams, or by the equivalent English name of flowering plants. Cryptogamous plants, or cryptogams, come from minute bodies, which answer to seeds, but are of much simpler structure, and such plants have not stamens and pistils. Therefore, they are called in English flowerless plants. Such are ferns, mosses, algae or seaweeds, fungi, etc., these sorts have each to be studied separately, for each class or order has a plan of its own. But phanerogamous or flowering plants are all constructed on one plan or type. That is, taking almost any ordinary herb, shrub, or tree for a pattern, it will exemplify the whole series. The parts of one plant answer to the parts of any other, with only certain differences in particulars. And the occupation and the delight of the scientific botanist is in tracing out this common plan, in detecting the likenesses under all the diversities, and in noting the meaning of these manifold diversities. So the attentive study of any one plant, from its growth out of the seed to the flowering and fruiting state, and the production of seed like to that form from which the plant grew, would not only give a correct general idea of the structure, growth, and characteristics of flowering plants in general, but also serve as a pattern or standard of comparison. Some plants will serve this purpose of a pattern much better than others. A proper pattern will be one that is perfect in the sense of having all the principal parts of a phanerogamous plant, 
and simple and regular in having these parts free from complications or disguises. The common flax plant may very well serve this purpose. Being an annual, it has the advantage of being easily raised and carried in a short time through its circle of existence from seedling to fruit and seed. End of section one. Section two of the Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray. Section two. Flax as a Pattern Plant. Growth from the Seed. Phanerogamous plants grow from seed and their flowers are destined to the production of seeds. A seed has a rudimentary plant ready formed in it, sometimes with the two most essential parts, that is, stem and leaf, plainly discernible, sometimes with no obvious distinction of organs until germination begins. This incipient plant is called an embryo. In this section, the flax plant is taken as a specimen, or type, and the development and history of common plants in general is illustrated by it. In flaxseed, the embryo nearly fills the coats, but not quite. There is a small deposit of nourishment between the seed coat and the embryo. This may be for the present left out of the account. This embryo consists of a pair of leaves pressed together face to face and attached to an extremely short stem. In this rudimentary condition, the real nature of the parts is not at once apparent, but when the seed grows, they promptly reveal their character, before the nature of these parts in the seed was altogether understood, technical names were given to them, which are still in use. These initial leaves were called cotyledons. The initial stem on which they stand was called the radical. That was because it gives rise to the first root. But as it is really the beginning of the stem, and because it is the stem that produces the root and not the root that produces the stem, it is better to name it the colicle. Recently, it has been named hypocotyl, which signifies something below the cotyledons, without pronouncing what its nature is. On committing these seeds to moist and warm soil, they soon sprout, that is, germinate. The very short stem part of the embryo is the first to grow. It lengthens, protrudes its root end, this turns downward, if not already pointing in that direction, and while it is lengthening, a root forms at its point, and grows downward into the ground. This root continues to grow on from its lower end, and thus insinuates itself and penetrates into the soil. The stem, meanwhile, is adding to its length throughout. It erects itself, and seeking the light, brings the seed up out of the ground. The materials for this growth have been supplied by the cotyledons, or seed leaves, still in the seed. It was the store of nourishing material they held, which gave them their thickest shape, so unlike that of ordinary leaves. Now, relieved of a part of this store of food, which has formed the growth by which they have been raised into the air and light, they appropriate the remainder to their own growth. In enlarging, they open and throw off the seed husk. They expand, diverge into a horizontal position, turn green, and thus become a pair of evident leaves, the first foliage of a tiny plant. This seedling although diminutive and most simple, possesses and puts into use all the organs of vegetation, namely root, stem, and leaves, each in its proper element. The root in the soil, the stem rising out of it, the leaves in the light and open air. It now draws in moisture and some food materials from the soil by its root, conveys this through the stem into the leaves, where these materials, along with other crude food, which these imbibe from the air, are assimilated into vegetable matter, that is, into the material for further growth. Further growth soon proceeds to the formation of new parts, downward in the production of more root, or of branches of the main root, upward in the development of more stem and leaves. That from which a stem with its leaves is continued, or a new stem, that is, branch, originated, is a bud. The most conspicuous and familiar buds are those of most shrubs and trees, bearing buds formed in summer or autumn to grow the following spring. But every such point for new growth may equally bear the name. 
when there is such a bud between the cotyledons in the seed or seedling, it is called the plumule. This is conspicuous enough in a bean, where the young leaf of the new growth looks like a little plume, whence the name plumule. In flaxseed, this is very minute indeed, but is discernible with a magnifier, and in the seedling it shows itself distinctly. As it grows, it shapes itself into a second pair of leaves, which of course rests on a second joint of stem, although in this instance that remains too short to be well seen. Upon its summit appears the third pair of leaves, soon to be raised upon its proper joint of stem. The next leaf is single, and is carried up still further upon its supporting joint of stem, and so on. The root, meanwhile, continues to grow underground, not joint after joint, but continuously from its lower end, and commonly it before long multiplies itself by branches, which lengthen by the same continuous growth. But stems are built up by a succession of leaf-bearing growths, such as are strongly marked in a reed or corn stalk, and less so in such an herb as flax. The word joint is ambiguous. It may mean either the portion between successive leaves or their junction, where the leaves are attached. For precision, therefore, the place where the leaf or leaves are born is called a node, and the naked interval between two nodes an internode. In this way, a simple stem with its garniture of leaves is developed from the seed. But besides this direct continuation, buds may form and develop into lateral stems, that is, into branches from any node. The proper origin of branches is from the axle of a leaf, that is, the angle between leaf and stem on the upper side, and branches may again branch, so building up the herb, shrub, or tree. But sooner or later, and without long delay in an annual like flax, instead of this continuance of mere vegetation, reproduction is prepared for by blossoming. In flax, the flowers make their appearance at the end of the stem and branches. The growth, which otherwise might continue them farther or indefinitely, now takes the form of blossom and is subservient to the production of seed. The flower of flax consists, first, of five small green leaves crowded into a circle. This is the calyx, or flower cup. When its separate leaves are referred to, they are called sepals, a name which distinguishes them from foliage leaves on the one hand and from petals on the other. Then come five delicate and colored leaves, in the flax blue, which form the corolla, and its leaves are petals. Then a circle of organs, in which all likeness to leaves is lost, consisting of slender stalks with a knob at summit, the stamens. And lastly, in the center, the rounded body, which becomes a pod, surmounted by five slender or stalk-like bodies. This, altogether, is the pistil. The lower part of it, which is to contain the seeds, is the ovary, the slender organs surmounting this are styles. The knob borne on the apex of each style is a stigma. Going back to the stamens, these are of two parts, namely the stalk, called filament, and the body it bears, the anther. Anthers are filled with pollen, a powdery substance made up of minute grains. The pollen shed from the anthers when they open falls upon or is conveyed to the stigmas, then the pollen grains set up a kind of growth, to be discerned only by aid of a good microscope, which penetrates the style. This growth takes the form of a thread more delicate than the finest spider's web, and reaches the bodies which are to become seeds. Ovules, they are called, until this change occurs. These, touched by this influence, are incited to a new growth within, which becomes an embryo. So, as the ovary ripens into the seed pod or capsule containing seeds, each seed enclosing a rudimentary new plantlet, the round of this vegetable existence is completed. End of section 2。section 3 of the elements of botany。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corinne LePage. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray. Section 3. Morphology of Seedlings. 
Having obtained a general idea of the growth and parts of a phenerogamous plant from the common flax of the field, the seeds and seedlings of other familiar plants may be taken up, and their variations from the assumed pattern examined. Germinating maples are excellent to begin with, the parts being so much larger than in flax that a common magnifying glass, although convenient, is hardly necessary. The only disadvantage is that fresh seeds are not readily to be had at all seasons. Figure 11. Embryo of sugar maple cut through lengthwise and taken out of the seed. Figure 12 and 13. Whole embryo of same just beginning to grow. A. The stemlet or collicle, which in figure 13 has considerably lengthened. The seeds of sugar maple ripen at the end of summer, and germinate in early spring. The embryo fills the whole seed, in which it is nicely packed, and the nature of the parts is obvious even before growth begins. There is a stemlet, collicle, and a pair of long and narrow seed leaves, cotyledons, doubled up and coiled, green even in the seed, and in germination at once unfolding into the first pair of foliage leaves, though a shape quite unlike those that follow. Red maple seeds are ripe and ready to germinate at the beginning of summer, and are therefore more convenient for study. The cotyledons are crumpled in the seed, and not easy to straighten out until they unfold themselves in germination. The story of their development into the seedling is told by the accompanying figures 14 to 20, and that of sugar maple is closely similar. No plumule or bud appears in the embryo of these two maples until the seed leaves have nearly attained their full growth and are acting as foliage leaves, and until a root is formed below. There is no great store of nourishment in these thin cotyledons, so further growth has to wait until the root and seed leaves have collected and elaborated sufficient material for the formation of the second internode and its pair of leaves, which lending their help, the third pair is more promptly produced, and so on. Some change in the plan comes with the silver or soft white maple. This blossoms in earliest spring, and it drops its large and ripened keys only a few weeks later. Its cotyledons have not at all the appearance of leaves. They are short and broad, and, as there is no room to be saved by folding, they are straight, except a small fold at the top, a vestige of the habit of maples in general. Their unusual thickness is due to the large store of nutritive matter they contain, and this prevents their developing into actual leaves. Correspondingly, their collicle does not lengthen to elevate them above the surface of the soil. The growth below the cotyledons is nearly all of root. It is the little plumule or bud between them which makes the upward growth, and which, being well fed by the cotyledons, rapidly develops the next pair of leaves and raises them upon a long internode, and so on. The cotyledons all the while remain below, in the husk of the fruit and seed, and perish when they have yielded up the store of food which they contained. Figure 14. One of the pair of keys or winged fruits of red maple. The seed-bearing portion cut open to show the seed. Figure 15. Seed enlarged and divided to show the crumpled embryo which fills it. Figure 16. Embryo taken out and partly opened. Figure 17. Embryo which has unfolded in early stage of germination and begun to grow. Figure 18. Seedling with next joint of stem and leaves apparent. And figure 19. With these parts full grown. And bud at apex for further growth. Figure 20. Seedling with another joint of stem and pair of leaves. So, even in plants so much alike as maples, there is considerable difference in the amount of food stored up in the cotyledons by which the growth is to be made, and there are corresponding differences in the germination. The larger the supply to draw upon, the stronger the growth, and the quicker the formation of root below and stem and leaves above. This deposit of food thickens the cotyledons, and renders them less and less leaf-like in proportion to its amount. Figure 21. Fruit, one key, of silver maple, Acer dasicarpum, of natural size, the seed-bearing portion divided to show the seed. Figure 22. Embryo of the seed taken out. 
Figure 23. Same opened out to show the thick cotyledons and the little plumule or bud between them. Figure 24. Germination of silver maple, natural size, merely the base of the fruit, containing the seed, is shown. Figure 25. Embryo of same, taken out of the husk, upper part of growing stem cut off for want of room. Examples of embryos with thickened cotyledons. In the pumpkin and squash, the cotyledons are well supplied with nourishing matter, as their sweet taste demonstrates. Still, they are flat and not very thick. In germination, this store is promptly utilized in the development of the collicle to twenty or thirty times its length in the seed, and to corresponding thickness in the formation of a cluster of roots at its lower end, and the early production of the incipient pumule, also in their growth into efficient green leaves. The case of our common bean, Fasciolus vulgaris, is nearly the same, except that the cotyledons are much more gorged, so that, although carried up into the air and light upon the lengthening collicle, and there acquiring a green color, they never expand into useful leaves. Instead of this, they nourish into rapid growth the plumule, which is plainly visible in the seed, as a pair of incipient leaves, and these form the first actual foliage. Very similar is the germination of the beech, except that the collicle lengthens less, hardly raising the cotyledons out of the ground. Nothing would be gained by elevating them, as they never grow out into efficient leaves, but the joint of stem belonging to the plumule lengthens well, carrying up its pair of real foliage leaves. It is nearly the same in the bean of the old world, the siafaba, here called horse bean and windsor bean. The collicle lengthens very little, does not undertake to elevate the heavy seed, which is left below or upon the surface of the soil, the flat but thick cotyledons remaining in it, and supplying food for the growth of the root below and the plumule above. In its near relative, the pea, this use of cotyledons for storage only is most completely carried out, for they are thickened to the utmost, even into hemispheres. The collicle does not lengthen at all, merely sends out roots from the lower end and develops its strong plumule from the upper, the seed remaining unmoved underground. That is, in technical language, the germination is hypogeous. Figure 26. Embryo of pumpkin seed, partly opened. Figure 27. Young seedling of same. Figure 28. Embryo of common bean, Fasciolus vulgaris, Collical bent down over edge of cotyledons. Figure 29. Same germinating, collical well lengthened and root beginning, thick cotyledons partly spreading, and plumule, pair of leaves, growing between them. Figure 30. Same older with plumule developed into internode and pair of leaves. There is sufficient nourishment in the cotyledons of a pea to make a very considerable growth before any actual foliage is required. So it is the stem portion of the plumule which is at first conspicuous and strong growing. Here, as seen in figure 35, its lower nodes bear each a useless leaf scale instead of an efficient leaf, and only the later ones bear leaves fitted for foliage. Figure 31. A beech nut cut across. Figure 32. Beginning germination of the beech, showing the plumule growing before the cotyledons have opened, or the root has scarcely formed. Figure 33. The same, a little later, with the plumule leaves developing, and elevated on a long internode. Figure 34. Embryo of a pea, i.e. a pea, with the coats removed, the short and thick collicle presented to view. Figure 35. Same in advanced germination, the plumule has developed four or five internodes, bearing single leaves, but the first and second leaves are mere scales, the third begins to serve as foliage, the next more so. This hypogeous germination is exemplified on a larger scale by the oak and horse chestnut, but in these the downward growth is wholly a stout taproot. It is not the collicle, for this lengthens hardly any. Indeed, the earliest growth, which carries the very short collicle out of the shell, comes from the formation of footstalks to the cotyledons. Above these develops the strong plumule, below grows the stout root. 
the growth is at first entirely for a long time mainly at the expense of the great store of food in the cotyledons these after serving their purpose decay and fall away figure thirty six half of an acorn cut lengthwise filled by the very thick cotyledons the base of which encloses the minute collicle figure thirty seven oak seedling figure thirty eight half of a horse chestnut similarly cut the collicle is curved down on the side of one of the thick cotyledons figure thirty nine horse chestnut in germination footstalks are formed to the cotyledons pushing out in their lengthening the growing parts such thick cotyledons never separate indeed they sometimes grow together by some part of their contiguous faces so that the germination seems to proceed from a solid bulb-like mass this is the case in a horse chestnut germinating embryo supplied by its own store of nourishment i e the store in the cotyledons this is so in all the illustrations thus far essentially so even in the flax this nourishment was supplied by the mother plant to the ovule and seed and thence taken into the embryo during its growth such embryos filling the whole seed are comparatively large and strong and vigorous in germination in proportion to the amount of their growth while connected with the parent plant germinating embryo supplied by a deposit outside of itself this is as common as the other mode and it occurs in all degrees some seeds have very little of this deposit but a comparatively large embryo with its parts more or less developed and recognizable in others this deposit forms the main bulk of the seed and the embryo is small or minute and comparatively rudimentary the following illustrations exemplify these various grades when an embryo in a seed is thus surrounded by a white substance it was natural to liken the latter to a white of an egg and the embryo or germ to the yolk so the matter around or by the side of the embryo was called the albumen i e the white of the seed the analogy is not very good and to avoid ambiguity some botanists call it the endosperm as that means in english merely the inwards of a seed the new name is little better than the old one and since we do not change names in botany except when it cannot be avoided this name of albumen is generally kept up a seed with such a deposit is albuminous one with none is exalbuminous the albumen forms in the main bulk of the seed in wheat maize rice buckwheat and the like it is the flowery part of the seed also of the coconut of coffee where it is dense and hard etc while in peas beans almonds and in most edible nuts the store of food although essentially the same in nature and in use is in the embryo itself and therefore is not counted as anything to be separately named in both forms this concentrated food for the germinating plant is food also for man and for animals figure forty seed of morning glory divided moderately magnified shows a longitudinal section through the centre of the embryo as it lies crumpled in the albumen figure forty one embryo taken out whole and unfolded the broad and very thin cotyledons notched at summit the collicle below figure forty two early state of germination figure forty three same more advanced collicle or primary stem cotyledons or seed leaves and below the root well developed for an albuminous seed with a well-developed embryo the common morning glory ipomia purpurea figures forty to forty three is a convenient example being easy and prompt to grow and having all the parts well apparent the seeds duly soaked for examination and the germination should be compared with those of sugar and red maple the only essential difference is that here the embryo is surrounded by and crumpled up in the albumen this substance which is pulpy or mucilaginous in fresh and young seeds hardens as the seed ripens but becomes again pulpy in germination and as it liquefies the thin cotyledons absorb it by their whole surface it supplements the nutritive matter contained in the embryo both together form no large store but sufficient for establishing the seedling with tiny root stem and pair of leaves for initiating its independent growth which in due time proceeds as in figure forty four and forty five figure forty four 
seedling of morning glory more advanced, root cut away, cotyledons well developed into foliage leaves, succeeding internode and leaf well developed, and in the next forming. Figure 45. Seedling more advanced, reduced to much below natural size. Smaller embryos less developed in the seed are more dependent upon extraneous supply of food. The figures 46 to 53 illustrate four grades in this respect. The smallest, that of the peony, is still large enough to be seen with a hand magnifying glass, and even its cotyledons may be discerned by the aid of a simple stage microscope. The broad cotyledons of Mirabilis, or four o'clock, with the slender collicle almost encircle and enclose the flowery albumen, instead of being enclosed in it, as in the other illustrations. Evidently, here the germinating embryo is principally fed by one of the leaf-like cotyledons, the other being out of contact with the supply. In the embryo of Abronia, a near relative of Mirabilis, there is a singular modification. One cotyledon is almost wanting, being reduced to a rudiment, leaving it for the other to do the work. This leads to the question of the number of cotyledons. In all the preceding illustrations, the embryo, however different in shape and degree of development, is evidently constructed upon one and the same plan, namely, that of two leaves on a collicle or initial stem, a plan which is obvious even when one cotyledon becomes very much smaller than the other, as in the rare instance of the abronia, figures 54 and 55. In other words, the embryos so far examined are all dicotyledonous, that is, too cotyledoned. Plants which are thus similar in the plan of the embryo agree likewise in the general structure of their stems, leaves, and blossoms, and thus form a class named from their embryo dicotyledons, or in English dicotyledonous plants. So long a name being inconvenient, it may be shortened to dicotyls. Figure 46, section of a seed of a peony, showing a very small embryo in the albumen, near one end. Figure 47. This embryo detached and more magnified. Figure 48. Section of a seed of barberry, showing the straight embryo in the middle of the albumen. Figure 49. Its embryo detached. Figure 50. Section of a potato seed, showing the embryo coiled in the albumen. Figure 51. Its embryo detached. Figure 52. Section of the seed of mirabalis, or for a clock showing the embryo coiled around the outside of the albumen. Figure 53, embryo detached, showing the very broad and leaf-like cotyledons applied face to face, and the pair incurved. Figure 54, embryo of Abronia umbilata, one of the cotyledons very small. Figure 55, same straightened out. Polycotyledonous is a name employed for the less usual case in which there are more than two cotyledons. The pine is the most familiar case. This occurs in all pines, the number of cotyledons varying from 3 to 12. In figures 56 and 57, they are 6. Note that they are all on the same level, that is, belong to the same node, so as to form a circle or whorl at the summit of the collicle. When there are only three cotyledons, they divide the space equally, are one-third of the circle apart. When only two, they are 180 degrees apart, that is, are opposite. In the case of three or more cotyledons, which is constant in pines and in some of their relatives, but not in all of them, is occasional among dicotyls, and the polycotyledonous is only a variation on the dicotyledonous type. A difference in the number of leaves in the whorl for a pair is a whorl reduced to two members. Some suppose that there are really only two cotyledons even in a pine embryo, but these divided or split up congenitally so as to imitate a greater number. But as leaves are often in whorls on ordinary stems, they may be so at the very beginning. Figure 56, section of a pine seed, showing its polycotyledonous embryo in the center of the albumen, moderately magnified, Figure 57. Seedling of the same, showing the freshly expanded six cotyledons in a whorl, and the plumule just appearing. Monocotyledonous, meaning with a single cotyledon, 
is the name of the one cotyledon sort of embryo. This goes along with the peculiarities in stem, leaves, and flowers, which altogether associate such plants into a great class called monocotyledonous plants, or, for shortness, monocotyls. It means merely that the leaves are alternate from the very first. In iris, figures 58 and 59, the embryo in the seed is a small cylinder at one end of the mass of the albumen, with no apparent distinction of parts. The end which almost touches the seed coat is collicle. The other end belongs to the solitary cotyledon. In germination, the whole lengthens, but mainly the cotyledon, only enough to push the proximate end fairly out of the seed. From this end, the root is formed, and from a little higher, the plumule later emerges. It would appear, therefore, that the cotyledon answers to a minute leaf rolled up, and that a chink through which the plumule grows out is a part of the inrolled edges. The embryo of Indian corn shows these parts on a larger scale and in a more open state, figures 66 to 68. There, in the seed, the cotyledon remains, imbibing nourishment from the softened albumen, and transmitting it to the growing root below and new-forming leaves above. Figure 58. Section of a seed of the iris, or flower de luce, enlarged, showing its small embryo in the albumen near the bottom. Figure 59. A germinating seedling of the same, its plumule developed into the first four leaves, alternate, the first one rudimentary. The cotyledon remains in the seed. Figure 60. Section of an onion seed showing the slender and coiled embryo in the albumen, moderately magnified. Figure 61. Seed of the same in early germination. Figure 62. Germinating onion, more advanced, the chink at base of cotyledon, opening for the protrusion of the plumule, consisting of a thread-shaped leaf. Figure 63. Section of base of figure 62, showing plumule enclosed. Figure 64. Section of same later plumule merging. Figure 65. Later stage of 62, upper part cut off. Figure 66. A grain of Indian corn, flatwise, cut away a little so as to show the embryo lying on the albumen, which makes the principal bulk of the seed. Figure 67. A grain cut through the middle in the opposite direction, dividing the embryo through its thick cotyledon and its plumule, the latter consisting of two leaves, one enclosing the other. Figure 68. The embryo taken out whole. The thick mass is the cotyledon. The narrow body, partly enclosed by it, is the plumule. The little projection at its base is the very short radical enclosed in the sheathing base of the first leaf of the plumule. Figure 69. Grain of Indian corn in germination. The ascending sprout is the first leaf of the plumule, enclosing the younger leaves within. At its base, the primary root has broken through. Figure 70. The same advanced, the second and third leaves developing, while the sheathing first leaf does not further develop. The general plan is the same in the onion, figures 60 to 65, but with a striking difference. The embryo is long and coiled in the albumen of the seed. To ordinary examination, it shows no distinction of parts, but germination plainly shows that all except the lower end of it is cotyledon. For after it has lengthened into a long thread, the chink from which the plumule in time emerges is seen at the base or near it, so the collicle is extremely short and does not elongate, but sends out from its base a simple root, and afterwards others in a cluster. Not only does the cotyledon lengthen enormously in the seedling, but, unlike that of iris, Indian corn, and all the cereal grains, it raises the comparatively light seed into the air, the tips still remaining in the seed and feeding upon the albumen. When this food is exhausted and the seedling is well established in the soil, the upper end decays and the emptied husk of the seed falls away. In maize or Indian corn, figures 66 to 70, the embryo is more developed in the seed and its parts can be made out. It lies against the starchy albumen, but is not enclosed therein. 
The larger part of it is the cotyledon, thickish, its edges involute, and its back in contact with the albumen. Partly enclosed by it is the well-developed plumule, or bud, which is to grow. For the cotyledon remains in the seed to fulfill its office of imbibing nourishment from the softened albumen, which it conveys to the growing sprout. The part of this sprout which is visible is the first leaf of the plumule rolled up into a sheath and enclosing the rudiments of the succeeding leaves, at the base enclosing even the minute collicle. In germination, the first leaf of the plumule develops only as a sort of sheath, protecting the tender parts within. The second and third form the first foliage. The collicle never lengthens. The first root, which is formed at its lower end, or from any part of it, has to break through the enclosing sheath, and succeeding roots soon spring from all or any of the nodes of the plumule. Simple stemmed plants are thus built up, by the continuous production of one leaf-bearing portion of stem from the summit of the preceding one, beginning with the initial stem, or collicle, in the embryo. Some dicotyls and many monocotyls develop only in this single line of growth, as to parts above ground, until the flowering state is approached. For some examples, see cycas, figure 71 front at the left, a tall yucca or Spanish bayonet, and two coconut palms behind, at the right, form a group of sugar canes and a banana behind. End of section 3. Recording by Corinne LePage. Section 4 of The Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray. Section 4 Growth from Buds branching. Most plants increase the amount of their vegetation by branching, that is, by producing lateral shoots. Roots branch from any part and usually without definite order. Stems normally give rise to branches only at definite points, namely at the nodes, and there only from the axils of leaves. Buds. Every incipient shoot is a bud, a stem continues its growth by its terminal bud. It branches by the formation and development of lateral buds. As normal lateral buds occupy the axils of leaves, they are called axillary buds. As leaves are symmetrically arranged on the stem, the buds in their axils and the branches into which axillary buds grow partake of this symmetry. The most conspicuous buds are the scaly winter buds of most shrubs and trees of temperate and cold climates, but the name belongs as well to the forming shoot or branch of any herb. The terminal bud, in the most general sense, may be said to exist in the embryo, as cotyledons or the cotyledons and plumule, and to crown each successive growth of the simple stem so long as the summit is capable of growth. The whole ascending growth of the palm, cycas, and the like is from a terminal bud. Branches being repetitions of the main stem and growing in the same way are also lengthened by terminal buds. Those of horse chestnut, hickory, maples, and such trees being the resting buds of winter are conspicuous by their protective covering of scales. These bud scales, as will hereafter be shown, are themselves a kind of leaves. Axillary buds were formed on these annual shoots early in the summer. Occasionally they grow the same season into branches. At least some of them are pretty sure to do so whenever the growing terminal bud at the end of the shoot is injured or destroyed. Otherwise, they may lie dormant until the following spring. In many trees or shrubs, these axillary buds do not show themselves until spring, but if searched for, they may be detected, though of small size, hidden under the bark. Sometimes, although early formed, 
they are concealed all summer long under the base of the leaf stalk which is then hollowed out into a sort of inverted cup like a candle extinguisher to cover them as in the locust the yellow wood or more strikingly in the buttonwood or plane tree the leaf scars so conspicuous in figures seventy two and seventy three under each axillary bud mark the place where the stalk of the subtending leaf was attached until it fell in autumn scaly buds which are well represented in figures seventy two and seventy three commonly belong to trees and shrubs of countries in which growth is suspended during winter these scaly coverings protect the tender young parts beneath not so much by keeping out the cold which of course would penetrate the bud in time as by shielding the interior from the effects of sudden changes there are all gradations between these and naked buds in which these scales are inconspicuous or wanting as in most herbs at least above ground and most tropical trees and shrubs but nearly related plants of the same climate may differ widely in this respect rhododendrons have strong and scaly winter buds while in calmia they are naked one species of viburnum the hobble bush has completely naked buds what would be a pair of scales developing into the first leaves in the spring while another the snowball has conspicuous scaly buds vigor of vegetation from strong buds large and strong buds like those of the horse chestnut hickory and the like contain several leaves or pairs of leaves ready formed folded and packed away in small compass just as the seed leaves of a strong embryo are packed away in the seed they may even contain all the blossoms of the ensuing season plainly visible as small buds and the stems upon which these buds rest are filled with abundant nourishment which was deposited the summer before in the wood or in the bark under the surface of the soil or on it covered with fallen leaves of autumn similar strong buds of our perennial herbs may be found while beneath are thick roots rootstocks or tubers charged with a great store of nourishment for their use this explains how it is that vegetation from such buds shoots forth so vigorously in the spring of the year and clothes the bare and lately frozen surface of the soil as well as the naked boughs of trees very promptly with a covering of fresh green and often with brilliant blossoms everything was prepared and even formed beforehand the short joints of stem in the bud have only to lengthen and to separate the leaves from each other so that they may unfold and grow only a small part of the vegetation of the season comes directly from the seed and none of the earliest vernal vegetation this is all from buds which have lived throughout the winter the arrangement of branches being that of axillary buds answers to that of the leaves now leaves principally are either opposite or alternate leaves are opposite when there are two from the same joint of stem as in maples the two being on opposite sides of the stem and so the axillary buds and branches are opposite as in figure seventy five leaves are alternate when there is only one from each joint of stem as in the oak lime tree poplar buttonwood morning glory not counting the seed leaves which of course are opposite there being a pair of them also in indian corn and iris consequently the axillary buds are also alternate as in hickory and the branches they form alternate making a different kind of spray from the other mode one branch shooting on one side of the stem and the next on some other for in the alternate arrangement no leaf is on the same side of the stem as the one next above or next below it but the symmetry of branches unlike that of the leaves is rarely complete this is due to several causes and most commonly to the non-development of buds it never happens that all the buds grow 
If they did, there might be as many branches in any year as there were leaves the year before, and of those which do begin to grow, a large portion perish sooner or later, for want of nourishment, or for want of light, or because those which first begin to grow have an advantage, which they are apt to keep, taking to themselves the nourishment of the stem, and starving the weaker buds, in the horse chestnut, hickory, magnolia, and most other trees with large scaly buds, the terminal bud is the strongest, and has the advantage in growth, and next in strength are the upper axillary buds, while the former continues the shoot of the last year, some of the latter give rise to branches, and the rest fail to grow. In the lilac also, the uppermost axillary buds are stronger than the lower, but the terminal bud rarely appears at all. In its place, the uppermost pair of axillary buds grow, and so each stem branches every year into two, making a repeatedly two-forked ramification, as in figure 76. Latent Buds Axillary buds that do not grow at the proper season, and especially those which make no appearance externally, may long remain latent, and at length upon a favorable occasion start into growth, so forming branches apparently out of place as they are out of time. The new shoots seen springing directly out of large stems may sometimes originate from such latent buds, which have preserved their life for years but commonly these arise from adventitious buds. These are buds which certain shrubs and trees produce anywhere on the surface of the wood, especially where it has been injured. They give rise to the slender twigs, which often feather the sides of great branches of our American elms. They sometimes form on the root, which naturally is destitute of buds. They are even found upon some leaves, and they are sure to appear on the trunks and roots of willows, poplars, and chestnuts, when these are wounded or mutilated. Indeed, osier willows are pollarded or cut off from time to time by the cultivator, for the purpose of producing a crop of slender adventitious twigs, suitable for basket work. Such branches, being although irregular, of course interfere with the natural symmetry of the tree, Another cause of irregularity in certain trees and shrubs is the formation of what are called accessory or supernumerary buds. These are cases where two, three, or more buds spring from the axil of a leaf instead of the single one which is ordinarily found there. Sometimes they are placed one over the other, as in the Aristolicia or pipe vine, and in the Tartarian honeysuckle also in the honey locust, and in the walnut and butternut, where the upper supernumerary bud is a good way out of the axle and above the others. And this is here stronger than the others, and grows into a branch which is considerably out of the axle, while the lower and smaller ones commonly do not grow at all. In other cases, three buds stand side by side in the axle, as in the hawthorn and the red maple. If these were all to grow into branches, they would stifle each other. But some of them are commonly flower buds, as in the red maple. Only the middle one is a leaf bud, and it does not grow until after those on each side of it have expanded the blossoms they contain. Sorts of Buds it may be useful to enumerate the kinds of buds which have been described or mentioned. They are terminal, when they occupy the summit or terminate a stem. Lateral, when they are born on the side of a stem, of which the regular kind is the axillary, situated in the axil of a leaf. These are accessory or supernumerary, when they are in addition to the normal solitary bud, and these are collateral when side by side, superposed when one above the other, extra axillary, when they appear above the axil, as some do when superposed, and as occasionally is the case when single. Naked buds. 
those which have no protecting scales. Scaly buds, those which have protecting scales, which are altered leaves or bases of leaves. Leaf buds, contain or give rise to leaves and develop into a leafy shoot. Flower buds, contain or consist of blossoms and no leaves. Mixed buds, contain both leaves and blossoms. Definite annual growth from winter buds is marked in most of the shoots from strong buds, such as those of the horse chestnut and hickory. Such a bud generally contains, already formed in miniature, all or a great part of the leaves and joints of stem it is to produce, makes its whole growth in length in the course of a few weeks, or sometimes even in a few days, and then forms and ripens its buds for the next year's similar growth. Indefinite annual growth, on the other hand, is well marked in such trees or shrubs as the honey locust, sumac, and in sterile shoots of the rose, blackberry, and raspberry. That is, these shoots are apt to grow all summer long, until stopped by the frosts of autumn or some other cause. Consequently, they form and ripen no terminal bud protected by scales, and the upper axillary buds are produced so late in the season that they have no time to mature, nor has their wood time to solidify and ripen. Such stems therefore commonly die back from the top in winter, or at least all their upper buds are small and feeble, so the growth of the succeeding year takes place mainly from the lower axillary buds, which are more mature. Deliquescent and excurrent growth. In the former case, and wherever axillary buds take the lead, there is of course no single main stem, continued year after year in a direct line, but the trunk is soon lost in the branches. Trees so formed commonly have rounded or spreading tops. Of such trees with deliquescent stems, that is, with the trunk dissolved, as it were, into the successively divided branches, the common American elm is a good illustration. On the other hand, the main stem of firs and spruces, unless destroyed by some injury, is carried on in a direct line throughout the whole growth of the tree by the development year after year of a terminal bud. This forms a single uninterrupted shaft, an excurrent trunk, which cannot be confounded with the branches that proceed from it. Of such spiry or spire-shaped trees, the firs or spruces are characteristic and familiar examples. There are all gradations between the two modes. End of section four. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. Section 5 of The Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray. Section 5. Roots. It is a property of stems to produce roots. Stems do not produce from roots in ordinary cases, as is generally thought, but roots from stems. When perennial herbs arise from the ground, as they do at springtime, they rise from subterranean stems. The primary root is a downward growth from the root end of the collicle, that is, of the initial stem of the embryo. If it goes on to grow, it makes a main or tap root. Some plants keep this main root throughout their whole life and send off only small side branches, as in the carrot and radish, and in various trees, like the oak, it takes the lead of the side branches for several years, unless accidentally injured as a strong taproot. But commonly the main root divides off very soon, and is lost in the branches. 
multiple primary roots now and then occur as in the seedling of the pumpkin where a cluster is formed even at the first from the root end of the collicle secondary roots are those which arise from other parts of the stem any part of the stem may produce them but they most readily come from the nodes as a general rule they naturally spring or may be made to spring from almost any young stem when placed in favorable circumstances that is when placed in the soil or otherwise supplied with moisture and screened from the light for the special tendency of the root is to avoid the light seek moisture and therefore bury itself in the soil Propagation by division, which is so common and so very important in cultivation, depends on the proclivity of stems to strike root. Stems or branches which remain underground give out roots as freely as roots themselves give off branches. Stems which creep on the ground most commonly root at the joints. So will most branches when bent to the ground, as in propagation by layering and propagation by cuttings equally depends upon the tendency of the cut end of a shoot to produce roots thus a piece of a plant which has stem and leaves either developed or in the bud may be made to produce roots and so become an independent plant contrast between stem and root stems are ascending axes roots are descending axes Stems grow by the successive development of internodes, one after another, each leaf bearing at its summit or node, so that it is of the essential nature of a stem to bear leaves. Roots bear no leaves, are not distinguishable into nodes and internodes, but grow on continuously from the lower end. They commonly branch freely, but not from any fixed points, nor in definite order although roots generally do not give rise to stems and therefore do not propagate the plant exceptions are not uncommon for as stems may produce adventitious buds so also may roots the roots of the sweet potato among herbs and of the osage orange among trees freely produce adventitious buds developing into leafy shoots and so these plants are propagated by root cuttings but most growths of subterranean origin which pass for roots are forms of stems, the common potato, for example. Roots of ordinary kinds and uses may be roughly classed into fibrous and fleshy. Fibrous roots, such as those of Indian corn, of most annuals, and of many perennials, serve only for absorption. These are slender or thread-like, Fine roots of this kind, and the fine branches which most roots send out, are called rootlets. The whole surface of a root absorbs moisture from the soil while fresh and new, and the newer roots and rootlets are, the more freely do they imbibe. Accordingly, as long as the plant grows above the ground, and expands fresh foliage, from which moisture largely escapes into the air, so long it continues to extend and multiply its roots in the soil beneath renewing and increasing the fresh surface for absorbing moisture in proportion to the demand from above and when growth ceases above ground and leaves die and fall or no longer act then the roots generally stop growing and their soft and tender tips harden from this period, therefore, until growth begins anew the next spring, is the best time for transplanting, especially for trees and shrubs. The absorbing surface of young roots is much increased by the formation, near their tips, of root hairs, which are delicate tubular outgrowths from the surface, through the delicate walls of which moisture is promptly imbibed. Fleshy roots are those in which the root becomes a storehouse of nourishment. Typical roots of this kind are those of such biennials as the turnip and carrot, in which the food created in the first season's vegetation is accumulated, to be extended the next season in a vigorous growth and rapid development of flowers, fruit, and seed. By the time the seed is matured, 
the exhausted root dies, and with it the whole plant. Fleshy roots may be single or multiple. The single root of the commoner biennials is the primary root, or taproot, which begins to thicken in the seedling. Names are given to its shapes, such as conical, when it thickens most at the crown, or where it joins the stem, and tapers regularly downwards to a point, as in the parsnip and carrot. Turnip-shaped or napiform when greatly thickened above, but abruptly becoming slender below, as the turnip, and spindle-shaped or fusiform, when thickest in the middle and tapering to both ends, as in the common radish. These examples are of primary roots. It will be seen that turnips, carrots, and the like are not pure root throughout, for the collicle, from the lower end of which the root grew, partakes of the thickening. Perhaps also some joints of stem above, so the bud-bearing and growing top is stem. A fine example of secondary roots, some of which remain fibrous for absorption while a few thicken and store up food for the next season's growth, is furnished by the sweet potato. As stated above, these are used for propagation by cuttings, for any part will produce adventitious buds and shoots. The dahlia produces fascicled, i.e. clustered, fusiform roots of the same kind, at the base of the stem. But these, like most roots, do not produce adventitious buds. The buds by which dahlias are propagated belong to the surviving base of the stem above. Anomalous roots, as they may be called, are those which subserve other uses than absorption, food storing, and fixing the plant to the soil. Aerial roots, those that strike from stems in the open air, are common in moist and warm climates, as in the mangrove, which reaches the coast of Florida, the banyan, and less strikingly in some herbaceous plants, such as sugar cane, and even in Indian corn. Such roots reach the ground at length, or tend to do so. Aerial rootlets are abundantly produced by many climbing plants, such as the ivy, poison ivy, trumpet creeper, etc., springing from the side of stems, which they fasten to trunks of trees, walls, or other supports. These are used by the plant for climbing. Epiphytes, or air plants, are called by the former name because commonly growing upon the trunks or limbs of other plants, by the latter because having no connection with the soil, they must derive their sustenance from the air only. They have aerial roots, which do not reach the ground, but are used to fix the plant to the surface upon which the plant grows. They also take a part in absorbing moisture from the air. Parasitic plants, of which there are various kinds, strike their roots, or what answer to roots, into the tissue of foster plants, or form attachments with their surface, so as to prey upon their juices. Of this sort is the mistletoe, the seed of which germinates on the bough, where it falls or is left by birds, and the forming root penetrates the bark and engrafts itself into the wood, to which it becomes united as firmly as a natural branch to its parent stem. And indeed, the parasite lives just as if it were a branch of the tree it grows and feeds on. A most common parasitic herb is the daughter, which abounds in low grounds in summer and coils its long and slender leafless yellowish stems resembling tangled threads of yarn, round and round the stalks of other plants, wherever they touch piercing the bark with minute and very short rootlets in the form of suckers, which draw out the nourishing juices of the plants laid hold of. Other parasitic plants, like the beech drops and pine sap, fasten their roots underground upon the roots of neighboring plants and rob them of their juices. Some plants are partly parasitic. While most of their roots act in the ordinary way, others make suckers at their tips, which grow fast to the roots of other plants and rob them of nourishment. 
Some of our species of Gerardia do this. There are phanerogamous plants like Monotropa or Indian pipe, the roots of which feed mainly on decaying vegetable matter in the soil. These are saprophytes, and they imitate mushrooms and other fungi in their mode of life. Duration of Roots, etc. Roots are said to be either annual, biennial, or perennial. As respects the first and second, these terms may be applied either to the root or to the plant. Annuals, as the name denotes, live for only one year, generally for only a part of the year. They are, of course, herbs. They spring from the seed, blossom, mature their fruit and seed, and then die, root and all. Annuals of our temperate climates with severe winters start from the seed in spring and perish at or before autumn. Where the winter is a moist and growing season, and the summer is dry, winter annuals prevail. Their seeds germinate under autumn or winter rains, grow more or less during winter, blossom, fructify, and perish in the following spring or summer. Annuals are fibrous rooted. Biennials, of which the turnip, beet, and carrots are familiar examples, grow the first season without blossoming usually thicken their roots, laying up in them a stock of nourishment, are quiescent during the winter, but shoot vigorously, blossom and seed the next spring or summer, mainly at the expense of the food stored up, and then die completely. Annuals and biennials flower only once, hence they have been called monocarpic, that is, once fruiting plants. Perennials live and blossom year after year. A perennial herb in a temperate or cooler climate usually dies down to the ground at the end of the season's growth, but subterranean portions of stem, charged with buds, survive to renew the development. Shrubs and trees are, of course, perennial. Even the stems and branches above ground live on and grow year after year. There are all gradations between annuals and biennials and between these and perennials, as also between herbs and shrubs, and the distinction between shrubs and trees is quite arbitrary. There are perennial herbs, and even shrubs of warm climates, which are annuals when raised in a climate which has a winter, being destroyed by frost. The castor oil plant is an example. There are perennial herbs of which only small portions survive, as offshoots, or in the potato, as tubers, etc. End of section 5. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio. InterfaceAudio.com Section 6 of The Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray. Section 6. Stems. The stem is the axis of the plant, the part which bears all the other organs. Branches are secondary stems, that is, stems growing out of stems. The stem at the very beginning produces roots. In most plants, a single root from the base of the embryo stem or collicle. As this root becomes a descending axis, so the stem, which grows in the opposite direction, is called the ascending axis. Rising out of the soil, the stem bears leaves, and leaf-bearing is the particular characteristic of the stem but there are forms of stems that remain underground or make a part of their growth there. These do not bear leaves in the common sense, yet they bear rudiments of leaves or what answers to leaves, although not in the form of foliage. The so-called stemless or acalescent plants are those which bear no obvious stem, collis, above ground, but only flower stalks and the like. Stems above ground 
through differences in duration, texture, and size, form herbs, shrubs, trees, etc., or in other terms are herbaceous, dying down to the ground every year or after blossoming. Suffrutescent, slightly woody below, their surviving from year to year. Suffruticos, or frutescent, when low stems are decidedly woody below, but herbaceous above. Fruticos, or shrubby, woody, living from year to year, and of considerable size, not, however, more than three or four times the height of a man. Arborescent, when tree-like in the appearance or mode of growth, or approaching a tree in size. Arboreous, when forming a proper tree trunk. As to direction taken in growing, stems may, instead of growing upright or erect, be diffuse, that is, loosely spreading in all directions. Declined, when turned or bending over to one side. Decumbent, reclining on the ground, as if too weak to stand. A surgent or ascending, rising obliquely upwards. Procumbent or prostrate, lying flat on the ground from the first. Creeping or repent, prostrate on or just beneath the ground and striking root, as does the white clover, the partridge berry, etc. Climbing or scandent, ascending by clinging to other objects for support, whether by tendrils as do the pea, grapevine, and passion flower, and Virginia creeper, by their twisting leaf stalks, as the virgin's bower, or by rootlets, like the ivy, poison ivy, and trumpet creeper. Twining, or voluble, when coiling spirally around other stems or support, like the morning glory, and the hop. Certain kinds of stems or branches appropriated to special uses, certain kinds of stems or branches appropriated to special uses, have received distinct substantive names, such as the following. A comb, or straw stem, such as that of grasses and sedges. A codex is the old name for such a peculiar trunk as a palm stem. It is also used for an upright and thick rootstock. A sucker is a branch rising from stems under the ground. Such are produced abundantly by the rose, raspberry, and other plants, said to multiply by the root. If we uncover them, we see at once the great difference between these subterranean branches and real roots. They are only creeping branches under the ground. Remarking how the upright shoots from these branches become separate plants, simply by the dying off of the connecting underground stems, the gardener expedites the result by cutting them through with his spade. That is, he propagates the plant by division. A stolon is a branch from above ground, which reclines or becomes prostrate and strikes root, usually from the nodes, wherever it rests on the soil. Thence it may send up a vigorous shoot, which has roots of its own and becomes an independent plant when the connecting part dies, as it does after a while. The currant and the gooseberry naturally multiply in this way, as well as by suckers, which are the same thing, only the connecting part is concealed underground. Stolons must have suggested the operation of layering by bending down and covering with soil branches, which do not naturally make stolons and after they have taken root, as they almost always will, the gardener cuts through the connecting stem, and so converts a rooting branch into a separate plant. An offset is a short stolon, or sucker, with a crown of leaves at the end, as in the house leek, which propagates abundantly in this way. A runner, of which the strawberry presents the most familiar and characteristic example, is a long and slender, tendril-like stolon, or branch from next the ground, destitute of conspicuous leaves. Each runner of the strawberry, after having grown to its full length, strikes root from the tip, 
which fixes it to the ground, then forms a bud there, which develops into a tuft of leaves, and so gives large space, or produce a great number of plants in the course of the summer, all connected at first by the slender runners. But these die in the following winter, if not before, and leave the plants as so many separate individuals. Tendrils are branches of a very slender sort, like runners, not destined like them for propagation, and therefore always destitute of buds or leaves, being intended only for climbing. Simple tendrils are such as those of passion flowers. Compound or branching tendrils are borne by the cucumber and pumpkin, by the grapevine, Virginia creeper, etc. A tendril commonly grows straight and outstretched until it reaches some neighboring support, such as a stem, when its apex hooks around it to secure a hold. Then the whole tendril shortens itself by coiling up spirally, and so draws the shoot of the growing plant nearer to the supporting object. But the tendrils of the Virginia creeper, as also the shorter ones of the Japanese species, affect the object differently namely by expanding the tips of the tendrils into a flat disc with an adhesive face. This is applied to the supporting object, and it adheres firmly. Then a shortening of the tendril and its branches by coiling brings up the growing shoot close to the support. This is an adaptation for climbing mural rocks or walls or the trunks of trees to which ordinary tendrils are unable to cling. The ivy and poison ivy attain the same result by means of aerial rootlets. Some tendrils are leaves or parts of leaves as those of the pea. The nature of the tendril is known by its position. A tendril from the axle of a leaf, like that of passion flowers, is of course a stem, i.e. a branch. So is one which terminates a stem, as in the grapevine. Spines or thorns are commonly stunted and hardened branches or tips of stems or branches, as are those of the hawthorn, honey locust, etc. In the pear and sloe, all gradations occur between spines and spine-like, spinescent branches. Spines may be reduced and indurated leaves, as in the barberry, where their nature is revealed by their situation, underneath an axillary bud. But prickles, such as those of blackberry and roses, are only excrescences of the bark and not branches. Equally strange forms of stems are characteristic of the cactus family. These may be better understood by comparison with subterranean stems and branches. These are very numerous and various, but they are commonly overlooked or else are confounded with roots. From their situation they are out of ordinary sight, but they will well repay examination. For the vegetation that is carried on underground is hardly less varied or important than that above ground. All their forms may be referred to four principal kinds, namely the rhizoma, rhizome, or rootstock, the tuber, the corm, or solid bulb, and the true bulb. The rootstock, or rhizoma, in its simplest form, is merely a creeping stem or branch growing beneath the surface of the soil or partly covered by it. Of this kind are so-called creeping, running, or scaly roots, such as those by which the mint, the couch grass, or quick grass, and many other plants spread so rapidly and widely by the root, as it is said. That these are really stems and not roots is evident from the way in which they grow, from their consisting of a succession of joints, and from the leaves which they bear on each node, in the form of small scales, just like the lowest ones on the upright stem next to the ground. They also produce buds in the axils of these scales, showing the scales to be leaves, whereas real roots bear neither leaves nor axillary buds. Placed as they are in the damp and dark soil, such stems naturally produce roots, just as the creeping stem does where it lies on the surface of the ground. 
It is easy to see why plants with these running rootstocks take such rapid and wide possession of the soil, and why they are so hard to get rid of. They are always perennials. The subterranean shoots live over the first winter, if not longer, and are provided with vigorous buds at every joint. Some of these buds grow in spring into upright stems, bearing foliage, to elaborate nourishment, and at length produce blossoms for reproduction by seed, while many others, fed by nourishment supplied from above, form a new generation of subterranean shoots, and this is repeated over and over in the course of the season, or in succeeding years. Meanwhile, as the subterranean shoots increase in number, the older ones, connecting the successive growths, die off year by year, liberating the already rooted side branches, as so many separate plants, and so on indefinitely. Cutting these running rootstocks into pieces, therefore, by the hoe or the plough, far from destroying the plant, only accelerates the propagation. It converts one many-branched plant into a great number of separate individuals. Cutting into pieces only multiplies the pest, for each piece is already a plantlet, with its roots and with a bud in the axil of its scale-like leaf, either latent or apparent and with prepared nourishment enough to develop this bud into a leafy stem. And so a single plant is all the more speedily converted into a multitude. Whereas when the subterranean parts are only roots, cutting away the stem completely destroys the plant, except in the rather rare cases where the root freely produces adventitious buds. Rootstocks are more commonly thickened by the storing up of considerable nourishing matter in their tissue. The common species of iris in the gardens have stout rootstocks, which are only partly covered by the soil, and which bear foliage leaves instead of mere scales, closely covering the upper part, while the lower produces roots. As the leaves die year after year and decay, a scar left in the form of a ring marks the place where each leaf was attached, that is, marks so many nodes, separated by very short internodes. Some rootstocks are marked with large round scars of a different sort, like those of Solomon's seal, which gave this name to the plant, from their looking somewhat like the impression of a seal upon wax. Here the rootstock sends up every spring an herbaceous stalk or stem, which bears the foliage and flowers, and dies in autumn. The seal is the circular scar left by the death and separation of the base of the stout stalk from the living rootstock. As but one of these is formed each year, they mark the limits of a year's growth. The bud at the end of the rootstock in the figure which was taken in summer, will grow the next spring into the stalk of the season, which, dying in autumn, will leave a similar scar, while another bud will be formed farther on, crowning the ever-advancing summit or growing end of the stem. As each year's growth of stem makes its own roots, it becomes independent of the older parts, and after a certain age, a portion eventually dies off behind, about as fast as it increases at the growing end, death following life with equal and certain step, with only a narrow interval. In vigorous plants of Solomon's seal or iris, the living rootstock is several inches or a foot in length, while in the short rootstock of trillium or birthroot, life is reduced to a narrower span. An upright or short rootstock like this of trillium is commonly called a codex, or when more shortened and thickened, it would become a corm. A tuber may be understood to be a portion of a rootstock thickened, and with buds, eyes, on the sides. Of course, there are all gradations between a tuber and a rootstock. Helianthus tuberosus, the so-called Jerusalem artichoke, and the common potato, are typical and familiar examples of the tuber. The stalks by which the tubers are attached to the parent stem are at once seen to be different from the roots, both in appearance and manner of growth. 
the scales on the tubers are rudiments of the leaves the eyes are the buds in their axils the potato plant has three forms of branches one those that bear ordinary leaves expanded in the air to digest what they gather from it and what the roots gather from the soil and convert it into nourishment two after a while a second set of branches at the summit of the plant bear flowers which form fruit and seed out of a portion of the nourishment which the leaves underground and accumulated in the form of starch at their extremities which become tubers or depositories of prepared solid food just as in the turnip carrot and dahlia it is deposited in the root the use of the store of food is obvious enough in the autumn the whole plant dies except the seeds if it formed them and the tubers and the latter are left disconnected in the ground just as that small portion of nourishing matter which is deposited in the seed feeds the embryo when it germinates so the much larger portion deposited in the tuber nourishes its buds or eyes when they likewise grow the next spring into new plants and the great supply enables them to shoot with a greater vigor at the beginning and to produce a greater amount of vegetation than the seedling plant could do in the same space of time which vegetation in turn may prepare and store up in the course of a few weeks or months the largest quantity of solid nourishing material in a form most available for food taking advantage of this man has transported the potato from the cool andes of chile to other cool climates and makes it yield him a copious supply of food especially important in countries where the season is too short or the summer's heat too little for profitably cultivating the principal grain plants the corm or solid bulb like that of cyclamen and of indian turnip is a very short and thick fleshy subterranean stem often broader than high it sends off roots from its lower end or rather face leaves and stalks from its upper the corm of cyclamen goes on to enlarge and to produce a succession of flowers and leaves year after year that of indian turnip is formed one year and is consumed the next figure 104 represents it in early summer having below the corm of last year from which the roots have fallen it is partly consumed by the growth of the stem for the season and the corm of the year is forming at the base of the stem above the line of roots the corm of crocus like that of its relative gladiolus is also reproduced annually the new ones forming upon the summit and sides of the old such a corm is like a tuber in budding from the sides i e from the axils of leaves but these leaves instead of being small scales are the sheathing bases of foliage leaves which covered the surface it resembles a true bulb in having these sheaths or broad scales but in the corm or solid bulb this solid part or stem makes up the principal bulk the bulb strictly so called is a stem like a reduced corm as to its solid part or plate while the main body consists of thickened scales which are leaves or leaf bases these are like bud scales so that in fact a bulb is a bud with fleshy scales on an exceedingly short stem compare a white lily bulb with the strong scaly buds of the hickory and horse chestnut and the resemblance will appear in corms as in tubers and rootstocks the store of food for future growth is deposited in the stem while in the bulb the greater part is deposited in the bases of the leaves changing them into thick scales which closely overlap or enclose one another a scaly bulb is one in which the scales are thick but comparatively narrow a tunicated or coated bulb is one in which the scales enwrap each other forming concentric coats or layers as in hyacinth and onion a tunicated or coated bulb is one in which the scales enwrap each other forming concentric coats or layers as in hyacinth and onion bulblets are very small bulbs growing out of larger ones 
or small bulbs produced above ground on some plants as in the axils of the leaves of the bulbiferous lilies of the gardens and often in the flower clusters of the leek and onion they are plainly buds with thickened scales they never grow into branches but detach themselves when full grown fall to the ground and take root there to form new plants consolidated vegetation an ordinary herb shrub or tree is evidently constructed on the plan developing an extensive surface in fleshy rootstocks tubers corms and bulbs the more enduring portion of the plant is concentrated and reduced for the time of struggle as against drought heat or cold to a small amount of exposed surface and this is mostly sheltered in the soil there are many similar consolidated forms which are not subterranean thus plants like the house leek imitate a bulb among cactuses the columnar species of cereus may be likened to rootstocks a green rind serves the purpose of foliage but the surface is as nothing compared with an ordinary leaf plant of the same bulk compare for instance the largest cactus known the giant cereus of the gila river which rises to the height of fifty or sixty feet with a common leafy tree of the same height such as that in figure eighty nine and estimate how vastly greater even without the foliage the surface of the latter is than that of the former compare in the same view an opuntia or prickly pear cactus its stem and branches formed of a succession of thick and flattened joints which may be likened to tubers or an epiphyllum having short and flat joints with an ordinary leafy shrub or herb of equal size and finally in melon cactuses echinocactus or other globose forms which may be likened to permanent corms with their globular or bulb-like shapes we have plants in the compactest shape their spherical figure being such as to expose the least possible amount of substance to the air these are adaptations to climates which are very dry either throughout or for a part of the year similarly bulbous and corm bearing plants and the like are examples of a form of vegetation which in the growing season may expand a large surface to the air and light while well, during the period of rest the living vegetable is reduced to a globe or solid form of the least possible surface and this protected by its outer coats of dead and dry scales as well as by its situation underground such are also adapted to a season of drought they largely belong to countries which have a long hot season of little or no rain when their stalks and foliage above and their roots beneath early perishing the plants rest securely in their compact bulbs filled with nourishment and retaining their moisture with great tenacity until the rainy season comes round then they shoot forth leaves and flowers with wonderful rapidity and what was perhaps a desert of arid sand becomes green with foliage and gay with blossoms almost in a day end of section six Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. Section 7 of The Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask. Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray, Section 7. Stems bear leaves at definite points, and these are produced in a great variety of forms and subserve various uses. The commonest kind of leaf, which therefore may be taken as the type or pattern, is an expanded green body by means of which the plant exposes to the air and light the matters which it imbibes, exhales certain portions, and assimilates the residue into vegetable matter for its nourishment and growth. But the fact is already familiar, that leaves occur under other forms and serve for other uses. 
for the storage of food already assimilated, as in thickened seed leaves and bulb scales, for covering, as in bud scales, and still other uses are to be pointed out. Indeed, sometimes they are of no service to the plant, being reduced to mere scales or rudiments, such as those on the rootstocks of peppermint, or the tubers of Jerusalem artichoke. These may be said to be of service only to the botanist in explaining to him the plan upon which a plant is constructed. Accordingly, just as a rootstock or a tuber or a tendril is a kind of stem, so a bud scale or a bulb scale or a cotyledon or a petal of a flower is a kind of leaf. Even in respect to ordinary leaves, it is natural to use the word either in a wider or in a narrower sense, as when in one sense we say that a leaf consists of blade and petiole or leaf stalk, and in another sense say that a leaf is petioled, or that the leaf of hepatica is three-lobed. The connection should make it plain whether by leaf we mean leaf blade only, or the blade with any other parts it may have and the student will readily understand that by leaf in its largest or morphological sense, the botanist means the organ which occupies the place of a leaf, whatever be its form or its function. Leaves as Foliage This is tautological, for foliage is simply leaves, but it is very convenient to speak of typical leaves or those which serve the plant for assimilation as foliage leaves or ordinary leaves. These may first be considered. The parts of a leaf. The ordinary leaf, complete in its parts, consists of blade, footstalk, or petiole, and a pair of stipules. First, the blade or lamina, which is the essential part of ordinary leaves, that is, of such as serve the purpose of foliage. In structure, it consists of a softer part, the green pulp, called parenchyma, which is traversed and supported by a fibrous frame, the parts of which are called ribs or veins, on account of a certain likeness and arrangement to the veins of animals. The whole surface is covered by a transparent skin, the epidermis, not unlike that which covers the surface of all fresh shoots. Note that the leaf blade expands horizontally, that is, normally presents its faces one to the sky, the other to the ground, or when the leaf is erect, the upper face looks toward the stem that bears it, the lower face away from it. Whenever this is not the case, there is something to be explained. The framework consists of wood, a fibrous and tough material which runs from the stem through the leaf stalk when there is one in the form of parallel threads or bundles of fibers, and in the blade these spread out in a horizontal direction to form the ribs and veins of the leaf. The stout main branches of the framework are called the ribs. When there is only one, or a middle one decidedly larger than the rest, it is called the mid-rib. The smaller divisions are termed veins, and their still smaller subdivisions veinlets. The latter subdivide again and again, until they become so fine that they are invisible to the naked eye. The fibers of which they are composed are hollow, forming tubes by which the sap is brought into the leaves and carried to every part. Venation is the name of the mode of veining, that is, of the way in which the veins are distributed in the blade. This is of two principal kinds, namely the parallel veined and the netted veined. In netted veined, also called reticulated leaves, the veins branch off from the main rib or ribs, divide into finer and finer veinlets, and the branches unite with each other to form meshes of network, that is, the anastomose, as anatomists say, of the veins and arteries of the body. The quince leaf shows this kind of veining in a leaf with a single rib. The maple, basswood, plain, or buttonwood shows it in leaves of several ribs. 
in parallel veined leaves the whole framework consists of slender ribs or veins which run parallel with each other or nearly so from the base to the point of the leaf not dividing and subdividing nor forming meshes except by minute cross veinlets the leaf of any grass or that of the lily of the valley will furnish a good illustration such parallel veins linnaeus called nerves and parallel veined leaves are still commonly called nerved leaves while those of the other kind are said to be veined terms which it is convenient to use although these nerves and veins are all the same thing and have no likeness to the nerves and little to the veins of animals nettle veined leaves belong to plants which have a pair of seed leaves or cotyledons such as the maple beech and the like while parallel veined or nerved leaves belong to plants with one cotyledon or true seed leaf such as the iris and indian corn so that a mere glance at the leaves generally tells what the structure of the embryo is and refers the plant to one or the other of these two grand classes which is a great convenience for when plants differ from each other in some one important respect they usually differ correspondingly in other respects also parallel veined leaves are of two sorts one kind and the commonest having the ribs or nerves all running from the base to the point of the leaf as in the examples already given while in another kind they run from a midrib to the margin as in the common pickerel weed of our ponds in the banana in kala and many similar plants of warm climates netted veined leaves are also of two sorts as in the examples already referred to in one case the veins all rise from a single rib the midrib such leaves are called feather veined or penny veined or pinnately veined both terms meaning the same thing namely that the veins are arranged on the sides of the rib like the plume of a feather on each side of the shaft in the other case the veins branch off from three five seven or nine ribs which spread from the top of the leaf stalk and run through the blade like the toes of a web-footed bird hence these are said to be palmately or digitately veined or since the ribs diverge like rays from a center radiate veined since the general outline of leaves accords with the framework or skeleton it is plain that feather veined or penny veined leaves will incline to elongated shapes or at least to be longer than broad while in radiate veined leaves more rounded forms are to be expected a glance at the following figures shows this forms of leaves as to general outline it is necessary to give names to the principal shapes and to define them rather precisely since they afford easy marks for distinguishing species the same terms are used for all other flattened parts as well such as petals so that they make up a great part of the descriptive language of botany it will be a good exercise for young students to look up leaves answering to these names and definitions beginning with the narrower and proceeding to the broadest forms a leaf is said to be linear when narrow several times longer than wide and of the same breadth throughout lanceolate or lance shaped when conspicuously longer than wide and tapering upwards or both upwards and downwards oblong when nearly twice or thrice as long as broad elliptical is oblong with a flowing outline the two ends alike in width oval is the same as broadly elliptical or elliptical with the breadth considerably more than half the length ovate when the outline is like a section of a hen's egg lengthwise the broader end downward orbicular or rotund circular in outline or nearly so 
a leaf which tapers toward the base instead of topward the apex may be oblanceolate when of the lance-shaped form only more tapering toward the base than in the opposite direction spatulate when more rounded above but tapering thence to a narrow base like an old-fashioned spatula obovate or inversely ovate that is ovate with the narrower end down cuneate or cuneiform that is wedge-shaped broad above and tapering by nearly straight lines to an acute angle at the base as to the base its shape characterizes several forms such as chordate or heart-shaped when a leaf of an ovate form or something like it has the outline of its rounded base turned in forming a notch or sinus where the stalk is attached reniform or kidney shape like the last only rounder and broader than long auriculate or eared having a pair of small and blunt projections or ears at the base as in one species of magnolia sagittate or arrow shaped where such ears are acute and turned downwards while the main body of the blade tapers upwards to a point as in the common sagittaria or arrowhead and in the arrow leaved polygonum hastate or halberd shaped when such lobes at the base point outwards giving the shape of the halberd of the olden time as in another polygonum peltate or shield shaped is the name applied to a curious modification of the leaf commonly of a rounded form where the footstalk is attached to the lower surface instead of the base and therefore is naturally likened to a shield borne by the outstretched arm the common water shield the nelumbium and the white water lily and also the mandrake exhibit this sort of leaf on comparing the shield-shaped leaf of the common marsh pennywort with that of another common species is at once seen that a shield-shaped leaf is like a kidney shaped or other rounded leaf with the margins at the base brought together and united as to the apex the following terms express the principal variations acuminate pointed or taper pointed when the summit is more or less prolonged into a narrowed or tapering point acute ending in an acute angle or not prolonged point obtuse with a blunt or rounded apex truncate with the end as if cut off square retuse with rounded summit slightly indented forming a very shallow notch emarginate or notched indented at the end more decidedly obcordate that is inversely heart-shaped where an obovate leaf is more deeply notched at the end as in white clover and wood sorrel so as to resemble a cordate leaf inverted cuspidate tipped with a sharp and rigid point mucronate adroitly tipped with a small and short point like a mere projection of the midrib aristate on pointed and bristle pointed are terms used when this mucronate point is extended into a longer bristle form or slender appendage the first six of these terms can be applied to the lower as well as to the upper end of a leaf or other organ the others belong to the apex only as to degree and nature of division there is first of all the difference between simple leaves those in which the blade is of one piece however much of it may be cut up and compound leaves those in which the blade consists of two or more separate pieces upon a common leaf stalk or support yet between these two kinds every intermediate gradation is to be met with as to particular outlines of simple leaves and the same applies to their separate parts they are entire 
when their general outline is completely filled out so that the margin is an even line without teeth or notches serrate or sawtooth when the margin only is cut into sharp teeth like those of a saw and pointing forwards dentate or toothed when such teeth point outwards instead of forwards crenate or scallop when the teeth are broad and rounded repand undulate or wavy when the margin of the leaf forms a wavy line bending slightly inwards and outwards in succession sinuate when the margin is more strongly sinuous or turned inwards and outwards incised cut or jagged when the margin is cut into sharp deep and irregular teeth or incisions lobed when deeply cut then the pieces are in a general way called lobes the number of the lobes is briefly expressed by the phrase two-lobed three-lobed five-lobed many-lobed etc as the case may be when the depth and character of the lobing needs to be more particularly specified the following terms are employed lobed in a special sense when the incisions do not extend deeper than about halfway between the margin and the center of the blade if so far and are more or less rounded as in the leaves of the post oak and the hepatica cleft when the incisions extend halfway down or more and especially when they are sharp and the phrases two cleft or in the latin form bifid three cleft or trifid four cleft or quadrifid five cleft or sancafid etc or many cleft in the latin form multifid express the number of the segments or portions parted when the incisions are still deeper but yet do not quite reach to the midrib or the base of the blade and the terms two-parted three-parted etc express the number of such divisions divided when the incisions extend quite to the midrib as in the lower part or to the leaf stalk which really makes the leaf compound here using the latin form the leaf is said to be bisected trisected according to the number of the divisions the mode of lobing or division corresponds to that of the veining whether pinnately veined or palmately veined in the former the notches or incisions or sinuses coming between the principal veins or ribs are directed toward the midrib in the latter they are directed toward the apex of the petiole as the figures show so degree and mode of division may be tersely expressed in brief phrases thus in the four upper figures of pinnately veined leaves the first is said to be pinnately lobed in the special sense the second pinnately cleft or pinnatifid in latin form the third pinnately parted the fourth pinnately divided or pinnatisected correspondingly in the lower row of palmately veined leaves the first is palmately lobed the second palmately cleft the third palmately parted the fourth palmately divided or in other language of the same meaning but now less commonly employed they are said to be digitally lobed cleft parted or divided the number of the divisions or lobes may come into the phrase thus in the four last named figures the leaves are respectively palmately three lobed three cleft or trifid three parted three divided or better in latin form trisected and so for higher numbers as five lobed five cleft etc up to many lobed many cleft or multifid etc the same mode of expression may be used for pinnately lobed leaves as pinnately seven lobed cleft parted etc the divisions lobes etc may themselves be entire without teeth or notches or serrate or otherwise toothed or incised or lobed cleft parted etc 
in the latter cases making it twice pinnatifid, twice palmately or pinnately lobed, parted or divided leaves, etc. From these illustrations one will perceive how the botanist, in two or three words, may describe any one of the almost endlessly diversified shapes of leaves, so as to give a clear and definite idea of it. Compound Leaves A compound leaf is one which has its blade in entirely separate parts, each usually with a stalklet of its own, and the stalklet is often joined or articulated with the main leaf stalk, just as this is jointed with the stem. When this is the case, there is no doubt that the leaf is compound, but when the pieces have no stalklets, they are not jointed with the main leaf stalk. It may be considered either as a divided simple leaf or a compound leaf, according to the circumstances. This is a matter of names where all intermediate forms may be expected. While the pieces or projecting parts of a simple leaf blade are called lobes, or in deeply cut leaves, etc., segments, or divisions, the separate pieces or blades of a compound leaf are called leaflets. Compound leaves are of two principal kinds, namely the pinnate and the palmate, answering to the two modes of veining in reticulated leaves, and to the two sorts of lobed or divided leaves. Pinnate leaves are those in which the leaflets are arranged on the sides of a main leaf stalk. They answer to the feather veined, example pinnately veined, simple leaf, as will be seen at once on comparing the forms. The leaflets of the former answer to the lobes or subdivisions of the latter, and the continuation of the petiole, along which the leaflets are arranged, answers to the midrib of the simple leaf. Three sorts of pinnate leaves are here given. Figure 156 is pinnate with an odd or end leaflet, as in the common locust and the ash. Figure 157 is pinnate with a tendril at the end, in place of the odd leaflet, as in the vetches and the pea. Figure 158 is evenly or abruptly pinnate, as in the honey locust. Palmate, also named digitate leaves, are those in which the leaflets are all borne on the tip of the leaf stalk, as in the lupin, the common clover, the Virginia creeper, and the horse chestnut and buckeye. They evidently answer to the radiate veined or palmately veined simple leaf. That is, the clover leaf of three leaflets is the same as a palmately three ribbed leaf cut into three separate leaflets and such a simple five-lobed leaf as that of the sugar maple, if more cut so as to separate the parts, would produce a palmate leaf of five leaflets, like that of the horse chestnut or buckeye. Either sort of compound may have any number of leaflets, yet palmate leaves cannot well have a great many, since they are all crowded together on the end of the main leaf stalk. Some lupins have nine or eleven, the horse chestnut has seven, the sweet buckeye more commonly five, the clover three. A pinnate leaf often has only seven or five leaflets, or only three, as in beams of the genus Phaseolus, etc. In some rarer cases only two, in the orange and the lemon, and also in the common barberry, there is only one. The joint at the place where the leaflet is united with the petiole distinguishes this last case from a simple leaf. In other species of these genera, the lateral leaflets also are present. The leaflets of a compound leaf may be either entire or serrate, or lobed, cleft, parted, etc. In fact, may present all the variations of simple leaves, and the same terms equally apply to them. When the division is carried so far as to separate what would be one leaflet into two, three, or several, the leaf becomes doubly or twice compound, either pinnately or palmately, as the case may be. For example, while the clustered leaves of the honey locust are simply pinnate, that is, once pinnate, 
those on new shoots are bipinnate or twice pinnate. When these leaflets are again divided in the same way, the leaf becomes thrice pinnate or tripinnate, as in many acacias. The first divisions are called pinnae, the others pinnules, and the last or little blades themselves leaflets. So the palmate leaf, if again compounded in the same way, becomes twice palmate, or as we say when the divisions are in threes, twice ternate, in Latin form, biternate. If a third time compounded, thrice ternate or triternate. But if the division goes still further, or if the degree is variable, we simply say that the leaf is decompound, either palmately or pinnately decompound, as the case may be. Thus, figure 161 represents a four times ternately compound, in other words, a ternately decompound, leaf of a common meadow rue. When the botanist in describing leaves wishes to express the number of the leaflets, he may use terms like these, unifoliolate, for a compound leaf of a single leaflet, from the Latin unum, one, and foliolum, leaflet. Bifoliolate, of two leaflets, from the Latin bis, twice, and foliolum, leaflet. Trifoliolate, or ternate, of three leaflets, as the clover, and so on. Palmately bifoliolate, trifoliolate, quadrifoliolate, plurifoliolate, of several leaflets, etc., or else pinnately, bi, tri, quadri, or plurifoliolate, that is, of two, three, four, five, or several leaflets, as the case may be. These are terse ways of denoting in single phrases both the number of leaflets and the kind of compounding. Of foliage leaves having certain peculiarities in structure, the following may be noted. Perfoliate leaves. In these, the stem that bears them seems to run through the blade of the leaf, more or less, above its base. A common bellwort, Uvularia perfoliata, is a similar illustration. The lower and earlier leaves show it distinctly. Later, the plant is apt to produce some leaves merely clasping the stem by the sessile and heart-shaped base, and the latest may be merely sessile. So the series explains the peculiarity. In the formation of the leaf, the bases, meeting around the stem, grow together there. Conate perfoliate. Such are the upper leaves of true honeysuckles. Here, of the opposite and sessile leaves, some pairs, especially the uppermost, in the course of their formation, unite around the stem, which thus seems to run through the disc formed by their union. Equitant leaves. While ordinary leaves spread horizontally and present one face to the sky and the other to the earth, there are some that present their tip to the sky and their faces right and left to the horizon. Among these are the equitant leaves of the iris, or flower de luce. Inspection shows that each leaf was formed as if folded together lengthwise, so that what would be the upper surface is within, and all grown together, except next the bottom, where each leaf covers the next younger one. It was from their straddling over each other, like a man on horseback, as is seen in the cross section, that Linnaeus, with his lively fancy, called these equitant leaves. Leaves with no distinction of petiole and blade. The leaves of iris just mentioned show one form of this, the flat but narrow leaves of jonquils, daffodils, and the cylindrical leaf of onions are other instances. Needle-shaped leaves like those of the pine, larch, and spruce and the awl-shaped as well as the scale-shaped leaves of junipers, red cedar, and arbor vitae are examples. Phylodia. Sometimes an expanded petiole takes the place of the blade, as in numerous New Holland acacias, some of which are now common in greenhouses. Such counterfeit blades are called phylodia, meaning leaf-like bodies. They may be known from true blades by their standing edgewise, their margins being directed upwards and downwards, 
while in true blades the faces look upwards and downwards, except in equitant leaves, as already explained. Falsely vertical leaves. These are apparent exceptions to the rule, the blade standing edgewise instead of flatwise to the stem. But this position comes by a twist of the stalk or the base of the blade. Such leaves present the two faces about equally to the light. The compass plant, Silphium laciniatum, is an example. So also the leaves of Boltonia, or wild lettuce, and of a vast number of Australian mertaceous shrubs and trees, which much resemble the phylodia of the acacias of the same country. They are familiar in Callistemon, the bottle brush flower, and the eucalyptus, but in the latter the leaves of the young tree have the normal structure and position. Cladophylla, meaning branch leaves, the foliage of Ruscus, the butcher's broom of Europe, and of Myrsiphilum of South Africa, cultivated for decoration under the false name of Smilax, is peculiar and puzzling. If these blades are really leaves, they are most anomalous in occupying the axil of another leaf, reduced to a little scale. Yet they have an upper and lower face, as leaves should, although they soon twist so as to stand more or less edgewise. If there are branches which have assumed exactly the form and office of leaves, they are equally extraordinary in not making any further development. But in Ruscus, flowers are born on one face, in the axle of a little scale, and this would seem to settle that they are branches. In asparagus, just the same things as to position are thread-shaped and branch-like. End of section 7. Recorded by Lawrence Trask. Mount Vernon, Ohio. InterfaceAudio.com Section 8 of The Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask. Mount Vernon, Ohio. InterfaceAudio.com The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray Section 7. Leaves. Part 2 through 4. Part 2. Leaves of Special Conformation and Use Leaves for Storage A leaf may at the same time serve both ordinary and special uses. Thus in those leaves of lilies, such as the common white lily, which spring from the bulb, the upper and green part serves for foliage and elaborates nourishment, while the thickened portion or bud scale beneath serves for the storage of this nourishment. The thread-shaped leaf of the onion fulfills the same office, and the nourishing matter it prepares is deposited in its sheathing base, forming one of the concentric layers of the onion. When these layers, so thick and succulent, have given up their store to the growing parts within, they are left as thin and dry husks. In a house leek, an aloe, or an agave, the green color of the surface of the fleshy leaf indicates that it is doing the work of foliage. The deeper-seated white portion within is the storehouse of the nourishment, which the green surface has elaborated. So also the seed leaves or cotyledons are commonly used for storage. Some, as in one of the maples, the pea, horse chestnut, oak, etc., are for nothing else. Others, as in beech and in our common beans, give faint indication of service as foliage, also chiefly in vain. Still others, as in the pumpkin and flax, having served for storage, develop into the first efficient foliage. Compare 11, 22 through 30 and the accompanying figures. Leaves as bud scales serve to protect the forming parts within. Having fulfilled this purpose, they commonly fall off when the shoot develops and foliage leaves appear. Occasionally, as in figure 170, there is a transition of bud scales to leaves, which reveals the nature of the former. 
The lilac also shows a gradation from bud scale to simple leaf. In Cornus, Florida, the flowering dogwood, the four bud scales, which through the winter protect the head of forming flowers, remain until blossoming, and then the base of each grows out into a large and very showy petal-like leaf. The original dry scale is apparent in the notch at the apex. Leaves as spines occur in several plants. A familiar instance is that of the common barberry. In almost any summer shoot, most of the gradations may be seen between the ordinary leaves with sharp bristly teeth and leaves which are reduced to a branching spine or thorn. The fact that the spines of the barberry produce a leaf bud in their axle also proves them to be leaves. Leaves for climbing are various in adaptation. True foliage leaves serve this purpose, as in Gloriosa, where the attenuated tip of a simple leaf, otherwise like that of a lily, hooks around a supporting object, or in Solanum jasminoides of the gardens, and in Morandia, etc., where the leaf stalk coils round and clings to a support, or in the compound leaves of Clematis and of Adlumia, in which both the leaflets and their stalks hook or coil around the support. Or in a compound leaf, as in the pea and most vetches, and in cobea, while the lower leaflets serve for foliage, some of the uppermost are developed as tendrils for climbing. In the common pea this is so, with all but one or two pairs of leaflets. In one European vetch, the leaflets are wanting, and the whole petiole is a tendril, while the stipules become the only foliage. Leaves as pitchers, or hollow tubes, are familiar in the common pitcher plant, or side-saddle flower, of our bogs. These pitchers are generally half full of water, in which flies and other insects are drowned, often in such numbers as to make a rich manure for the plant. More curious are some of the southern species of Saracenia, which seem to be specially adapted to the capture and destruction of flies and other insects. The leaf of the Nepenthes combines three structures and uses. The expanded part below is foliage. This tapers into a tendril for climbing, and this bears a pitcher with a lid. Insects are caught and perhaps digested in the pitcher. Leaves as fly traps. Insects are caught in another way and more expertly by the most extraordinary of all the plants of this country, the Dianaea or Venus's fly trap, which grows in the sandy bogs around Wilmington, North Carolina. Here each leaf bears at its summit an appendage which opens and shuts, in shape something like a steel trap, and operating much like one. For when open, no sooner does a fly alight on its surface and brush against any one of the two or three bristles that grow there, than the trap suddenly closes, capturing the intruder. If the fly escapes, the trap soon slowly opens and is ready for another capture. When retained, the insect is after a time moistened by a secretion from minute glands of the inner surface and is digested. In the various species of Drosera or sundew, insects are caught by sticking fast to very viscid glands at the tip of strong bristles, aided by adjacent gland-tipped bristles which bend slowly toward the captive. The use of such adaptations and operations may be explained in another place. A leaf complete in its parts consists of blade, leaf stalk, or petiole, and a pair of stipules but most leaves have either fugacious or minute stipules or none at all. Many have no petiole, the blade being sessile or stalkless, and some have no clear distinction of blade and petiole. And many of these, such as those of the onion and all phyllodia, consist of petiole only. The base of the petiole is apt to be broadened and flattened, sometimes into thin margins sometimes into a sheath which embraces the stem at the point of attachment. Stipules are such appendages, either wholly or partly separated from the petiole. When quite separate, they are said to be free, 
as in Fig. 112. When attached to the base of the petiole, as in the rose and in clover, they are adnate. When the two stipules unite and sheathe the stem above the insertion, as in polygonum, this sheath is called an ochrea, from its likeness to a grave or legon. In grasses, when the sheathing base of the leaf may answer to petiole, the summit of the sheath commonly projects as a thin and short membrane, like an ochrea. This is called a ligula or ligule. When stipules are green and leaf-like, they act as so much foliage. In the pea, they make up no small part of the actual foliage. In a related plant, Lathyrus afeca, they make the whole of it, the remainder of the leaf being tendril. In many trees, the stipules are the bud scales, as in the beech, and very conspicuously in the fig tree, tulip tree, and magnolia. These fall off as the leaves unfold. The stipules are spines or prickles in locust and several other leguminous trees and shrubs. They are tendrils in smilax or greenbrier. Phyllotaxy, meaning leaf arrangement, is the study of the position of leaves, or parts answering to leaves, upon the stem. The technical name for the attachment of leaves to the stem is the insertion. Leaves are inserted in three modes. They are alternate, that is, one after another, or in other words, with only a single leaf to each node. Opposite, when there is a pair to each node, the two leaves in this case being always on opposite sides of the stem. Whorled or verticillate, when there are more than two leaves on a node, in which case they divide the circle equally between them, forming a vertical or whorl. Then there are three leaves in the whorl. The leaves are one-third of the circumference apart, when four, one-quarter, and so on. So the plan of opposite leaves, which is very common, is merely that of whorled leaves with the fewest leaves to the whorl, namely two. In both modes and in all their modifications, the arrangement is such as to distribute the leaves systematically and in a way to give them a good exposure to the light. No two or more leaves ever grow from the same point. The so-called fascicled or clustered leaves are the leaves of a branch the nodes of which are very close, just as they are in the bud, so keeping the leaves in a cluster. This is evident in the larch, in which examination shows each cluster to be made up of numerous leaves crowded on a spur or short axis. In spring there are only such clusters, but in summer some of them lengthen into ordinary shoots with scattered alternate leaves. So likewise each cluster of two or three needle-shaped leaves in pitch pines or of five leaves in white pine, answers to a similar extremely short branch, springing from the axle of a thin and slender scale, which represents a leaf of the main shoot. For pines produce two kinds of leaves. One, primary, the proper leaves of the shoots, not as foliage, but in the shape of delicate scales in the spring, which soon fall away. And two, secondary, the fascicled leaves, from buds in the axils of the former, and these form the actual foliage. Phyllotaxy of alternate leaves. Alternate leaves are distributed along the stem in an order which is uniform for each species. The arrangement in all its modifications is said to be spiral, because if we draw a line from the insertion, i.e. the point of attachment, of one leaf to that of the next, and so on, this line will wind spirally around the stem as it rises, and in the same species will always bear the same number of leaves for each turn round the stem. That is, any two successive leaves will always be separated from each other by an equal portion of the circumference of the stem. The distance in height between any two leaves may vary greatly, even on the same shoot for that depends upon the length of the internodes, or spaces between the leaves. But the distance as measured around the circumference 
in other words the angular divergence or angle formed by any two successive leaves is uniformly the same two ranked the great possible divergence is of course where the second leaf stands on exactly the opposite side of the stem from the first the third on the side opposite the second and therefore over the first and the fourth over the second this brings all the leaves into two ranks one on one side of the stem and one on the other and is therefore called the two ranked arrangement it occurs in all grasses in indian corn for instance also in the basswood this is the simplest of all arrangements and the one which most widely distributes successive leaves but which therefore gives the fewest vertical ranks next is the three-ranked arrangement that is of all sedges and of white hellebore here the second leaf is placed one-third of the way round the stem the third leaf two-thirds of the way round and the fourth leaf accordingly directly over the first the fifth over the second and so on that is three leaves occur in each turn round the stem and they are separated from each other by one-third of the circumference five ranked is the next in the series and the most common it is seen in the apple cherry poplar and the greater number of trees and shrubs in this case the line traced from leaf to leaf will pass twice round the stem before it reaches a leaf situated directly over any below here the sixth leaf is over the first the leaves stand in five perpendicular ranks and with equal angular distance from each other and this distance between any two successive leaves is just two-fifths of the circumference of the stem the five ranked arrangement is expressed by the fraction two-fifths this fraction denotes the divergence of the successive leaves i e the angle they form with each other the numerator also expresses the number of turns made round the stem by the spiral line in completing one cycle or set of leaves namely two and the denominator gives the number of leaves in each cycle or the number of perpendicular ranks namely five in the same way the fraction one half stands for the two ranked mode and one third for the three ranked and so these different sorts are expressed by the series of fractions one half one third two fifths other cases follow in the same numerical progression the next being the eighth ranked arrangement in this the ninth leaf stands over the first and three turns are made around the stem to reach it so it is expressed by the fraction three eighths this is seen in the holly and in the common plantain then comes the thirteen ranked arrangement in which the fourteenth leaf is over the first after five turns around the stem the common house leek is a good example the series so far then is one half one third two fifths three eighths five thirteenths the numerator and the denominator of each fraction being those of the two next preceding ones added together at this rate the next higher should be eight twenty firsts then thirteen thirty fourths and so on and in fact just such cases are met with and commonly no others these higher sorts are found in the pine family both in the leaves and the cones and in many other plants with small and crowded leaves but in those the number of the ranks or of leaves in each cycle one can rarely be made out by direct inspection they may be indirectly ascertained however by studying the secondary spirals as they are called which usually become conspicuous at least two series of them one turning to the right and one to the left for an account of the way in which the character of the phyllotaxy may be deduced from the secondary spirals see structural botany chapter four phyllotaxy of opposite and world leaves this is simple and comparatively uniform the leaves of each pair or whorl are placed over the intervals between those of the preceding and therefore under the intervals of the pair or whorl next above 
the whirls or pairs alternate or cross each other usually at right angles that is they decussate opposite leaves that is whirls of two leaves only are far commoner than whirls of three or four or more members this arrangement in successive decussating pairs gives an advantageous distribution on the stem in four vertical ranks whirls of three give six vertical ranks and so on note that in descriptive botany leaves and whirls of two are simply called opposite leaves and that the term verticillate or whirled is employed only for cases of more than two unless the latter number is specified vernation or prefoliation the disposition of the leaf blades in the bud comprise two things first the way in which each separate leaf is folded coiled or packed up in the bud and second the arrangement of the leaves in the bud with respect to one another the latter of course depends very much upon the phyllotaxy for example the position and order of the leaves upon the stem the same terms are used for it as the arrangement of the leaves of the flower in the flower bud see therefore astivation or prefloration as to each leaf separately it is sometimes straight and open in vernation but more commonly is either bent folded or rolled up when the upper part is bent down upon the lower as the young blade in the tulip tree is bent upon the leaf stalk it is said to be inflexed or reclined in vernation when folded by the midrib so that the two halves are placed face to face it is conduplicate as in the magnolia the cherry and the oak when folded back and forth like the plates of a fan it is plicate or plated in unrolling it resembles the head of a crozier and is said to be circinate or it may be rolled up parallel with the axis either from one edge into a coil when it is convolute as in the apricot and plum or rolled from both edges towards the midrib sometimes inwards when it is involute as in the violet and the water lily sometimes outward when it is revolute in the rosemary and azalea the figures are diagrams representing sections through the leaf in the way they were represented by linnaeus end of section eight recording by lawrence trask mount vernon ohio interface audio.com Section 9 of The Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. L I B R I V O X dot O R G. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray. Flowers, Parts 1 through 3 flowers are for the production of seed stems and branches which for a time put forth leaves for vegetation may at length put forth flowers for reproduction part one position and arrangement of flowers or inflorescence flower buds appear just where leaf buds appear that is they are either terminal or axillary morphologically flowers answer to shoots or branches and their parts to leaves. In the same species, the flowers are usually from axillary buds only or from terminal buds only, but in some they are both axillary and terminal. Inflorescence, which is the name used by Linnaeus to signify mode of flower arrangement, is accordingly of three classes, namely indeterminate, when the flowers are in the axils of leaves, that is, are from axillary buds, determinate when they are from terminal buds and so terminate a stem or branch and mixed when these two are combined indeterminate inflorescence likewise and for the same reason called indefinite inflorescence is so named because as the flowers all come from axillary buds 
the terminal bud may keep on growing and prolong the stem indefinitely. This is so in moneywort. When flowers thus arise singly from the axils of ordinary leaves, they are axillary and solitary, not collected into flower clusters. But when several or many flowers are produced near each other, the accompanying leaves are apt to be of smaller size or of different shape or character. Then they are called bracts, and the flowers thus brought together form a cluster. The kinds of flower clusters of the indeterminate class have received distinct names according to their form and disposition. They are principally raceme, corym, umbel, spike, head, spadix, catkin, and panicle. In defining these, it will be necessary to use some of the following terms of descriptive botany which relate to inflorescence. If a flower is stalkless, i.e. sits directly in the axle or other support, it is said to be sessile. If raised on a naked stalk of its own, it is pedunculate, and the stalk is a peduncle. A peduncle on which a flower cluster is raised is a common peduncle. That which supports each separate flower of the cluster is a partial peduncle, and is generally called a pedicel. The portion of the general stalk along which flowers are disposed is called the axis of inflorescence, or, when covered with sessile flowers, the rachis, backbone, and sometimes the receptacle. The leaves of a flower cluster generally are termed bracts, but when bracts of different orders are to be distinguished, those on the common peduncle or axis, and which have a flower in their axle, keep the name of bracts and those on the pedicels or partial flower stalks, if any, that of bractlets or bracteoles. The former is the preferable English name. A raceme is that form of flower cluster in which the flowers, each on their own footstalk or pedicel, are arranged along the sides of a common stalk or axis of inflorescence, as in the lily of the valley, currant, barberry, one section of cherry, etc., each flower comes from the axle of a small leaf or bract, which, however, is often so small that it might escape notice, and even sometimes, as in the mustard family, disappears altogether. The lowest blossoms of a raceme are, of course, the oldest, and therefore open first, and the order of blossoming is ascending from the bottom to the top. The summit, never being stopped by a terminal flower, may go on to grow and often does so, as in the common shepherd's purse, producing lateral flowers one after another for many weeks. A corymb is the same as a raceme, except that it is flat and broad, either convex or level-topped. That is, a raceme becomes a corymb by lengthening the lower pedicels while the uppermost remains shorter. The axis of a corymb is short in proportion to the lower pedicels, by the extreme shortening of the axis, the corymb may be converted into an umbel, as in the milkweed, a sort of flower cluster where the pedicels all spring apparently from the same point, from the top of the peduncle, so as to resemble, when spreading, the rays of an umbrella, whence the name. Here, the pedicels are sometimes called the rays of the umbel, and the bracts, when brought in this way into a cluster or circle, form what is called an involucre. The corymb and the umbel being more or less level-topped, bringing the flowers into a horizontal plane or a convex form, the ascending order of development appears as centripetal. That is, the flowering proceeds from the margin or circumference regularly towards the center, the lower flowers of the former answering to the outer ones of the latter. In these three kinds of flower clusters, the flowers are raised on conspicuous pedicels, or stalks of their own. The shortening of these pedicels, so as to render the flowers sessile or nearly so, converts a raceme into a spike, and a corymb or an umbel into a head. A spike is a flower cluster with more or less lengthened axis, along which the flowers are sessile or nearly so as in the plantain. 
A head, or capitulum, is a round or roundish cluster of flowers, which are sessile on a very short axis or receptacle, as in the buttonball, button bush, and red clover. It is just what a spike would become if its axis were shortened, or an umbel, if its pedicels were all shortened until the flowers became sessile. The head of the button bush is naked, but that of the thistle, of the dandelion and the like, is surrounded by empty bracts, which form an involucre. Two particular forms of the spike and the head have received particular names, namely the spadix and the catkin. A spadix is a fleshy spike or head with small and often imperfect flowers, as in the kaya, Indian turnip, sweet flag, etc. It is commonly surrounded or embraced by a peculiar enveloping leaf called a spathe. A catkin, or ament, is the name given to the scaly sort of spike of the birch and alder, the willow and poplar, and one sort of flower clusters of the oak, hickory, and the like, the so-called amentaceous trees. Compound flower clusters of these kinds are not uncommon. When the stalks, which in the simple umbel are the pedicels of single flowers themselves, branch into an umbel, a compound umbel is formed. This is the inflorescence of caraway, parsnip, and almost all of the great family of umbiliferous, umbel-bearing plants. The secondary or partial umbels of a compound umbel are umbelets. When the umbelets are subtended by an involucre, the secondary involucre is called an involucal. A compound raceme is a cluster of racemes race mostly arranged, as in Smilacina racemosa. A compound corym is a corym, some branches of which branch again in the same way, as in mountain ash. A compound spike is a spicately disposed cluster of spikes. A panicle, such as that of oats and many grasses, is a compound flower cluster of a more or less open sort, which branches with apparent irregularity, neither into corymns nor racemes. It is, as it were, a raceme of which some of the pedicels have branched so as to bear a few flowers on pedicels of their own, while others remain simple. A compound panicle is one that branches in this way again and again. Determinate inflorescence is that in which the flowers are from terminal buds. The simplest case is that of a solitary terminal flower. This stops the growth of the stem, for its terminal bud, becoming a blossom, can no more lengthen in the manner of a leaf bud. Any further growth must be from axillary buds developing into branches. If such branches are leafy shoots, at length terminated by single blossoms, the inflorescence still consists of solitary flowers at the summit of stem and branches. But if the flowering branches bear only bracts in place of ordinary leaves, the result is the kind of flower cluster called a cyme. This is commonly a flat-topped or convex flower cluster, like a corymb, only the blossoms are from terminal buds. Consider the simplest cyme in a plant with opposite leaves, namely with three flowers. The middle flower terminates the stem. The two others terminate branches, one from the axle of each of the uppermost leaves, and being later than the middle one, the flowering proceeds from the center outwards, or is centrifugal. This is the opposite of the indeterminate mode, or that where all the flower buds are axillary. If flowering branches appear from the axils below, the lower ones are the later, so that the order of blossoming continues centrifugal, or, which is the same thing, descending, making a sort of reversed raceme or false raceme, a kind of cluster which is to the true raceme just what the flat cyme is to the corymb. Wherever there are bracts or leaves, buds may be produced from their axils and appear as flowers. Consider the case where branches, each with a pair of small leaves or bracts about their middle, have branched again and produced branchlets and flowers on each side. It is the continued repetition of this which forms the full or compound cyme, such as that of the Loristinus, Hubblebush, Dogwood, and Hydrangea. 
a fascicle, meaning a bundle, like that of the sweet william and lickness of the gardens, is only a cyme with the flowers much crowded. A glomerule is a cyme still more compacted, so as to imitate a head. It may be known from a true head by the flowers not expanding centripetally, that is, not from the circumference towards the center. The illustrations of determinate or cymose inflorescence have been taken from plants with opposite leaves, which give rise to the most regular cymes. But the rose, sinkfoil, buttercup, etc., with alternate leaves, furnish also good examples of cymose inflorescence. A cymule, or diminutive cyme, is either a reduced small cyme of few flowers, or a branch of a compound cyme, i.e., a partial cyme. Scorpioid or helicoid cymes of various sorts are forms of determinate inflorescence, often puzzling to the student, in which one half of the ramification fails to appear, so that they may be called incomplete cymes. The commoner forms may be understood by comparing a complete cyme with a cyme of an opposite-leaved plant having a series of terminal flowers and the axis continued by the development of a branch in the axle of only one of the leaves at each node. Consider the wanting branches which, if present, would convert the scorpioid cyme into a complete one. These are kinds of false racemes. When the bracts are also wanting in such cases, as in many boraginous plants, the true nature of the inflorescence is very much disguised. These distinctions between determinate and indeterminate inflorescence, between corims and cymes, and between the true and false raceme and spike, were not recognized by botanists much more than half a century ago, and even now are not always attended to in descriptions. It is still usual and convenient to describe rounded or flat-topped and open ramification as corimbos, even when essentially cymos, also to call the reversed or false racemes or spikes by these strictly incorrect names. Mixed inflorescence is that in which the two plans are mixed or combined in compound clusters. A mixed panicle is one in which, while the primary ramification is of the indeterminate order, the secondary or ultimate is wholly or partially of the determinate order. A contracted or elongated inflorescence of this sort is called a thyrsus. Lilac and horse chestnut afford common examples of mixed inflorescence of this sort. When loose and open, such flower clusters are called by the general name of panicles. The heads of compositae are centripetal, but the branches or peduncles which bear the heads are usually of centrifugal order. Part 2. Parts or Organs of the Flower These were simply indicated in Section 2. Some parts are necessary to seed-bearing. These are essential organs, namely the stamens and pistils. Others serve for protection or for attraction, often for both. Such are the leaves of the flower, or the floral envelopes. The floral envelopes taken together are sometimes called the perianth, also paragon, in Latin form, paragonium. In a flower which possesses its full number of organs, the floral envelopes are of two kinds, namely an outer circle, the calyx, and an inner, the corolla. The calyx is commonly a circle of green or greenish leaves, but not always. It may be the most brightly colored part of the blossom. Each calyx leaf or piece is called a sepal. The corolla is the inner circle of floral envelopes or flower leaves, usually of delicate texture and colored, that is, of some other color than green. Each corolla leaf is called a petal. There are flowers in abundance which consist wholly of floral envelopes. Such are the so-called full double flowers, of which the choicer roses and camellias of the cultivator are familiar examples. In them, 
under the gardener's care and selection, petals have taken the place of both stamens and pistils. These are monstrous or unnatural flowers, incapable of producing seed, and subservient only to human gratification. Their common name of double flowers is not a sensible one, except that it is fixed by custom. It were better to translate their Latin name, Flores Pleni, and call them full flowers, meaning full of leaves. Moreover, certain plants regularly produce neutral flowers, consisting of floral envelopes only. Some are seen around the margin of the cyme and hydrangea. They are likewise familiar in the hobble bush and in wild cranberry tree, Viburnum oxycoxus, where they form an attractive setting to the cluster of small and comparatively inconspicuous perfect flowers which they adorn. In the gilder rose or snowball of ornamental cultivation, all or most of the blossoms of this same shrub are transformed into neutral flowers. The essential organs are likewise of two kinds, placed one above or within the other, namely, first, the stamens or fertilizing organs, and second, the pistils, which are to be fertilized and bear the seeds. A stamen consists of two parts, namely, the filament or stalk, and the anther, the latter is the only essential part. It is a case, commonly with two lobes or cells, each opening lengthwise by a slit, at the proper time, and discharging a powder or dust-like substance, usually of a yellow color. This powder is the pollen, or fertilizing matter, to produce which is the office of the stamen. A pistil, when complete, has three parts, ovary, style, and stigma. The ovary, at base, is the hollow portion, which contains one or more ovules or rudimentary seeds. The style is the tapering portion above. The stigma is a portion of the style, usually its tip, with moist, naked surface upon which grains of pollen may lodge and adhere, and thence make a growth which extends down to the ovules. When there is no style, then the stigma occupies the tip of the ovary, the torus or receptacle is the end of the flower stalk, or the portion of axis or stem out of which the several organs of the flower grow, upon which they are born. The parts of the flower are thus disposed on the receptacle or axis, essentially as are leaves upon a very short stem, first the sepals, or outer floral leaves, then the petals, or inner floral leaves, then the stamens, Lastly, at summit or center, the pistils, when there are two or more of them, or the single pistil when only one. Consider the organs, two of each kind, of such a simple and symmetrical flower as that of a sedum or stone crop. Part 3. Plan of Flower All flowers are formed upon one general plan, but with almost infinite variations and many disguises. This common plan is best understood by taking for a type, or standard for comparison, some perfect, complete, regular, and symmetrical blossom, and one as simple as such a blossom could well be. Flowers are said to be perfect, or hermaphrodite, when provided with both kinds of essential organs, i.e. with both stamens and pistils. Complete when, besides, they have the two sets of floral envelopes, namely calyx and corolla. Such are completely furnished with all that belongs to a flower. Regular when all the parts of each set are alike in shape and size. Symmetrical when there is an equal number of parts in each set or circle of organs. Flax flowers were taken for a pattern in section 2. But in them, the five pistils have their ovaries, as it were, consolidated into one body. Sedum has the pistils and all the other parts free from such combination. The flower is perfect, complete, regular, and symmetrical. But is not quite as simple as it might be, for there are twice as many stamens as there are of the other organs. Crassula, a relative of sedum, cultivated in the conservatories for winter blossoming, is simpler, 
being isostemonous, or with just as many stamens as petals or sepals, while sedum is diplostemonous, having double that number. It has, indeed, two sets of stamens. Numerical plan. A certain number either runs through the flower or is discernible in some of its parts. This number is most commonly either five or three, not very rarely four, occasionally two. Thus, the ground plan of the flowers thus far used for illustration is five. That of trillium is three, as it likewise is as really, if not as plainly, in tulips and lilies, crocuses, iris, and all that class of blossoms. In some sedums, all the flowers are in fours. In others, the first flowers are on the plan of five, the rest mostly on the plan of four, that is, with four sepals, four petals, eight stamens, i.e. twice four, and four pistils. Whatever the ground number may be, it runs through the whole in symmetrical blossoms. Alternation of the successive circles. In these flowers, the parts of the successive circles alternate, and such is the rule. That is, the petals stand over the intervals between the sepals, the stamens, when of the same number, stand over the intervals between the petals, or when twice as many, as in the trillium, the outer set alternates with the petals, and the inner set, alternating with the other, of course, stands before the petals, and the pistils alternate with these. This is just as it should be on the theory that the circles of the blossom answer to whorls of leaves, which alternate in this way. While in such flowers the circles are to be regarded as whorls, in others they are rather to be regarded as condensed spirals of alternate leaves. But, however this may be, in the mind of a morphological botanist, flowers are altered branches, and their parts, therefore, altered leaves. That is, certain buds, which might have grown and lengthened into a leafy branch, do, under other circumstances, and to accomplish other purposes, develop into blossoms. In these, the axis remains short, nearly as it is in the bud. The leaves, therefore, remain close together in sets or circles. The outer ones, those of the calyx, generally partake more or less of the character of foliage. The next set are more delicate and form the corolla while the rest, the stamens and pistils, appear under forms very different from those of ordinary leaves, and are concerned in the production of seed. This view gives to botany an interest which one who merely notices the shape and counts the parts of blossoms without understanding their plan has no conception of. That flowers answer to branches may be shown first from their position, as explained in the section on inflorescence, flowers arise from the same places as branches, and from no other. Flower buds, like leaf buds, appear either on the summit of a stem, that is, as a terminal bud, or in the axle of a leaf, as an axillary bud. And, as the plan of a symmetrical flower shows, the arrangement of the parts on their axis or receptacle is that of leaves upon the stem. That the sepals and petals are of the nature of leaves is evident from their appearance. They are commonly called the leaves of the flower. The calyx is most generally green in color, and foliaceous, leaf-like in texture. And though the corolla is rarely green, yet neither are proper leaves always green. In our wild painted cup, and in some scarlet sages, common in gardens, the leaves just under the flowers are of the brightest red or scarlet, often much brighter colored than the corolla itself, and sometimes, as in many cactuses and in Carolina allspice, there is such a regular gradation from the last leaves of the plant, bracts or bractlets, into the leaves of the calyx, that it is impossible to say where one ends and the other begins. If sepals are leaves, so also are petals for there is no clearly fixed limit between them. Not only in the Carolina allspice and cactus, but in the water lily, and in a variety of flowers with more than one row of petals, there is such a complete transition between calyx and corolla 
that no one can surely tell how many of the leaves belong to the one and how many to the other. That stamens are of the same general nature as petals, and therefore a modification of leaves, is shown by the gradual transitions that occur between the one and the other in many blossoms, especially in cultivated flowers, such as roses and camellias, when they begin to double, that is, to change their stamens into petals. Some wild and natural flowers show the same interesting transitions. The Carolina allspice and the white water lily exhibit complete gradations not only between sepals and petals, but between petals and stamens. The sepals of our water lily are green outside, but white and petal-like on the inside. The petals, in many rows, gradually grow narrower towards the center of the flower. Some of these are tipped with a trace of a yellow anther, but still are petals. The next are more contracted and stamen-like, but with a flat, petal-like filament, and a further narrowing of this completes the genuine stamen. Pistols and stamens now and then change into each other in some willows. Pistols often turn into petals in cultivated flowers, and in the double cherry they are occasionally replaced by small green leaves. Sometimes a whole blossom changes into a cluster of green leaves, as in the green roses, occasionally noticed in gardens, and sometimes it degenerates into a leafy branch. So the botanist regards pistils also as answering to leaves, that is, to single leaves when simple and separate, to a whorl of leaves when conjoined. End of section 9. Recording by Mackenzie Nicole Greenwood for LibriVox.org in February of 2018. Section 10 of the Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L I B R I V O X dot O R G. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray. Parts 4 and 5. 4 modifications of the type. The deviations, as they may be called, from the assumed type or pattern of flower are most various and extensive. The differences between one species and another of the same genus are comparatively insignificant. Those between different genera are more striking. Those between different families and classes of plants more and more profound. They represent different adaptations to conditions or modes of life, some of which have obvious or probable utilities, although others are beyond particular explanation. The principal modifications may be conveniently classified. First, those which, in place of perfect, otherwise called hermaphrodite or bisexual flowers, give origin to unisexual or separated or diclinous flowers. Imperfect flowers, as they have been called in contradistinction to perfect flowers, but that term is too ambiguous. In these, some flowers want the stamens, while others want the pistils. Taking hermaphrodite flowers as the pattern, it is natural to say that the missing organs are suppressed. This expression is justified by the very numerous cases in which the missing parts are abortive that is, are represented by rudiments or vestiges which serve to exemplify the plan, although useless as to office. Unisexual flowers are monoecious, i.e. of one household, when flowers of both sorts or sexes are produced by the same individual plant, as in the ricinus or castor oil plant. Dioecious, i.e. of separate households, when the two kinds are born on different plants, as in willows, poplars, hemp, and moonseed. Polygamous, when the flowers are some of them perfect and some staminate or pistillate only. A blossom having stamens and no pistil is a staminate or male flower. Sometimes it is called a sterile flower. Not appropriately, for other flowers may equally be sterile. One having pistil but no stamens is a pistillate or female flower. Incomplete flowers are so named in contradistinction to complete they want either one or both of the floral envelopes. Some are incomplete, having calyx, but no corolla. So is the flower of anemone, although its calyx is colored like a corolla. 
The flowers of Saururus, or lizard's tail, although perfect, have neither calyx nor corolla. Incomplete flowers, accordingly, are naked or acclimatious, destitute of both floral envelopes, or apetalous when wanting only the corolla. The case of corolla present and calyx wholly wanting is extremely rare, although there are seeming instances. In fact, a single or simple perianth is taken to be a calyx unless the absence or abortion of a calyx can be made evident. In contradistinction to regular and symmetrical, very many flowers are irregular, that is, with the members of some or all of the floral circles unequal or dissimilar, and unsymmetrical, that is, when the circles of the flower, or some of them, differ in the number of their members. Symmetrical and unsymmetrical are used in a different sense in some recent books, but the older use should be adhered to. Want of numerical symmetry and irregularity commonly go together, and both are common. Indeed, few flowers are entirely symmetrical beyond calyx, corolla, and perhaps stamens, and probably no irregular blossoms are quite symmetrical. Irregular and unsymmetrical flowers may therefore be illustrated together, beginning with cases which are comparatively free from other complications. The blossom of mustard, and of all the very natural family which it represents, is regular but unsymmetrical in the stamens. There are four equal sepals, four equal petals, but six stamens, and only two members in the pistil, which for the present may be left out of view. The want of symmetry is in the stamens. These are in two circles, an outer and an inner. The outer circle consists of two stamens only. The inner has its proper number of four. The flower of violet, which is on the plan of five, is symmetrical in calyx, corolla, and stamens, inasmuch as each of these circles consists of five members. But it is conspicuously irregular in the corolla, one of the petals being very different from the rest. The flowers of larkspur and of monkshood or aconite, which are nearly related, are both strikingly irregular in calyx and corolla, and considerably unsymmetrical. In larkspur, the irregular calyx consists of five sepals, one of which, larger than the rest, is prolonged behind into a large sac or spur. But the corolla is of only four petals, of two shapes, the fifth needed to complete the symmetry being left out. And the monk's hood has five very dissimilar sepals and a corolla of only two very small and curiously shaped petals, the three needed to make up the symmetry being left out. The stamens in both are out of symmetry with the ground plan, being numerous. So are the pistils, which are usually diminished to three, sometimes to two or to one. Flowers with multiplication of parts are very common. The stamens are indefinitely numerous in larkspur and in monkshood, while the pistils are fewer than the ground plan suggests. Most cactus flowers have all the organs much increased in number, and so of the water lily. In anemone, the stamens and pistils are multiplied while the petals are left out. In buttercups or crowfoot, while the sepals and petals conform to the ground plan of five, both stamens and pistils are indefinitely multiplied. Flowers modified by union of parts, so that these parts more or less lose the appearance of separate leaves or other organs growing out of the end of the stem or receptacle, are extremely common. There are two kinds of such union, namely coalescence of parts of the same circle by their contiguous margins, and adnation, or the union of adjacent circles or unlike parts. Coalescence is not rare in leaves, as in the upper pairs of honeysuckles, it may all the more be expected in the crowded circles or whorls of flower leaves. Detura or stramonium shows this coalescence both in calyx and corolla, the five sepals and the five petals being thus united to near their tips, each into a tube or long and narrow cup. These unions make needful the following terms. Gamma petalus said of a corolla the petals of which are thus coalescent into one body, whether only at base or higher. The union may extend to the very summit, as in morning glory and the like, so that the number of petals in it may not be apparent. The old name for this was monopetalus, but that means one-petaled, while gamma-petalus means petals united, and therefore is the proper term. 
polypedalous is the counterpart term to denote a corolla of distinct, that is, separate petals, as it means many petaled. It is not the best possible name, but it is the old one and in almost universal use. Gamosepalus applies to the calyx when the sepals are in this way united, polysepalus to the calyx when of separate sepals or calyx leaves. Degree of union or of separation in descriptive botany is expressed in the same way as in the lobing of leaves. A corolla, when gamopedalus, commonly shows a distinction between a contracted tubular portion below, the tube, and the spreading part above, the border or limb. The junction between tube and limb, or a more or less enlarged upper portion of the tube between the two, is the throat. The same is true of the calyx. Some names are given to particular forms of the gamopedalus corolla, applicable also to a gamosepalus calyx, such as wheel-shaped or rotate, when spreading out at once, without a tube or with very short one, something in the shape of a wheel or of its diverging spokes. Salver-shaped or salver form, when a flat spreading border is raised on a narrow tube, from which it diverges at right angles, like the salver represented in old pictures, with a slender handle beneath. Bell-shaped or campanulate, where a short and broad tube widens upward, in the shape of a bell. Funnel-shaped or funnel form, gradually spreading at the summit of a tube which is narrow below, in the shape of a funnel or tunnel, as in the corolla of the common morning glory and of the stramonium. Tubular, when prolonged into a tube with little or no spreading at the border, as in the corolla of the trumpet honeysuckle, the calyx of stramonium, etc. Although sepals and petals are usually all blade or lamina, like a sessile leaf, Yet they may have a contracted and stalk-like base, answering to a petiole. This is called its claw. In Latin, unguis, unguiculate petals are universal and strongly marked in the pink tribe, as in soapwort. Such petals, and various others, may have an outgrowth of the inner face into an appendage or fringe, as in soapwort and in selene, where it is at the junction of claw and blade. This is called a crown or corona. In passion flowers, the crown consists of numerous threads on the base of each petal. Irregular flowers may be polypetalous, or nearly so, as in the Papilinaceous corolla, but most of them are irregular through coalescence, which often much disguises the numerical symmetry also. As affecting the corolla, the following forms have received particular names. Papilinaceous corolla. This is polypetalous, except that two of the petals cohere usually but slightly. It belongs only to the leguminous or pulse family. The name means butterfly-like, but the likeness is hardly obvious. The names of the five petals of the Papilinaceous corolla are curiously incongruous. They are the standard, or banner, vexillum, the large upper petal which is external in the bud and wrapped around the others, the wings, aloe, the pair of side petals, of quite different shape from the standard. The keel, carina, the two lower and usually smallest petals. These are lightly coalescent into a body which bears some likeness, not to the keel, but to the prow of a boat. And this encloses the stamens and pistil. A pea blossom is a typical example. Consider a species of locust, Robinia hispida. Labiate corolla, which would more properly have been called bilabiate, that is, two-lipped. This is a common form of gamopetalous corolla, and the calyx is often bilabiate also. These flowers are all on the plan of five, and the irregularity in the corolla is owing to unequal union of the petals, as well as to diversity of form. The two petals of the upper or posterior side of the flower unite with each other higher up than with the lateral petals forming the upper lip. The lateral and the lower similarly unite to form the lower lip. The single notch, which is generally found at the summit of the upper lip, and the two notches of the lower lip, or, in other words, the two lobes of the upper and the three of the lower lip, reveal the real composition. So also does the alternation of these five parts with those of the calyx outside. When the calyx is also bilabiate, as in the sage, 
This alternation gives three lobes or sepals to the upper and two to the lower lip. Two forms of the labiate corolla have been designated. Ringent or gaping when the orifice is wide open. Personate or masked when a protuberance or intrusion of the base of the lower lip, called a palate, projects over or closes the orifice, as in snapdragon and toad flax. There are all gradations between labiate and regular corollas. In those of Gerardia, of some species of penstemon, and of catalpa, the labiate character is slight, but is manifest on close inspection. In almost all such flowers, the plan of five, which is obvious or ascertainable in the calyx and corolla, is obscured in the stamens by the abortion or suppression of one or three of their number. Ligulate corolla. The ligulate or strap-shaped corolla mainly belongs to the family of compositae, in which numerous small flowers are gathered into a head within an involucre that imitates a calyx. It is best exemplified in the dandelion and in chicory, each one of these straps, or ligules, looking like so many petals, is the corolla of a distinct flower. The base is a short tube, which opens out into the ligule. The five minute teeth at the end indicate the number of constituent petals. So this is a kind of gamma-petalous corolla, which is open along one side nearly to the base and outspread. The nature of such a corolla and of the stamens also, to be explained in the next section, is illustrated by the flower of a lobelia. In asters, daisies, sunflower, coreopsis, and the like, only the marginal or ray corollas are ligulate. The rest, those of the disc, are regularly gamapetalous, tubular, and five-lobed at summit. But they're small and individually inconspicuous, only the ray flowers making a show. In fact, those of Coreopsis and of Sunflower are simply for show, these ray flowers being not only sterile, but neutral, that is, having neither stamens nor pistil. But in asters, daisies, goldenrods, and the like, these ray flowers are pistillate and fertile, serving therefore for seed bearing as well as for show. Let it not be supposed that the show is useless. Adnation, or consolidation, is the union of the members of parts belonging to different circles of the flower. It is, of course, understood that in this, as likewise in coalescence, the parts are not formed and then conjoined, but are produced in union. They are born united, as the term adnate implies. To illustrate this kind of union, take this series of flowers. First, in the flax flower there is no adnation. Sepals, petals, and stamens are free as well as distinct, being separately born on the receptacle, one circle within or above the next. Only the five pistils have their ovaries coalescent. In a cherry flower, the petals and stamens are born on the throat of the calyx tube. That is, the sepals are coalescent into a cup, and the petals and stamens are adnate to the inner face of this. In other words, the sepals, petals, and stamens are all consolidated up to a certain height. In a purslane flower, the same parts are adnate to or consolidated with the ovary up to its middle. In a hawthorn flower, the consolidation has extended over the whole ovary, and petals and stamens are adnate to the calyx still further. In a cranberry blossom, it is the same except that all the parts are free at the same height all seem to arise from the top of the ovary. In botanical description, to express tersely such differences in the relation of these organs to the pistil, they are said to be hypogenous when they are all free, that is, not adnate to pistil nor conate with each other, perigenous around the pistil when conate with each other, that is, when petals and stamens are inserted or borne on the calyx, whether as in cherry flowers, they are free from the pistil, or as in purslane and hawthorn, they are also adnate below to the ovary. Epigenous, on the ovary, when so adnate that all these parts appear to arise from the very summit of the ovary. The last two terms are not very definitely distinguished. Another and a simpler form of expression is to describe parts of the flower as being free when not united with or inserted upon other parts, distinct when parts of the same kind are not united, 
This term is the counterpart of coalescent, as free is the counterpart of admate. Many writers use the term free indiscriminately for both, but it is better to distinguish them. Conate is a term common for either not free or not distinct, that is, for parts united congenitally, whether of the same or of different kinds. Adnate, as properly used, relates to the union of dissimilar parts. In still another form of expression, the terms superior and inferior have been much used in the sense of above and below. Superior is said of the ovary of flax flower, cherry, etc., because above the other parts. It is equivalent to ovary free, or it is said of the calyx, etc., when above the ovary. Inferior, when applied to the ovary, means the same as calyx adnate. When applied to the floral envelopes, it means that they are free. Position of flower or of its parts. The terms superior and inferior, or upper and lower, are also used to indicate the relative position of the parts of a flower in reference to the axis of inflorescence. An axillary flower stands between the bract or leaf which subtends it and the axis or stem which bears this bract or leaf. This may be represented in sectional diagrams by a transverse line for the bract and a small circle for the axis of inflorescence. Now the side of the blossom which faces the bract is the anterior or inferior or lower side, while the side next to the axis is the posterior or superior or upper side of the flower. So, in the labiate corolla, the lip which is composed of three of the five petals is the anterior or inferior or lower lip. The other is the posterior or superior or upper lip. In violets, the odd sepal is posterior, next to the axis. The odd petal is therefore anterior, or next to the subtending leaf. In the papilinaceous flower, the odd sepal is anterior, and so two sepals are posterior. Consequently, by the alternation, the odd petal, the standard, is posterior or upper, and the two petals forming the keel are anterior or lower. 5. Arrangement of Parts in the Bud Estivation was the fanciful name given by Linnaeus to denote the disposition of the parts, especially the leaves of the flower, before anthesis, i.e. before the blossom opens. Prefloration, a better term, is sometimes used. This is of importance in distinguishing different families or genera of plants, being generally uniform in each. The estivation is best seen by making a slice across the flower bud. The pieces of the calyx or the corolla either overlap each other in the bud or they do not. When they do not overlap, the estivation is valvate when the pieces meet each other by their abrupt edges, without any infolding or overlapping, as the calyx of the linden or basewood. In duplicate, which is valvate, with the margins of each piece projecting inwards, as in the calyx of a common virgin's bower. In volute, which is the same, but the margins rolled inward, as in most of the large flowered species of clematis. Reduplicate, a rarer modification of valvate, is similar but with margins projecting outward. Open, the parts not touching in the bud, as the calyx of mignonette. When the pieces overlap in the bud, it is in one of two ways. Either every piece has one edge in and one edge out, or some pieces are wholly outside and others wholly inside. In the first case, the estivation is convolute, also named contorted or twisted. A cross-section of a corolla very strongly thus convolute or rolled up together and in the corolla of a flax flower, where the petals only moderately overlap in this way. Here, one edge of every petal covers the next before it, while its other edge is covered by the next behind it. The other mode is the imbricate or imbricated, in which the outer parts cover or overlap the inner, so as to break joints like tiles or shingles on a roof, whence the name. When the parts are three, the first or outermost is wholly external, the third wholly internal. The second one has one margin covered by the first, while the other overlaps the third or innermost piece. This is the arrangement of alternate three-ranked leaves. When there are five pieces, two are external, two are internal, and one, the third in the spiral, has one edge covered by the outermost, while its other edge covers the innermost, 
which is just the five-ranked arrangement of alternate leaves. When the pieces are four, two are outer and two are inner, which answers to the arrangement of opposite leaves. The imbricate and convolute modes sometimes vary one into the other, especially in the corolla. In a gamma petalous corolla or gamma sepalous calyx, the shape of the tube in the bud may sometimes be noticeable. It may be plicate or plated, that is, folded lengthwise, and the plates may either be turned outwards, forming projecting ridges, as in the corolla of Campanula, or turned inwards, as in that of Gentian belladonna, or supervolute, when the plates are convolutely wrapped round each other, as in the corolla of Morning Glory and of Stramonium. End of section 10. Recording by Mackenzie Nicole Greenwood for LibriVox.org in February of 2018. Section 11 of The Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray. Stamens in particular. Androsecum is a technical name for the staminate system of a flower, that is, for the stamens taken together, which it is sometimes convenient to use. The preceding section has dealt with modifications of the flower pertaining mainly to calyx and corolla. Those relating to the stamens are now to be indicated, first as to insertion, or place of attachment. The stamens usually go with the petals not rarely they are at base epiptalis that is inserted on or adnate to the corolla as in figure two eight three illustration figure two eight three corolla of morning glory laid open to show the five stamens inserted on it near the base when free from the corolla they may be hypogenous inserted on the receptacle under the pistil or gynoecium perigynous inserted on the calyx that is with the lower part of filament adnate to the calyx tube epigynous borne apparently on the top of the ovary all which is explained in figure two seven zero two two seven four illustration figure two eight four style of a lady's slipper cypri petium and stamens united with it a a the anthers of the two good stamens s t an abortive stamen what should be its anther changed into a petal like body stig the stigma gynandrus is another term relating to insertion of rarer occurrence that is where the stamens are inserted on in other words adnate to the style as in ladies slipper figure two eight four and in the orchis family generally in relation to each other stamens are more commonly distinct that is without any union with each other but when united the following technical terms of long use indicate their modes of mutual connection mon adelphus from two greek words meaning in one brotherhood when united by their filaments into one set usually into a ring or cup below or into a tube as in the mallow family figure two eight six the passion flower figure two six zero the lupine figure two eight seven and in lobelia figure two eight five illustration figure two eight five flower of lobelia cardinalis cardinal flower corolla making approach to the ligulate form filaments s t monadelphus and anthers a syngenesius illustration figure two eight six flower of mallow with calyx and corolla cut away showing monadelphus stamens figure two eight seven monadelphus stamens of lupine two eight eight diadelphus stamens nine and one of a pea blossom diadelphus meaning in two brotherhoods when united by the filaments into two sets as in the pea and most of its near relatives figure two eight eight usually nine in one set and one in the other triadelphus three brotherhoods when the filaments are united in three sets or clusters as in most species of hypericum pentadelphus five brotherhoods when in five sets 
as in some species of hypericum and in american linden figure two seven seven two eight nine polyadelphus many or several brotherhoods is the term generally employed when these sets are several or even more than two and the particular number is left unspecified these terms all relate to the filaments syngenesis is the term to denote that stamens have their anthers united coalescent into a ring or tube as in lobelia figure two eight five in violets and in all of the great family of compositae their number in a flower is commonly expressed directly but sometimes adjectively by a series of terms which were the name of classes in the linnaean artificial system of which the following names as also the preceding are a survival monandrous i e solitary stamen when the flower has only one stamen diandrous when it has two stamens only triandrous when it has three stamens tetrandrous when it has four stamens pentandrous when it has five stamens hexandrous when with six stamens and so on to polyandrous when it has many stamens or more than a dozen illustration figure two eight nine one of the five stamen clusters of the flower of american linden with accompanying scale the five clusters are shown in section in the diagram of this flower figure two seven seven figure two nine zero five gensenesia stamens of a coropsis two nine one same with the tube laid open and displayed for which terms see the glossary they are all greek numerals prefixed to andrea from the greek which linnaeus used for androsecum and are made into an english adjective andrus two other terms of same origin designate particular cases of number four or six in connection with unequal length namely the stamens are didanimous when being only four they form two pairs one pair longer than the other as in the trumpet creeper in gerardia figure two six three etc tetradynamos when being only six four of them surpass the other two as in the mustard flower and all the cruciferous family figure two three five the filament is a kind of stalk to the anther commonly slender or thread-like it is to the anther nearly what the petiole is to the blade of a leaf therefore it is not an essential part as a leaf may be without a stalk so the anther may be sessile or without a filament illustration figure two nine two stamen of isopyrum with innate anther two nine three of tulip tree with adnate and extors anther two nine four of evening primrose with versatile anther the anther is the essential part of the stamen it is a sort of case filled with a fine powder the pollen which serves to fertilize the pistil so that it may perfect seeds the anther is said to be innate as in figure two nine two when it is attached by its base to the very apex of the filament turning neither inward nor outward adnate as in figure two nine three when attached as it were by one face usually for its whole length to the side of a continuation of the filament and versatile as in figure two nine four when fixed by or near its middle only to the very point of the filament so as to swing loosely as in the lily in grasses etc versatile or adnate anthers are in torse or incumbent when facing inward that is toward the centre of the flower as in magnolia water lily etc ex torse when facing outwardly as in the tulip tree rarely does a stamen bear any resemblance to a leaf or even to a petal or flower leaf nevertheless the botanist's idea of a stamen is that it answers to a leaf developed in a peculiar form and for a special purpose in the filament he sees the stalk of the leaf in the anther the blade the blade of a leaf consists of two similar sides the blade of a leaf consists of two similar sides so the anther consists of two lobes or cells one answering to the left the other to the right side of the blade the two lobes are often connected by a prolongation of the filament which answers to the mid-rib of a leaf this is called the connective 
this is conspicuous in figure two nine two where the connective is so broad that it separates the two cells of the anther to some distance illustration figure two nine five diagram of the lower part of an anther cut across above and the upper part of a leaf to show how the one answers to the other the filament to petiole the connective to midrib the two cells to the right and left halves of the blade a simple conception of the morphological relation of an anther to a leaf is given in figure two nine five an ideal figure the lower part representing a stamen with the top of its anther cut away the upper the corresponding upper part of a leaf so anthers are generally two-celled but as the pollen begins to form in two parts of each cell the anterior and the posterior sometimes these two strata are not confluent and the anther even at maturity may be four-celled as in moon seed figure two nine six or rather in that case the word cell being used for each lateral half of the organ it is two-celled but the cells bilocellate illustration figure two nine six stamen of moon seed with anther cut across this four-celled or rather four locellate figure two nine seven stamen of penstemon pubescens the two anther cells diverging and almost confluent figure two nine eight stamen of mallow the anther supposed to answer to that of figure two nine seven but the cells completely confluent into one figure two nine nine stamen of globe amaranth very short filament bearing a single anther cell it is open from top to bottom showing the pollen within illustration figure three zero zero to three zero five stamens of several plants of the labiate or mint family figure three zero zero of amon arda the two anther cells with bases divergent so that they are transverse to the filament and their contiguous tips confluent so as to form one cell opening by a continuous line figure three zero one of a calamintha the broad connective separating the two cells figure three zero two of a sage salvia texana with a long and slender connective resembling forks of the filament one bearing a good anther cell the other an abortive or poor one figure three zero three another sage s coccinea with connective longer and more thread shaped the lower fork having its anther cell wholly wanting figure three zero four of a white sage audibertia grandiflora the lower fork of connective a mere vestige figure three zero five of another white sage a stachyoides the lower fork of connective suppressed but anthers may become one-celled and that either by confluence or by suppression by confluence when the two cells run together into one as they nearly do in most species of penstemon figure two nine seven more so in monarda figure three zero zero and completely in the mallow figure two nine eight and all the mallow family by suppression in certain cases the anther may be reduced to one cell or halved in globe amaranth figure two nine nine there is a single cell without vestige of any other different species of sage and of the white sages of california show various grades of abortion of one of the anther cells along with the singular lengthening of the connective figure three zero two to three zero five the splitting open of an anther for the discharge of its pollen is termed its dehiscence illustration figure three zero six stamen with the usual dehiscence of anther down the side of each cell figure three zero seven stamen of pyrola cells opening by a terminal hole figure three zero eight stamen of barberry cells of anther each opening by an uplifted valve as the figures show this is commonly by a line along the whole length of each cell either lateral or when the anthers are extorse often along the outer face and when in torse along the inner face of each cell sometimes the opening is only by a chink hole or pore at the top as in the azalea pyrola figure three zero seven etc sometimes a part of the face separates as a sort of trap door or valve hinged at the top an opening to allow the escape of the pollen 
as in the sassafras spice bush and barberry figure three zero eight pollen this is the powdery matter commonly of a yellow color which fills the cells of the anther and is discharged during blossoming after which the stamens generally fall or wither away under the microscope it is found to consist of grains usually round or oval and all alike in the same species but very different in different plants so that the plant may sometimes be recognized from the pollen alone several forms are shown in the accompanying figures illustration figure three zero nine magnified pollen of a lily smooth and oval three one zero of echinocystis grooved lengthwise three one one of sicyos with bristly points and smooth bands three one two of musk plant mimulus with spiral grooves three one three of succory twelve-sided and dotted an ordinary pollen grain has two coats the outer coat thickish but weak and frequently adorned with lines or bands or studded with points the inner coat is extremely thin and delicate but extensible and its cavity when fresh contains a thickish protoplasmic fluid often rendered turbid by an immense number of minute particles that float in it as the pollen matures this fluid usually dries up but the protoplasm does not lose its vitality when the grain is wetted it absorbs water swells up and is apt to burst discharging the contents but when weak syrup is used it absorbs this slowly and the tough inner coat will sometimes break through the outer and begin a kind of growth like that which takes place when the pollen is placed upon the stigma illustration figure three one four magnified pollen of hibiscus and other mallow plants beset with prickly projections three one five of circaea with angles bearing little lobes three one six of evening primrose the three lobes as large as the central body three one seven of calmia four grains united as in most of the heath family three one eight of pine as it were of three grains or cells united the lateral empty and light some pollen grains are as it were lobed as in figure three one five three one six or formed of four grains united as in the heath family figure three one seven that of pine figure three one eight has a large rounded and empty bladder-like expansion upon each side this renders such pollen very buoyant and capable of being transported to a great distance by the wind in species of acacia simple grains lightly cohere into globular pellets in milkweeds and in most orchids all the pollen of an anther cell is compacted or coherent into one mass called a pollen mass or pollinium plural pollinia figure three one nine to three two two illustration figure three one nine pollen a pair of pollinia of a milkweed asclepius attached by stalks to a gland moderately magnified illustration figure three two zero pollinium of an orchis habenaria with its stalk attached to a sticky gland magnified three two one some of the packets or partial pollinia of which figure three two zero is made up more magnified illustration figure three two two one of the partial pollinia torn up at top to show the grains which are each composed of four and highly magnified end of section eleven section twelve of elements of botany this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen the elements of botany by asa gray pistols in particular angiospermus or ordinary gynosium gynosium is the technical name for the pistil or pistils of a flower taken collectively or for whatever stands in place of these the various modifications of the gynosium and the terms which relate to them require particular attention the pistil when only one occupies the centre of the flower when there are two pistils 
they stand facing each other in the centre of the flower when several they commonly form a ring or circle and when very numerous they are generally crowded in rows or spirals on the surface of a more or less enlarged or elongated receptacle their number gives rise to certain terms the counterpart of those used for stamens two eight four which are survivals of the names of orders in the linnaean artificial system the names were coined by prefixing greek numerals to gynia used for gynoceum and changed into adjectives in the form of gynus that is a flower is monogynous when it has a single pistil whether that be simple or compound digynous when it has only two pistils trigynous when with three tetragynous with four pentagynous with five hexagynous with six and so on to polygynous with many pistils the parts of a complete pistil as already twice explained one six two three six are the ovary the style and the stigma the ovary is one essential part it contains the rudiments of seeds called ovules the stigma at the summit is also essential it receives the pollen which fertilizes the ovules in order that they may become seeds but the style commonly a tapering or slender column borne on the summit of the ovary and bearing the stigma on its apex or its side is no more necessary to a pistil than the filament is to the stamen accordingly there is no style in many pistils in these the stigma is sessile that is rests directly on the ovary as in figure three two six the stigma is very various in shape and appearance being sometimes a little knob as in the cherry figure two seven one sometimes a point or small surface of bare tissue as in figure three two seven two three three zero and sometimes a longitudinal crest or line as in figure three two four three four one to three four three or it may occupy the whole length of the style as in figure three three one the word pistil latin pistillum means a pestle it came into use in the first place for such flowers as those of crown imperial or lily in which the pistil in the centre was likened to the pestle and the perianth around it to the mortar of the apothecary a pistil is either simple or compound it is simple when it answers to a single flower leaf compound when it answers to two or three or a fuller circle of such leaves conjoined carpels it is convenient to have a name for each flower leaf of the gynoecium so it is called a carpel in latin carpellum or carpidium a simple pistil is a carpel each component flower leaf of a compound pistil is likewise a carpel when a flower has two or more pistils these of course are simple pistils that is separate carpels or pistil leaves there may be only a single simple pistil to the flower as in a pea or cherry blossom figure two seven one there may be two such as in many saxifrages or many as in the strawberry more commonly the single pistil in the centre of a blossom is a compound one then there is seldom much difficulty in ascertaining the number of carpels or pistil leaves that compose it the simple pistil viewed morphologically answers to a leaf blade with margins and curved and united where they meet so forming a closed case or pod the ovary and bearing ovules at the suture or junction of these margins a tapering upper portion with margins similarly enrolled is supposed to form the style and these same margins exposed at the tip or for a portion of the length become the stigma compare under this view the three accompanying figures illustration figure three two three an enrolled small leaf such as in double flowered cherry blossoms is often seen to occupy the place of a pistil figure three two four a simple pistil of isopyrum with ovary cut across the inner ventral face turned toward the eye the ovules seem to be borne on the ventral suture answering to leaf margins the stigma above seen also to answer to leaf margins figure three two five pod or simple pistil of keltha or marsh marigold which has opened and shed its seeds 
so a simple pistol should have a one-celled ovary only one line of attachment for the ovules a single style and a single stigma certain variations from this normal condition which sometimes occur do not invalidate this morphological conception for instance the stigma may become too lobed or too ridged because it consists of two leaf margins as figure three two four shows it may become too locellate by the turning or growing inward of one of the sutures so as to divide the cavity there are two or three terms which primarily relate to the parts of a simple pistil or carpel and are thence carried on to the compound pistil namely ventral suture the line which answers to the united margins of the carpal leaf therefore naturally called a suture or seam and the ventral or inner one because in the circle of carpal leaves it looks inward or to the centre of the flower dorsal suture is the line down the back of the carpal answering to the mid-rib of the leaf not a seam therefore but at maturity many fruits such as pea pods open by this dorsal as well as by the ventral line placenta a name given to the surface whatever it be which bears the ovules and seeds the name may be needless when the ovules grow directly on the ventral suture or from its top or bottom but when there are many ovules there is usually some expansion of an ovule bearing or seed bearing surface as is seen in our mandrake or potophyllum figure three two six illustration figure three two six simple pistil of potophyllum cut across showing ovules born on placenta figure three two seven pistil of a saxifrage of two simple carpels or pistil leaves united at the base only cut across both above and below figure three two eight compound three capillary pistil of common st john's support cut across the three styles separate figure three two nine the same of shrubby st john's wort the three styles as well as ovaries here united into one figure three three zero compound three carpillary pistil of tradescantia or spider wort the three stigmas as well as styles and ovary completely coalescent into one a compound pistil is a combination of two three or a greater number of pistil leaves or carpels in a circle united into one body at least by their ovaries the annexed figures should make it clear a series of saxifrages might be selected the gynoecium of which should show every gradation between two simple pistils or separate carpels and their complete coalescence into one compound and two-celled ovary even when the constituent styles and stigmas are completely coalescent into one the nature of the combination is usually revealed by some external lines or grooves or as in figure three two eight to three three zero by the internal partitions or the number of placentae the simplest case of compound pistil is that with two or more cells and axile placentae namely with as many cells as there are carpels that have united to compose the organ such a pistil is just what would be formed if the simple pistils two three or five in a circle as the case may be like those of a peony or stone crop figure two two four two two five pressed together in the centre of the flower were to cohere by their contiguous parts in such a case the placentae are naturally axile or all brought together in the axis or centre and the ovary has as many decepiments or internal partitions as there are carpels in its composition for these are the contiguous and coalescent walls or sides of the component carpels when such pistils ripen into pods they often separate along these lines into their elementary carpels illustration figure three three one three three two pistil of a sand wart with vertical and transverse section of the ovary free central placenta one celled with free central placenta the commoner case is that of purslane figure two seven two and of the pink and chickweed families figure three three one three three two this is explained by supposing that the partitions such as those of figure three two nine have early vanished or have been suppressed indeed 
traces of them may often be detected in pinks on the other hand it is equally supposable that in the primula family the free central is derived from parietal placentation by the carpels bearing ovules only at base and forming a consolidated common placenta in the axis metella and dianea help out this conception illustration figure three 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 plan of a one-celled ovary of three carpal leaves with parietal placentae cut across below where it is complete the upper part showing the top of the three leaves it is composed of approaching but not united figure three three four cross-section of the ovary of frost weed helianthemum with three parietal placentae bearing ovules figure three three five cross-section of an ovary of hybricum gravelins the three large placentae meeting in the center so as to form a three-celled ovary three three six same in fruit the placentae now separate and rounded one celled with parietal placentae in this not uncommon case it is conceived that the two or three or more carpal leaves of such a compound pistil coalesce by their adjacent edges just as septal leaves do to form a gamosepalous calyx or petals to form a gamopetalous corolla and as is shown in the diagram figure three 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 and in an actual cross section figure three three four here each carpel is an open leaf or with some introflexion bearing ovules along its margins and each placenta consists of the contiguous margins of two pistil leaves grown together there is every gradation between this and the three-celled ovary with the placentae in the axis even in the same genus sometimes even in different stages in the same pistil figure three three five three three six section two gymnospermus gynoceum the ordinary pistil has a closed ovary and accordingly the pollen can act upon the contained ovules only indirectly through the stigma this is expressed in a term of greek derivation namely angiospermus meaning that the seeds are born in a sac or closed vessel the counterpart term is gymnospermus meaning naked seeded this kind of pistil or gynoceum the simplest of all yet the most peculiar characterizes the pine family and its relatives illustration figure three three seven a pistil that is a scale of the cone of a larch at the time of flowering inside view showing its pair of naked ovules illustration figure three three eight branchlet of the american arbor vitae considerably larger than in nature terminated by its pistillate flowers each consisting of a single scale an open pistil together forming a small cone figure three three nine one of the scales or carpels of the last removed and more enlarged the inside exposed to view showing a pair of ovules on its base by the ordinary simple pistil is conceived by the botanist to be a leaf rolled together into a closed pod figure three o six those of the pine larch figure three three seven cedar and arbor vitae figure three three eight three three nine are open leaves in the form of scales each bearing two or more ovules on the inner face next the base at the time of blossoming these pistil leaves of the young cone diverge and the pollen so abundantly shed from the staminate blossoms falls directly upon the exposed ovules afterward the scales close over each other until the seeds are ripe then they separate that the seeds may be shed as the pollen acts directly on the ovules such pistil or organ acting as pistil has no stigma in the yew and in torea and ginkgo the gynoceum is reduced to extremest simplicity that is to a naked ovule without any visible carpal in cycas the large naked ovules are borne on the margins or lobes of an obvious open leaf all gymospermous plants have other peculiarities also distinguishing them as a class from angiospermous plants end of section twelve section thirteen of the elements of botany this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. 
recording by kathleen the elements of botany by asa gray ovules ovule from the latin meaning a little egg is the technical name of that which in the flower answers to and becomes the seed illustration figure three four zero a cluster of ovules pendulous on their funicles ovules are naked in gymnospermous plants as just described in all others they are enclosed in the ovary they may be produced along the whole length of the cell or cells of the ovary and then they are apt to be numerous or only from some part of it generally the top or the bottom in this case they are usually few or single solitary as in figure three four one to three four three they may be sessile i e without stalk or they may be attached by a distinct stalk the funicle or funiculus figure three four zero illustration figure three four one section of the ovary of a buttercup lengthwise showing its ascending ovule figure three four two section of the ovary of buckwheat showing the erect ovule figure three four three section of the ovary of anemone showing its suspended ovule considered as to the end position and direction in the ovary they are horizontal when they are neither turned upward nor downward as in potophyllum figure three two six ascending when rising obliquely upwards usually from the side of the cell not from its very base as in the buttercup figure three four one and the purslane figure two seven two erect when rising upright from the very base of the cell as in the buckwheat figure three four two pendulous when hanging from the side or from near the top as in the flax figure two seven zero and suspended when hanging perpendicularly from the very summit of the cell as in the anemone figure three four three all these terms equally apply to seeds in structure an ovule is a pulpy mass of tissue usually with one or two coats or coverings the following parts are to be noted namely kernel or nucleus the body of the ovule in the mistletoe and some related plants there is only this nucleus the coats being wanting teguments or coats sometimes only one more commonly two when two one has been called premine the other secundine it will serve all purposes to call them simply outer and inner ovule coats orifice or foramen an opening through the coats at the organic apex of the ovule in the seed it is micropyle chalaza the place where the coats and the kernel of the ovule blend hilum the place of junction of the funiculus with the body of the ovule illustration figure three four four orthotropus ovule of buckwheat c hilum and chalaza f orifice figure three four five campylotropus ovule of a chickweed c hilum and chalaza f orifice figure three four six amphitropus ovule of mallow f orifice h hilum r raffi c chalaza figure three four seven anatropus ovule of a violet the parts lettered as in the last the kinds of ovules the ovules in their growth develop in three or four different ways and thereby are distinguished into orthotropus or straight those which develop without curving or turning as in figure three four four the chalaza is at the insertion or base the foramen or orifice is at the apex this is the simplest but the least common kind of ovule campylotropus or incurved in which by the greater growth of one side the ovule curves into a kidney-shaped outline so bringing the orifice down close to the base or chalaza as in figure three four five amphithropus or half inverted figure three four six here the forming ovule instead of curving perceptibly keeps its axis nearly straight and as it grows turns round upon its base so far as to become transverse to its funiculus 
and adnate to its upper part for some distance therefore in this case the attachment of the funiculus or stalk is about the middle the chalaza is at one end the orifice at the other illustration figure three four eight to three five zero three early stages in the growth of ovule of a magnolia showing the forming outer and inner coats which even in the later figure have not yet completely enclosed the nucleus three five one further advanced and three five two completely anatropous ovule figure three five three longitudinal section and three five four transverse section of three five two illustration figure three five five same as three five three enlarged showing the parts in section a outer coat b inner coat c nucleus d raphi anatropous or inverted as in figure three four seven the commonest kind so called because in its growth it has as it were turned over upon its stalk to which it has continued adnate the organic base or chalaza thus becomes the apparent summit and the orifice is at the base by the side of the hilum or place of attachment the adnate portion of the funiculus which appears as a ridge or cord extending from the hilum to the chalaza and which distinguishes this kind of ovule is called the raphi the amphitropus ovule figure three four six has a short or incomplete raphi figure three four eight to three five two show the stages through which an ovule becomes anatropous in the course of its growth the annexed two figures are sections of such an ovule at maturity and figure three five five is figure three five three enlarged with the parts lettered end of section thirteen section fourteen of the elements of botany this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen the elements of botany by asa gray modifications of the receptacle illustration figure three five six longitudinal section of flower of selene pennsylvanica showing stipe between calyx and corolla figure three five seven flower of a cleome of the section gynandropsis showing broadened receptacle to bear petals lengthened stipe below the stamens and another between these and pistil figure three five eight pistil of geranium or crane's bill figure three five seven the same ripe with the five carpels splitting away from the long beak carpel four and hanging from its top by their recurving styles the torus or receptacle of the flower figure two three seven figure two two three is the portion which belongs to the stem or axis in all preceding illustrations it is small and short but it sometimes lengthens sometimes thickens or variously enlarges and takes on various forms some of these have received special names very few of which are in common use a lengthened portion of the receptacle is called a stipe this name which means simply a trunk or stalk is used in botany for various stalks even for the leaf stalk in ferns it is also applied to the stalk or petiole of a carpel in the rare cases when there is any as in gold thread then it is technically distinguished as a the cap or when there is a stalk or lengthened internode of receptacle directly under a compound pistil as in stanleia and some other crucifera it is called a gynophore when the stalk is developed below the stamens as in the species of selene figure three five six it has been called an anthophore or gynophore in figure three five seven the torus is dilated above the calyx where it bears the petals then there is a long internode gynophore between it and the stamens then a shorter one gynophore between these and the pistil 
a carpophore is a prolongation of receptacle or access between the carpels and bearing them umbelliferous plants and geranium figure three five eight three five nine afford characteristic examples illustration figure three six zero longitudinal section of a young strawberry enlarged figure three six one similar section of a young rosehip figure three six two enlarged and top shaped receptacle of nelumbium at maturity flowers with very numerous simple pistils generally have the receptacle enlarged so as to give them room sometimes becoming broad and flat as in the flowering raspberry sometimes elongated as in the blackberry the magnolia etc it is the receptacle in the strawberry figure three six zero much enlarged and pulpy when ripe which forms the eatable part of the fruit and bears the small seed-like pistils on its surface in the rose figure three six one instead of being convex or conical the receptacle is deeply concave or urn shaped indeed a rose hip may be likened to a strawberry turned inside out like the finger of a glove reversed and the hole covered by the adherent tube of the calyx the calyx remains beneath in the strawberry in nelumbium of the water lily family the singular and greatly enlarged receptacle is shaped like a top and bears the small pistils immersed in separate cavities of its flat upper surface figure three six two illustration figure three six three hypogenous disc in orange a disc is an enlarged low receptacle or an outgrowth from it hypogenous when underneath the pistil as in rue and and the orange figure three six three and perigynous when adnate to calyx tube as in buckthorn figure three six four three six five and cherry figure two seven one or to both calyx tube and ovary as in hawthorn figure two seven three a flattened hypogenous disc underlying the ovary or ovaries and from which they fall away at maturity is sometimes called a gynobase as in the rue family in some oragonous flowers such as hound's tongue the gynobase runs up in the center between the carpels into a carpophore the so-called epigynous disc or stylopodium crowning the summit of the ovary in flowers of umbellifera etc cannot be said to belong to the receptacle illustration figure three six four flower of a buckthorn showing a conspicuous perigynous disc figure three six five vertical section of same flower end of section fourteen Section 15 of The Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray. Section 13. Fertilization. The end of the flowers is attained when the ovules become seed. A flower remains for a certain time, longer or shorter according to the species, in anthesis, that is, in the proper state for the fulfillment of this end. During anthesis, the ovules have to be fertilized by the pollen, or at least some pollen has to reach the stigma, or in gymnospermy, the ovule itself, and so set up the peculiar growth upon its moist and permeable tissue, which has for result the production of an embryo in the ovules. By this the ovules are said to be fertilized. The first step is pollination, or so to say, the sowing of the proper pollen upon the stigma, where it is to germinate. Adaptations for Pollination of the Stigma These variations and ever-interesting adaptations and processes are illustrated in the botanical textbook Structural Botany, Chapter 6, Section 4, also in a brief and simple way in botany for young people how plants behave 
so mere outlines only are given here sometimes the application of pollen to the stigma is left to chance as in dioecious wind fertilized flowers sometimes it is rendered very sure as in flowers that are fertilized in the bud sometimes the pollen is prevented from reaching the stigma of the same flower although placed very near to it but then there are always arrangements for its transference to the stigma of some other blossom of the kind it is among these last that the most exquisite adaptations are met with accordingly some flowers are particularly adapted to close or self fertilization others to cross fertilization some for either according to circumstances close fertilization occurs when the pollen reaches and acts upon a stigma of the very same flower this is also called self fertilization or less closely upon other blossoms of the same cluster or the same individual plant cross fertilization occurs when ovules are fertilized by pollen of other individuals of the same species hybridization occurs when ovules are fertilized by pollen of some other necessarily some nearly related species close fertilization would seem to be the natural result of ordinary hermaphrodite flowers but it is by no means so in all of them more commonly the arrangements are such that it takes place only after some opportunity for cross fertilization has been afforded but close fertilization is inevitable in what are called cleistogamous flowers that is in those which are fertilized in the flower bud while still unopened most flowers of this kind indeed never open at all but the closed floral coverings are forced off by the growth of the precociously fertilized pistil common examples of this are found in the earlier blossoms of specularia perfoliata in the later ones of most violets especially the stemless species in our wild jewel weeds or impatiens in the subterranean shoots of amphicarpia every plant which produces these cleistogamous or bud fertilized flowers bears also more conspicuous and open flowers usually of bright colors the latter very commonly fail to set seed but the former are prolific cross fertilization is naturally provided for in dioecious plants is much favored in monoecious plants and hardly less so in dichogamous and in heterogonous flowers cross fertilization depends upon the transportation of pollen and the two principal agents of conveyance are winds and insects most flowers are in their whole structure adapted either to the one or to the other wind fertilizable or anemophilous flowers are more commonly dioecious or monoecious as in pines and all coniferous trees oaks and birches and sedges yet sometimes from aphrodite as in plantains and most grasses they produce a superabundance of very light pollen adapted to be wind-borne and they offer neither nectar to feed winged insects nor fragrance nor bright colors to attract them insect fertilizable or entomophilous flowers are those which are sought by insects for pollen or for nectar or for both through their visits pollen is conveyed from one flower and from one plant to another insects are attracted to such blossoms by their bright colors or their fragrance or by the nectar the material of honey there provided for them while supplying their own needs they carry pollen from anthers to stigmas and from plant to plant thus bringing about a certain amount of cross fertilization willows and some other dioecious flowers are so fertilized chiefly by bees but most insect visited flowers have the stamens and pistils associated either in the same or in contiguous blossoms even when in the same blossom anthers and stigmas are very commonly so situated that under insect visitation some pollen is more likely to be deposited upon other than upon own stigmas so giving a chance for cross as well as for close fertilization on the other hand numerous flowers of various kinds have their parts so arranged that they must almost necessarily be cross fertilized or be barren and are therefore dependent upon the aid of insects this aid is secured by different exquisite adaptations or contrivances which would need a volume for full illustration indeed there is a good number of volumes devoted to this subject footnote beginning with one of c c springle in seventeen ninety three and again in our day 
with darwin on the various contrivances by which orchids are fertilized by insects and in succeeding works in the footnote some of the adaptations which favor or ensure cross fertilization are peculiar to the particular kind of blossom orchids milkweeds kalmia iris and papilinaceous flowers each have their own special contrivances quite different for each irregular flowers and especially irregular corollas are usually adaptations to insect visitation so are all nectaries whether hollow spurs sacs or other concavities in which nectar is secreted and all nectiferous glands moreover there are two arrangements for cross fertilization common to hermaphrodite flowers in various different families of plants which have received special names dichogamy and heterogamy dichogamy is the commoner case flowers are dichogamous when the anthers discharge their pollen either before or after the stigmas of that flower are in a condition to receive it such flowers are protoandrous when the anthers are earlier than the stigmas as in gentians campanula epilobium etc proterogynous when the stigmas are mature and moistened for the reception of pollen before the anthers of that blossom are ready to supply it and are withered before that pollen can be supplied plantains and ribworts mostly wind fertilized are strikingly proterogynous so is amorpha or pawpaws scrofularia and in a less degree the blossom of pears hawthorns and horse chestnut in sabbatia the large flowered species of epilobium and strikingly in clerodendron the dichogamy is supplemented and perfected by movements of the stamens and style one or both adjusted to make sure of cross fertilization heterogony this is the case in which hermaphrodite and fertile flowers of two sorts are produced on different individuals of the same species one sort having higher anthers and lower stigmas the other having higher stigmas and lower anthers thus reciprocally disposed a visiting insect carries pollen from the high anthers of the one to the high stigma of the other and from the low anthers of the one to the low stigma of the other these plants are practically as if dioecious with the advantage that both kinds are fruitful houstonia and michella or partridge berry are excellent and familiar examples these are cases of heterogone dimorphism the relative lengths being only short and long reciprocally heterogone trimorphism in which there is a mid-length as well as a long and short set of stamens and style occurs in lythrum salicaria and some species of oxalis there must be some essential advantage in cross fertilization or cross breeding otherwise all these various elaborate and exquisitely adjusted adaptations would be aimless doubtless the advantage is the same as that which is realized in all the higher animals by the distinction of sexes action of pollen and formation of the embryo pollen growth a grain of pollen may be justly likened to one of the simple bodies spores which answer for seeds in cryptogamous plants like one of these it is capable of germination when deposited upon the moist surface of the stigma or in some cases even when at a certain distance it grows from some point its living inner coat breaking through the inner outer coat and protruding in the form of a delicate tube this as it lengthens penetrates the loose tissue of the stigma and of the loose conducting tissue in the style feeds upon the nourishing liquid matter there provided reaches the cavity of the ovary enters the orifice of an ovule and attaches its extremity to a sac or the lining of a definite cavity in the ovule called the embryo sac origination of the embryo a globule of living matter in the embryo sac is formed and is in some way placed in close proximity to the apex of the pollen tube it probably absorbs the contents of the latter it then sets up a special growth and the embryo or rudimentary plantlet in the seed is the result end of section fifteen Section 16 of The Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corinne LePage. 
The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray. Section 14. The Fruit. Its Nature. The ovary matures into the fruit. In the strictest sense, the fruit is the seed vessel, technically named the pericarp but practically it may include other parts organically connected with the pericarp, especially the calyx, or a part of it, is often incorporated with the ovary, so as to be undistinguishably a portion of the pericarp, and it even forms along with the receptacle the whole bulk of such edible fruits as apples and pears. The receptacle is an obvious part in blackberries, and is the whole edible portion in the strawberry. Also a cluster of distinct carpels may, in ripening, be consolidated or compacted so as practically to be taken for one fruit. Such are raspberries, blackberries, the magnolia fruit, etc. Moreover, the ripened product of many flowers may be compacted or grown together so as to form a single compound fruit. Its kinds have, therefore, to be distinguished. Also, various names of common use in descriptive botany have yet to be mentioned and defined. In respect to composition, accordingly, fruits may be classified into simple, those which result in the ripening of a single pistil and consist only of the matured ovary either by itself, as in a cherry, or with a calyx tube completely incorporated with it, as in a gooseberry or cranberry. Aggregate when a cluster of carpels of the same flower are crowded into a mass, as in raspberries and blackberries. Figure 366. Forming fruit capsule of Galtheria, with calyx thickening around its base. Section of same mature, the berry-like calyx nearly enclosing the capsule. Figure 368. Section of a part of a strawberry. Figure 369. Similar section of part of a blackberry. Figure 370. One of its component simple fruits, troop, in section, showing the pulp, stone, and contained seed, more enlarged. Accessory, or anthocarpus. When the surroundings or supports of the pistil make up a part of the mass, as does the loose calyx changed into a fleshy and berry-like envelope of our winter green and buffalo berry, which are otherwise simple fruits. In an aggregate fruit, such as the strawberry, the great mass is receptacle, and in the blackberry, the juicy receptacle forms the central part of the savory mass. Multiple, or collective, when formed from several flowers consolidated into one mass, of which the commonplace receptacle, or axis, in inflorescence, the floral envelopes, and even bracts, etc., make a part. A mulberry, which superficially much resembles a blackberry, is of this multiple sort. A pineapple is another example. In respect to texture or consistence, fruits may be distinguished into three kinds, vis-a-vis -vis fleshy fruits, those which are more or less soft and juicy throughout, stone fruits or drupaceous, the outer part fleshy like a berry, the inner hard or stony like a nut, and dry fruits, those which have no flesh or pulp. In reference to the way of disseminating the contained seed, fruits are said to be indehiscent when they do not open at maturity. Fleshy fruits and stone fruits are of course indehiscent. The sea becomes free only through decay or by being fed upon by animals. Those which escape digestion are thus disseminated by the latter. Of dry fruits, many are indehiscent, and these are variously arranged to be transported by animals. Some burst irregularly, many are dehiscent, that is, they split open regularly along certain lines and discharge the seeds. A dehiscent fruit almost always contains many or several seeds, or at least more than one seed. Figure 371. Leafy shoot and berry cut across of the larger cranberry, Vaccinium macrocarpon. Figures 372 and 373. Pepo of gourd in section. One carpel of same in diagram. Figure 374. Longitudinal and transverse sections of a pear. Palm. The principal kinds of fruit which have received substantive names and are of common use in descriptive botany 
are the following. Of fleshy fruits, the leading kind is the berry, such as the gooseberry and currant, the blueberry and cranberry, the tomato and the grape. Here the whole flesh is soft throughout. The orange is a berry with a leathery rind. The pepo, or gourd fruit, is a hard-rinded berry belonging to the gourd family, such as the pumpkin, squash, cucumber, and melon. The pom is a name applied to the apple, pear, and quince, fleshy fruits like a berry, but the principal thickness is calyx, only the papery pods arranged in a star in the core really belonging to the carpels. The fruit of the hawthorn is a drupaceous pom, something between pom and droop. Of fruits which are externally fleshy and internally hard, the leading kind is the droop, or stone fruit, of which the cherry, plum, and peach are familiar examples. In this, the outer part of the thickness of the pericarp becomes fleshy or softens like a berry, while the inner hardens like a nut. From the way in which the pistil is constructed, it is evident that the fleshy part here answers to the lower and the stone to the upper face of the component leaf. The layers or concentric portions of a droop, or of any pericarp which is thus separable, are named when thus distinguishable into three portions. Epicarp, the external layer, often the mere skin of the fruit. Mesocarp, the middle layer, which is commonly the fleshy part, and endocarp, the innermost layer, the stone. But more commonly, only two portions of a droop are distinguished and are named, the outer one, sarcocarp, or exocarp, for the flesh, the first name referring to the fleshy character, the second to its being an external layer, and putamen, or endocarp, the stone within. Figure 375. Longitudinal section of a peach, showing flesh, stone, and seed. The typical or true droop is of a single carpel, but not to multiply technical names, this name is extended to all such fruits when fleshy without and stony within, although of compound pistil, even to those having several or separable stones, such as the fruit of holly. These stones in such droops, or drupaceous fruits, are called perenne, or nucules, or simply nutlets of the droop. Of dry fruits, there are greater diversity of kinds having distinct names. The indehiscent sorts are commonly one-seeded. Figure 379. A keen of a buttercup. The same, divided lengthwise to show the contained seed. Figure 378. A keen of virgin's bower, retaining the feathered style, which aids in dissemination. The akin, or achenium, is a small, dry, and indehiscent one-seeded fruit, often so seed-like in appearance that it is popularly taken for the naked seed. The fruit of the buttercup, or crowfoot, is a good example. Its nature as a ripened pistil, in this case a simple carpel, is apparent by its bearing the remains of a style or stigma, or a scar from which this has fallen. It may retain the style and use it in various ways for dissemination. The fruit of compositae, though not of a single carpel, is also an achene. In this case, the pericarp is invested by an adherent calyx tube, the limb of which, when it has any, is called the pappus. This name was first given to the down like that of the thistle, but is applied to all forms under which the limb of the calyx of the compound flower appears. In lettuce, dandelion, and the like, the achenium as it matures, tapers upwards into a slender beak, like a stalk to the pappus. Figure 379. A keen of mayweed, no pappus. Figure 380. That of its succory, its pappus, a shallow cup. Figure 381. Of sunflower, pappus of two deciduous scales. Figure 382. Of sneezeweed, helenium, with its pappus of five scales. Figure 383 of sow thistle, with its pappus of delicate downy hairs. Figure 384, of the dandelion, its pappus raised on a long beak. A cremocarp, a name given to the fruit of umbelliferae, consists, as it were, of a pair of achenes, united completely in the blossom, but splitting apart when ripe into the two closed carpels. Each of these is a mericarp, or hemicarp, 
name seldom used. A utricle is the same as an akin, but with a thin and bladdery loose pericarp, like that of the goosefoot or pigweed. When ripe, it may burst open irregularly to discharge the seed, or it may open by a circular line all round, the upper part falling off like a lid, as in the amaranth. Figure 385. Fruit, cremocarp, of osmorrhiza. The two akin-like ripe carpels separating at maturity from a slender axis or carpophore. Figure 386. Utricle of the common pigweed, chenopodium album. Figure 387. Utricle, pyxis, of amaranth, opening all round, circumcisial. A caryopsis, or grain, is like an akin with the seed adhering to the thin pericarp throughout, so that fruit and seed are incorporated into one body, as in wheat, Indian corn, and other kinds of grain. A nut is a dry and indehiscent fruit, commonly one-celled and one-seeded, with a hard, crustaceous, or bony wall, such as the coconut, hazelnut, chestnut, and the acorn. Here the involucre, in the form of a cup at the base, is called the cupule. In the chestnut, the cupule forms the burr. In the hazel, a leafy husk. Figure 388. Nut, acorn, of the oak, with its cup, or cupule. A samara, or key fruit, is either a nut, or an akin, or any other indehiscent fruit, furnished with a wing, like that of ash and elm. The maple fruit is a pair of keys. Dehiscent fruits or pods are of two classes, vis a vis those of a simple pistil or carpel, and those of a compound pistil. Two common sorts of the first are named as follows. The follicle is a fruit of a simple carpel, which dehesces down one side only, i.e., by the inner or ventral suture. The fruits of marsh marigold, peony, larkspur, and milkweed are of this kind. Figure 389. Samara, or key of the white ash, winged at end. Figure 390. Samara of the American elm, winged all round. Figure 391. Pair of Samaras of sugar maple. Figure 392. Follicle of marsh marigold, Caltha palustris. Figure 393. Legume of a sweet pea, opened. Figure 394. Loment or jointed legume of a tick trefoil, desmodium. The legume or true pod, such as the pea pod and the fruit of the leguminous or pulse family generally, is one which opens along the dorsal as well as the ventral suture. The two pieces in which it splits are called valves. A loment is a legume which is constricted between the seeds and at length breaks up crosswise into distinct joints, as in figure 394. The pods or dehiscent fruits belonging to a compound ovary have several technical names, but they all may be regarded as kinds of the capsule, the dry and dehiscent fruit of any compound pistil. The capsule may discharge its seeds through chinks or pores, as in the poppy, or burst irregularly in some part, as in lobelia, and in the snapdragon, but commonly it splits open, or is dehiscent, lengthwise into regular pieces called valves. Figure 395. Capsule of iris, with loculicidal dehiscence, below, cut across. Figure 396. Pod of a marsh St. John's wort, with septicidal dehiscence. Regular dehiscence in a capsule takes place in two ways, which are best illustrated in pods of two or three cells. It is either loculicidal or splitting directly into the loculi or cells, that is, down the back or the dorsal suture of each cell or carpal, as in iris, or septicidal, that is, splitting through the partitions or septa, as in St. John's wort, rhododendron, etc., this divides the capsule into its component carpels, which then open by their ventral suture. Figure 397 and 398. Diagrams of the two modes. Figure 399. Diagram of a septifragal dehiscence of the loculicidal type. Figure 400. Same of the septicidal or marginicidal type. 
In loculicidal dehiscence, the valves naturally bear the partitions on their middle. In the septicidal, half the thickness of a partition is borne on the margin of each valve. See the annexed diagrams. A variation of either mode occurs when the valves break away from the partitions, these remaining attached in the axis of the fruit. This is called septifragal dehiscence. One form is seen in the morning glory. The capsules of rue, spurge, and some others are both loculicidal and septicidal, and so split into half carpellary valves or pieces. The salique is the technical name of the peculiar pod of the mustard family, which is two-celled by a false partition stretched across between two parietal placentae. It generally opens by two valves from below upward, and the placentae with the partition are left behind when the valves fall off. A silical, or pouch, is only a short and broad salique, like that of the shepherd's purse. Figure 401. Salique of a cadmine, or spring cress. Figure 402. Silical of shepherd's purse. Figure 403. Same, with one valve removed. Figure 404. Pyxis of purslane, the lid detaching. The pyxis is a pod which opens by a circular horizontal line, the upper part forming a lid, as in purslane, the plantain, henbane, etc. In these, the dehiscence extends all round, or is circumcisile. So it does in amaranth, forming a one-seated utricular pyxis. In Jeffersonia, the line does not quite separate quite round, but leaves a portion for a hinge to the lid. Of multiple or collective fruits, which are properly masses of fruits aggregated into one body, as seen in the mulberry, pineapple, etc., there are two kinds with special names and of peculiar structure. Figure 405, a fig fruit when young. Figure 406, same in section. Figure 407, magnified portion in slice showing some of the flowers. Figure 408, a mulberry. Figure 409, one of the grains younger, enlarged, seen to be a pistillate flower with calyx becoming fleshy. Figure 410, same with fleshy calyx cut across. The syconium, or fig fruit, is a fleshy access or summit of stem hollowed out and lined within by a multitude of minute flowers, the whole becoming pulpy and the common fig luscious. The strobile, or cone, is the peculiar multiple fruit of pines, cypresses, and the like, hence the name coniferae, vis-a-vis -vis cone-bearing plants. As already shown, these cones are open pistils, mostly in the form of flat scales, regularly overlying each other and pressed together in a spike or head. Each scale bears one or two naked seeds on its inner face. When ripe and dry, the scales turn back or diverge, and in the pine, the seed peels off and falls, generally carrying with it a wing, a part of the lining of the scale which facilitates the dispersion of the seeds by the wind. In arbor vitae, the scales of the small cone are few, but not very unlike the leaves. In cypress, they are very thick at the top and narrow at the base, so as to make a peculiar sort of closed cone. In juniper, and red cedar, the few scales of the very small cone become fleshy and ripen into a fruit which closely resembles a berry. Figure 411. Cone of a common pitch pine. Figure 412. Inside view of a separated scale or open carpel, one seed in place. Figure 413. The other seed. End of section 16. Recording by Corinne LePage. Section 17 of The Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray. Section 15. The Seed. Seeds are the final product of the flower, to which all its parts and offices are subservient. Like the ovule from which it originates, 
A seed consists of coats and kernels. The seed coats are commonly two, the outer and the inner. Figure 414 shows the two in a seed cut through lengthwise. The outer coat is often hard or crustaceous, whence it is called the testa, or shell of the seed. The inner is almost always thin and delicate. The shape and the markings so various in different seeds depend mostly on the outer coat. Sometimes this fits the kernel closely. Sometimes it is expanded into a wing, as in the trumpet creeper, and occasionally this wing is cut up into shreds or tufts, as in the catalpa. Or instead of a wing, it may bear a comma, or tuft of long and soft hairs, as in the milkweed or silkweed. The use of wings or downy tufts is to render the seeds buoyant for dispersion by the winds. This is clear not only from their evident adaptation to this purpose, but also from the fact that winged and tufted seeds are found only in fruits that split open at maturity, never in those that remain closed. The coat of some seeds is beset with long hairs or wool. Cotton, one of the most important vegetable products, since it forms the principal clothing of the larger part of the human race, consists of the long and woolly hairs which thickly cover the whole surface of the seed. There are also crests or other appendages of various sorts on certain seeds. A few seeds have an additional but more or less incomplete covering outside of the real seed coats called aril or aerolus. The loose and transparent bag which encloses the seed of the white water lily is of this kind. So is the mace of the nutmeg, and also the scarlet pulp around the seeds of the waxwork, Celastrus, and strawberry bush, Euonymus. The aril is a growth from the extremity of the seed stalk or from the placenta when there is no seed stalk. A short and thickish appendage at or close to the hilum in certain seeds is called a caruncle or strophiole. The various terms which define the position or direction of the ovule, erect, ascending, etc., apply equally to the seed. So also the terms anatropus, orthotropus, campylotropus, etc., as already defined, and such terms as hilum or scar left where the seed stalk or funiculus falls away, or where the seed was attached directly to the placenta when there is no seed stalk. Raphing, the line or ridge which runs from the hilum to the calaza in anthropus and amphitropus seeds. Calaza, the place where the seed coats and the kernel or nucleus are originally connected. At the hilum in orthotropus and campylotropus seeds, at the extremity of the raphe or tip of the seed in other kinds. Micropile answering to the foramen or orifice of the ovule. Compare the accompanying figures and those of the ovules. The kernel or nucleus is the whole body of the seed within the coats. In many seeds, the kernel is all embryo. In others, a large part of it is the albumen. The albumen or endosperm of the seed is sufficiently characterized and its office explained in section 3, 31 to 35. The embryo or germ, which is the rudimentary plantlet and final result of blossoming, and its development and germination have been extensively illustrated in sections 2 and 3. Its essential parts are the radical and the cotyledons. Its radical or colical, the former is the term long and generally used in botanical descriptions, but the latter is the more correct one, for it is the initial stem which merely gives origin to the root as to its position in the seed, always points to and lies near the micropile. In relation to the pericarp, it is superior when it points to the apex of the fruit or cell, and inferior when it points to its base or downward. The cotyledons have already been illustrated as respect their number, giving the important distinction of dicotyledonous, polycotyledonous, and monocotyledonous embryos also as regards their thickness, whether foliaceous or fleshy, and some of the very various shapes and adaptations to the seed have been figured. They may be straight or folded or rolled up. In the latter case, the cotyledons may be rolled up as it were from one margin, as in calicanthus, or from apex to base in a flat spiral, or they may be both folded, plicate, and rolled up convolute, as in sugar maple. In one very natural family, the cruciferi, 
two different modes prevail in the way the two cotyledons are brought around against the radical in one series they are accumbent that is the edges of the flat cotyledons lie against the radical in other they are incumbent or with the plane of the cotyledons brought up in the opposite direction so that the back of one of them lies against the radical as to the situation of the embryo with respect to the albumen of the seed when this is present in any quantity the embryo may be the axile that is occupying the axis or center either for most of its length as in violet barberry and pine and in these it is straight but it may be variously curved or coiled in the albumen as in helianthium in a potato seed or onion seed and linden or it may be coiled around the outside of the albumen partly or into a circle as in chickweed and mirabilis the latter mode prevails in campylotropous seeds in the cereal grains such as indian corn and rice and in all other grasses the embryo is straight and applied to the outside of the abundant albumen the matured seed with embryo ready to germinate and reproduce the kind completes the cycle of the vegetable life in a phanerogamous plant the account of which began with the seed and seedling End of section 17section 18 of the elements of botany this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by corinne lepage the elements of botany by asa gray section 16 vegetable life and work parts 1 to 4 the following simple outlines of the anatomy and physiology of plants are added to the preceding structural part for the better preparation of students in descriptive and systematic botany, also to give all learners some general idea of the life, growth, intimate structure, and action of the beings which compose so large a part of organic nature. Those who would extend and verify the facts and principles here outlined will use the physiological botany of the botanical textbook by Professor Goodale, or some similar book. 1. Anatomical Structure and Growth Growth is the increase of a living thing in size and substance. It appears so natural that plants and animals should grow that one rarely thinks of it as requiring explanation. It seems enough to say that a thing is so because it grew so, Growth from the seed, the germination and development of an embryo into a plantlet, and at length into a mature plant, as illustrated in sections 2 and 3, can be followed by ordinary observation, but the embryo is already a miniature plantlet, sometimes with hardly any visible distinction of parts, but often one which has already made very considerable growth in the seed. To investigate the formation and growth of the embryo itself requires well-trained eyes and hands, and the expert use of a good compound microscope, so this is beyond the reach of a beginner. Moreover, although observation may show that a seedling weighing only two or three grains may double its bulk and weight every week of its early growth, and may in time produce a huge amount of vegetable matter, it is still to be asked what this vegetable matter is where it came from, and by what means plants are able to increase and accumulate it, and build it up into the fabric of herbs and shrubs and lofty trees. Protoplasm. All this fabric was built up under life, but only a small portion of it is at any one time alive. As growth proceeds, life is passed on from the old to the new parts, much as it is passed on from parent to offspring, from generation to generation in unbroken continuity. Protoplasm is the common name of that plant stuff in which life essentially resides. All growth depends on it, for it has the peculiar power of growing and multiplying and building up a living structure, the animal no less than the vegetable structure, for it is essentially the same in both. Indeed, all the animal protoplasm comes primarily from the vegetable, which has the prerogative of producing it, 
and the protoplasm of plants furnishes all that portion of the food of animals which forms their flesh and living fabric. The very simplest plants, if such may specifically be called plants rather than animals, or one may say the simplest living things, are mere particles or pellets or threads, or even indefinite masses of protoplasm of vague form, which possesses powers of motion or of changing their shape, of imbibing water, air, and even other matters, and of assimilating these into plant stuff for their own growth and multiplication. Their growth is increase in substance by incorporation of that which they take in and assimilate. Their multiplication is by spontaneous division of their substance or body in two or more, each capable of continuing the process. The embryo of a phanerogamous plant at its beginning is essentially such a globule of protoplasm, which soon constricts itself into two or more such globules, which hold together inseparably in a row. Then the last of the row divides without separation in the two other planes to form a compound mass, each grain or globule of which goes on to double itself as it grows, and the definite shaping of this still increasing mass builds up the embryo into its form. Figures 433 to 436. Figures to illustrate the earlier stages in the formation of an embryo, a single mass of protoplasm dividing into two, three, and then into more incipient cells, which by continued multiplication build up an embryo. Cell walls. While this growth was going on, each grain of the forming structure formed and clothed itself with a coat, thin and transparent, of something different from the protoplasm, something which hardly and only transiently, if at all, partakes of the life and action. The protoplasm forms the living organism. The coat is a kind of protective covering or shell. The protoplasm, like the flesh of animals which it gives rise to, is composed of four chemical elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. The coating is of the nature of wood, is indeed that which makes wood, and has only the three elements, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, in its composition. Figure 437. Magnified view of some of a simple freshwater alga, the Tetraspora lubrica, each sphere of which may answer to an individual plant. Although the forming structure of an embryo in the fertilized ovule is very minute and difficult to see, there are many simple plants of lowest grade, abounding in pools of water, which more readily show the earlier stages or simplest stages of plant growth. One of these, which is common in early spring, requires only moderate magnifying power to bring to view what is shown in figure 437. In a slimy mass which holds all loosely together, little spheres of green vegetable matter are seen, assembled in fours, and these fours themselves in clusters of fours. A transient inspection shows what prolonged watching would confirm that each sphere divides first one plane, then in the other to make four, soon acquiring the size of the original, and so on, producing successive groups of fours. These pellets each form on their surface a transparent wall, like that just described. The delicate wall is for some time capable of expansive growth, but is from the first much firmer than the protoplasm within, through which the later imbibe surrounding moisture, which becomes a watery sap, occupying vacuities in the protoplasmic mass which enlarge or run together as the periphery increases and distends. When full grown, the protoplasm may become a mere lining to the wall, or some of it central as a nucleus, this usually connected with the wall lining by delicate threads of the same substance, so, when full-grown, the wall with its lining, a vesicle, containing liquid or some solid matters and in age mostly air, naturally came to be named a cell. But the name was suggested by, and first used for, cells in combination or built up into a fabric, much as a wall is built of bricks, that is, into a cellular structure or tissue. Suppose numerous cells like those of figure 437 to be heaped up like a pile of cannonballs, and as they grew to be compacted together while soft and yielding, they would flatten where they touched, and each sphere, being touched by twelve surrounding ones, would become twelve-sided. 
figure 438, would represent one of them. Suppose the contiguous faces to be united into one wall or partition between adjacent cavities, and a cellular structure would be formed, like that shown in figure 439. Roots, stems, leaves, and the whole of phanerogamous plants are a fabric of countless numbers of such cells. No such exact regularity in size and shape is ever actually found, but a nearly truthful magnified view of a small portion of a slice of the flower stalk of a calla lily shows a fairly corresponding structure, except that, owing to the great air spaces of the interior, the fabric may be likened rather to a stack of chimneys than to a solid fabric. In young and partly transparent parts, one may discern the cellular structure by looking down directly on the surface, as of a forming root. Figure 438. Diagram of a vegetable cell, such as it would be if, when spherical, it were equally pressed by similar surrounding cells in a heap. Figure 439. Ideal construction of cellular tissue so formed in section. Figure 440. Magnified view of a portion of a transverse slice of stem of a calla lily. The great spaces are turbular air channels built up by the cells. The substance of which cell walls are mainly composed is called cellulose. It is essentially the same in the stem of a delicate leaf or petal and in the wood of an oak, except that in the latter the walls are much thickened and the caliber small. The protoplasm of each living cell appears to be completely shut up and isolated in its shell of cellulose, but microscopic investigation has brought to view, in many cases, minute threads of protoplasm which here and there traverse the cell wall through minute pores, thus connecting the living portion of one cell with that of adjacent cells. Figure 441. Much magnified small portion of young root of a seedling maple, such as of figure 82, and 442, a few cells of same more magnified. The prolongations from the back of some of the cells are root hairs. The hairs of plants are cells formed on the surface, either elongated single cells, like the root hairs of figures 441 and 442, or a row of shorter cells. Cotton fibers are long and simple cells growing from the surface of the seed. The size of the cells of which common plants are made up varies from about the thirtieth to the thousandth of an inch in diameter. An ordinary size of short or roundish cells is from one three hundredth to one five hundredth of an inch, so that there may generally be from twenty-seven to one hundred and twenty-five millions of cells in the compass of a cubic inch. Some parts are built up as a compact structure, in others cells are arranged so as to build up regular air channels, as in the stems of aquatic and other water-loving plants, or to leave irregular spaces, as in the lower part of most leaves, where the cells only here and there come into close contact. Figure 443. Magnified section through the thickness of a leaf of Florida star anise. All such soft cellular tissue, like this of leaves, that of pith, and of the green bark is called parenchyma, while fibrous and woody parts are composed of presenchyma, that is, of peculiarly transformed, strengthening cells. Common cellular tissue, which makes up the whole structure of all very young plants, and the whole of mosses and other vegetables of the lowest grade, even when full-grown, is too tender or too brittle to give needful strength and toughness for plants which are to rise to any considerable height and support themselves. In these, needful strength is imparted, and the conveyance of sap through the plant is facilitated by the change, as they are formed, of some cells into thicker walled and tougher tubes, and by the running together of some of these, or the prolongation of others into hollow fibers or tubes of various size. Two sorts of such transformed cells go together and essentially form the wood. This is found in all common herbs, as well as in shrubs and trees, but the former have much less of it in proportion to the softer cellular tissue. It is formed very early in the growth of the root, stem, and leaves, traces of it appearing in large embryos even while yet in the seed. Those cells that lengthen 
and at the same time thicken their walls form the proper woody fiber or wood cells those of larger size and thinner walls which are thickened only in certain parts so as to have peculiar markings and which often are seen to be made up of a row of cylindrical cells with the partitions between absorbed or broken away are called ducts or sometimes vessels there are all gradations between wood cells and ducts and between both these and common cells but in most plants the three kinds are fairly distinct figure 444 magnified wood cells of the bark bast cells of basswood one and part of another figure 445 some wood cells from the wood and below part of a duct and 446 a detached wood cell of the same equally magnified figure 447 some wood cells of buttonwood platanus highly magnified a whole cell and lower end of another on the left a cell cut halfway lengthwise and half of another on the right some pores or pits a seen on the left while b b mark sections through these on the cut surface when living and young the protoplasm extends into these and by minuter perforations connects across them in age the pits become open passages facilitating the passage of sap and air the proper cellular tissue or parenchyma is the groundwork of root stem and leaves this is traversed chiefly lengthwise by the strengthening and conducting tissue wood cells and duct cells in the form of bundles or threads which in the stems and stalks of herbs are fewer and comparatively scattered but in shrubs and trees so numerous and crowded that in the stems and all permanent parts they make a solid mass of wood they extend into and ramify in the leaves spreading out in a horizontal plane as the framework of ribs and veins which support the softer cellular portion or parenchyma wood cells or woody fibers consist of tubes commonly between one and two thousandths but in pine wood sometimes two or three hundredths of an inch in diameter those from the tough bark of the basswood shown in figure 444 are only the fifteen hundredth of an inch wide those of buttonwood are larger and are here highly magnified besides the figures show the way wood cells are commonly put together namely with their tapering ends overlapping each other spliced together as it were thus giving more strength and toughness in hardwoods such as hickory and oak the walls of these tubes are very thick as well as dense while in softwoods such as white pine and basswood they are thinner wood cells in the bark are generally longer finer and tougher than those of proper wood and appear more like fibers for example figure 446 represents a cell of the wood of basswood of average length and figure 444 one and part of another of the fibrous bark both drawn to the same scale as these long cells form the principal part of fibrous bark or bast they are named bast cells or bast fibers these give the great toughness and flexibility to the inner bark of basswood i e bast wood and of leather wood and they furnish the invaluable fibers of flax and hemp the proper wood of their stems being tender brittle and destroyed by the processes which separate for the use of tough and slender bast cells in leather wood durka the bast cells are remarkably slender a view of one if magnified on the scale of figure 444 would be a foot and a half long figure 448 magnified bit of a pine shaving taken parallel with the silver grain figure 449 separate whole wood cell more magnified figure 450 same still more magnified both sections represented a discs in section b in face the wood cells of pines and more or less of all other coniferous trees have on two of their sides very peculiar disc-shaped markings by which that kind of wood is recognizable figure 451 and 452 a large and smaller dotted duct from grapevine ducts also called vessels are mostly larger than wood cells 
Indeed, some of them, as in red oak, have caliber large enough to be discerned on a cross-section by the naked eye. They make the visible porosity of such kinds of wood. This is particularly the case with dotted ducts, the surface of which appears as if riddled with round or oval pores. Such ducts are commonly made up of a row of large cells more or less confluent into a tube. Scalariform ducts, common in ferns and generally angled by mutual pressure in the bundles, have transversely elongated thin places, parallel with each other, giving a ladder-like appearance, whence the name. Annular ducts are marked with cross lines or rings, which are thickened portions of the cell wall. Figures 453 and 454. Spiral ducts which uncoil into a single thread. Figure 455. Spiral duct which tears up as a band. Figure 456. An annular duct, with variations above. Figure 457. Loose spiral duct passing into annular. Figure 458. Scalariform ducts of a fern, part of a bundle, prismatic by pressure. Figure 459. One torn into a band. Spiral ducts, or vessels, have thin walls, strengthened by a spiral fiber adherent within. This is as delicate and as strong as spider web. When uncoiled by pulling apart, it tears up and annihilates the cell wall. The uncoiled threads are seen by gently pulling apart many leaves, such as those of amaryllis or the stalks of a strawberry leaflet. Figure 460. Milk vessels of dandelion, with cells of the common cellular tissue. Figure 461. Others from the same older and garged with milky juice, all highly magnified. Laticiferous ducts, vessels of the latex, or milk vessels, are peculiar branching tubes which hold latex, or milky juice, in certain plants. It is very difficult to see them, and more so to make out their nature. They are peculiar in branching and inosculating, so as to make a network of tubes, running in among the cellular tissue, and they are very small, except when gorged and old. 2. Cell Contents the living contents of young and active cells are mainly protoplasm with water or watery sap, which this has imbibed. Old and effete cells are often empty of solid matter, containing only water with whatever may be dissolved in it, or air according to the time and circumstances. All the various products which plants in general elaborate, or which particular plants specially elaborate, out of the common food which they derive from the soil and the air, are contained in the cells, and in the cells they are produced. Sap is a general name for the principal liquid contents. Crude sap, for that which the plant takes in. Elaborated sap, for what has digested or assimilated. They must be undistinguishably mixed in the cells. Among the solid matters into which cells convert some of their elaborated sap, two are general and most important. These are chlorophyll and starch. Chlorophyll, meaning leaf green, is what gives the green color to herbage. It consists of soft grains of rather complex nature, partly wax-like, partly protoplasmic. These abound in the cells of all common leaves and the green rinds of plants, wherever exposed to light. The green color is seen through the transparent skin of the leaf and the walls of the containing cells. Chlorophyll is essential to ordinary assimilation in plants. By its means, under the influence of sunlight, the plant converts crude sap into vegetable matter. Far the largest part of all vegetable matter produced is that which goes to build up the plant's fabric or cellular structure, either directly or indirectly. There is no one good name for this most important product of vegetation. In its final state of cell walls, the permanent fabric of herb and shrub and tree, it is called cellulose. In its most soluble form, it is sugar, of one or another kind. In a less soluble form, it is dextrine, a kind of liquefied starch. In the form of solid grains stored up in the cells, it is starch. By a series of slight chemical changes, mainly a variation in the water entering into the composition, one of these forms is converted into another. Starch, 
farina or facula is the form in which this common plant material is as it were laid by for future use it consists of solid grains somewhat different in form in different plants in size varying from one three hundredth to one four thousandth of an inch partly translucent when wet and of a pearly luster from the concentric lines which commonly appear under the microscope the grains seem to be made up of layer over layer when loose they are commonly oval as in potato starch when much compacted the grains may become angular figure 462 some magnified starch grains in two cells of a potato figure 463 some cells of the albumen or flowery part of indian corn filled with starch grains the starch in a potato was produced in the foliage in the soluble form of dextrine or that of sugar it was conveyed through the cells of the herbage and stalks to a subterranean shoot and there stored up in the tuber when the potato sprouts the starch in the vicinity of developing buds or eyes is changed back again first into mucilaginous dextrine then into sugar dissolved in the sap and in this form it is made to flow to the growing parts where it is laid down into cellulose or cell wall figure 464 four cells from dried onion peel each holding a crystal of different shape one of them twinned figure 465 some cells from stock of rhubarb plant three containing chlorophyll two one torn across with raphides figure 466 raphides in a cell from arasema with small cells surrounding figure 467 prismatic crystals from the bark of hickory figure 468 glomerate crystal in a cell from beetroot figure 469 a few cells of locust bark a crystal in each figure 470 a detached cell with raphides being forced out as happens when put in water Besides these cell contents, which are in obvious and essential relation to nutrition, there are others the use of which is problematical. Of such, the commonest are crystals. These, when slender or needle-shaped, are called raphides. They are of inorganic matter, usually of oxalate or phosphate or sulfate of lime. Some, at least of the latter, may be direct crystallizations of what is taken and dissolved in the water absorbed, but others must be the result of some elaboration in the plant. Some plants have hardly any, others abound in them, especially in the foliage and bark. In locust bark, almost every cell holds a crystal, so that in a square inch not thicker than writing paper, there may be over a million and a half of them. When needle-shaped, raphides, as in stalks of calla lily, rhubarb, or four o'clock, they are usually packed in sheaf-like bundles. 3. Anatomy of Roots and Stems This is so nearly the same that an account of the internal structure of stems may serve for the root also. At the beginning, either in the embryo or in incipient shoot from a bud, the whole stem is of tender cellular tissue, or parenchyma, but wood, consisting of wood cells and ducts or vessels, begins to be formed in the earliest growth, and is from the first arranged in two ways, making two general kinds of wood. The difference is obvious even in herbs, but is more conspicuous in the enduring stems of shrubs and trees. On one or the other of these two types, the stems of all phanerogamous plants are constructed. In one, the wood is made up of separate threads, scattered here and there throughout the whole diameter of the stem. In the other, the wood is all collected to form a layer, in a slice across the stem appearing as a ring, between a central cellular part, which has none in it, the pith, and an outer cellular part, the bark. Figure 471. Diagram of structure of palm or yucca. Figure 472. Structure of a cornstalk in transverse and longitudinal section. Figure 473 same of a small palm stem the dots on the cross sections represent cut ends of the woody bundles or threads an asparagus shoot and a cornstalk for herbs 
and a rattan for a woody kind represent the first kind. To it belongs all plants with monocotyledonous embryo, a beanstalk, and the stem of any common shrub or tree represent the second, and to it belong all plants with dicotyledonous or polycotyledonous embryo. The first has been called, not very properly, endogenous, which means inside growing, the second, properly enough, exogenous, or outside growing. Endogenous stems, those of monocotyls, attain their greatest size and most characteristic development in palms and dragon trees, therefore chiefly in warm climates, although the palmetto and some yuccas become trees along the southern borders of the United States. In some stems, the woody bundles are more numerous and crowded towards the circumference, and so the harder wood is outside, while in an exogenous stem, the oldest and hardest wood is towards the center. An endogenous stem has no clear distinction of pith, bark, and wood. Concentrically arranged, no silver grain, no annual layers, no bark that peels off clean from the wood. Yet the old stems of yuccas and the like, that continue to increase in diameter, do form a sort of layers and a kind of scaly bark when old. Yuccas show well the curving of woody bundles, which below taper out and are lost at the rind. Figure 474. Short piece of stem of flax, magnified, showing the bark, wood, and pith in a cross-section. Exogenous stems. Those of dicotyls, or of plants coming from dicotyledonous and also polycotyledonous embryos, have a structure which is familiar in the wood of our ordinary trees and shrubs. It is the same in an herbaceous shoot, such as a flax stem, as in a maple stem of the first year's growth, except that the woody layer is commonly thinner or perhaps reduced to a circle of bundles. It was so in the tree stem at the beginning. The wood all forms in a cylinder, in cross-section or ring, around a central cellular part, dividing the cellular core within, the pith from a cellular bark without. As the wood bundles increase in number and in size, they press upon each other and become wedge-shaped in the cross-section, and they continue to grow from the outside, next to the bark, so that they become very thin wedges or plates. Between the plates or wedges are very thin plates, in cross-section lines, of much compressed cellular tissue, which connect the pith with the bark. The plan of a one-year-old woody stem of this kind is exhibited in the figures, which are essentially diagrams. Figure 475, diagram of a cross-section of a very young exogenous stem, showing six woody bundles or wedges. Figure 476, same later, with wedges increased to 12. Figure 477, still later, the wedges filling the space, separated only by the thin lines or medullary rays, running from pith to bark. When such a stem grows on from year to year, it adds annually a layer of wood outside the preceding one, between that and the bark. This is exogenous growth, or outside growing, as the name denotes. Figure 478. Piece of a stem of soft maple, of a year old, cut crosswise and lengthwise. Figure 479. A portion of the same, magnified. Figure 480. A small piece of the same, taken from one side, reaching from the bark to the pith, and highly magnified. A. A small bit of the pith. B. Spiral ducts of what is called the medullary sheath. C. The wood. D. D. Dotted ducts in the wood. E. E. Annular ducts. F. The liber, or the inner bark. G. The green bark. H. The corky layer. I. The skin, or epidermis. J. One of the medullary rays, or plates, of silver grain, seen on the cross-section. Some new bark is formed every year, as well as new wood, the former inside, as the latter is outside of that of the year preceding. The ring, or zone of tender forming tissue between the bark and the wood, has been called the cambium layer. Cambium is an old name of the physiologists for nutritive juice. And this thin layer is so gorged with rich nutritive sap when spring growth is renewed 
that the bark then seems to be loose from the wood and a layer of viscid sap or cambium to be poured out between the two but there is all the while a connection of the bark and wood by delicate cells rapidly multiplying and growing the bark of a year old stem consists of three parts more or less distinct namely beginning next the wood one the liber or fibrous bark the inner bark this contains some wood cells or their equivalent commonly in the form of bast or bast cells such as those of basswood or linden and among herbs those of flax and hemp which are spun and woven or made into cordage it also contains cells which are named sieve cells on account of numerous slits and pores in their walls by which the protoplasm of contiguous cells communicates in woody stems whenever a new layer of wood is formed some new liber or inner bark is also formed outside of it two the green bark or middle bark this consists of cellular tissue only and contains the same green matter chlorophyll as the leaves in woody stems before the season's growth is completed it becomes covered by the corky layer or outer bark the cells of which contain no chlorophyll and are the nature of cork common cork is the thick corky layer of the bark of the cork oak of spain it is this which gives to the stems or twigs of shrubs and trees the aspect and the color peculiar to each light gray in the ash purple in the red maple red in several dogwoods etc four the epidermis or skin of the plant consisting of a layer of thick-sided empty cells which may be considered to be the outermost layer or in most herbaceous stems the only layer of cork cells figure 481 magnified view of surface of a bit of young maple wood from which the bark has been torn away showing the wood cells and the bark ends of medullary rays figure 482 section in the opposite direction from bark on the left to beginning of pith on the right and a medullary ray extending from one to the other the green layer of bark seldom grows much after the first season sometimes the corky layer grows and forms new layers inside of the old for years as in the cork oak the sweet gum tree and the white and the paper birch but it all dies after a while and the continual enlargement of the wood within finally stretches it more than it can bear and sooner or later cracks and rends it while the weather acts powerfully upon its surface so the older bark perishes and falls away piecemeal year by year so on old trunks only the inner bark remains this is renewed every year from within and so kept alive while the older and outer layers die are fissured and rent by the distending trunk weathered and worn and thrown off in fragments in some trees slowly so that the bark of old trunks may acquire great thickness in others more rapidly in honeysuckles and grapevines the layers of liber loosen and die when only a year or two old the annual layers of liber are sometimes as distinct as those of the wood but often not so the wood of an exogenous trunk having the old growths covered by the new remains nearly unchanged in age, except from decay. Wherever there is an annual suspension and renewal of growth, as in temperate climates, the annual growths are more or less distinctly marked, in the form of concentric rings on the cross-section, so that the age of the tree may be known by counting them. Over 1,200 layers have been counted on the stumps of sequoias in California, and it is probable that some trees now living antedate the Christian era. The reason why the annual growths are distinguishable is that the wood formed at the beginning of the season is more or less different in the size or character of the cells from that of the close. In oak, chestnut, etc., the first wood of the season abounds in dotted ducts, the caliber of which is many times greater than that of the proper wood cells sapwood or alburnum is the newer wood living or recently alive and taking part in the conveyance of sap sooner or later each layer as it becomes more and more deeply covered by the newer ones and farther from the region of growth is converted into 
heartwood, or duramen. This is drier, harder, more solid, and much more durable as timber than sapwood. It is generally of a different color, and it exhibits in a different species the hue peculiar to each, such as reddish and red cedar, brown and black walnut, black and ebony, etc. The change of sapwood into heartwood results from the thickening of the walls of the wood cells by the deposition of hard matter, lining the tubes and diminishing their caliber, and by the deposition of a vegetable coloring matter peculiar to each species. The heartwood, being no longer a living part, may decay, and often does so, without the least injury to the tree, except by diminishing the strength of the trunk, and so rendering it more liable to be overthrown. The living parts of a tree of the exogenous kind are only these. First, the rootlets at one extremity, second, the buds and leaves of the season at the other, and third, a zone consisting of the newest wood and the newest bark connecting the rootlets with the buds or leaves, however widely separated these may be, in the tallest trees from two to four hundred feet apart. And these parts of the tree are all renewed every year. No wonder, therefore, that trees may live so long since they annually reproduce everything that is essential to their life and growth, and since only a very small part of their bulk is alive at once. The tree survives, but nothing now living has been so long. In it, as elsewhere, life is a transitory thing, ever abandoning the old and renewed in the young. 4. Anatomy of Leaves The wood in leaves is the framework of ribs, veins, and veinlets, serving not only to strengthen them, but also to bring in the sap and distribute it throughout every part. The cellular portion is the green pulp, and is nearly the same as the green layer of the bark, so that the leaf may properly enough be regarded as a sort of expansion of the fibrous and green layers of the bark. It has no proper corky layer, but the whole is covered by a transparent skin, or epidermis, resembling that of the stem. The cells of the leaf are of various forms, rarely so compact as to form a close cellular tissue, usually loosely arranged, at least in the lower part, so as to give copious intervening spaces or air passages, communicating throughout the whole interior. The green color is given by the chlorophyll, seen through the very transparent walls of the cell and through the translucent epidermis of the leaf. Figure 483. Magnified section of a leaf of white lily to exhibit the cellular structure both of upper and lower stratum, the air passages of the lower, and the epidermis or skin in section, also a little of that of the lower face, with some of its stomates. In ordinary leaves, having an upper and under surface, the green cells form two distinct strata of different arrangement. Those of the upper stratum are oblong, or cylindrical, and stand endwise to the surface of the leaf, usually close together, leaving hardly any vacant spaces, those of the lower are commonly irregular in shape, most of them with their longer diameter parallel to the face of the leaf, and are very loosely arranged, leaving many and wide air chambers. The green color of the lower is therefore diluted and paler than that of the upper face of the leaf. The upper part of the leaf is so constructed as to bear the direct action of the sunshine. The lower so as to afford freer circulation of air and to facilitate transpiration. It communicates more directly than the upper with the external air by means of stomates. The epidermis or skin of leaves and all young shoots is best seen in the foliage. It may be readily stripped off from the surface of a lily leaf, and still more so from more fleshy and soft leaves such as those of house leek. The epidermis is usually composed of a single layer, occasionally of two or three layers, of empty cells, mostly of irregular outline. The sinuous lines which traverse it, and may be discerned under low powers of the microscope, are the boundaries of the epidermal cells. Figure 484. Small portion of epidermis of the lower face of a white lily leaf with stomata. Figure 485. One of these more magnified, 
in the closed state. Figure 486, another stoma, open. Figure 487, small portion of epidermis of the garden balsam, highly magnified, showing very sinuous walled cells, and three stomata. Breathing pores, or stomates, stomata, singular a stoma, literally a mouth, are openings through the epidermis into the air chambers or intercellular passages, always between and guarded by a pair of thin-walled guardian cells. Although most abundant in leaves, especially on their lower face, that which is screened from direct sunlight, they are found on most other green parts. They establish a direct communication between the external air and that in the loose interior of the leaf. Their guardian cells, or lips, which are soft and delicate, like those of the green pulp within, by their greater or less turgidity, open or close the orifice as the moisture or dryness varies. In the white lily, the stomata are so remarkably large that they may be seen by a simple microscope of moderate power, and may be discerned even by a good hand lens. There are about 60,000 of them to the square inch of the epidermis of the lower face of this lily leaf, and only about 3,000 to the same space on the upper face. It is computed that the average leaf of an apple tree has on its lower face about 100,000 of these mouths. End of section 18. Recording by Corinne LePage. Section 19 of The Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corinne LePage. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray. Section 16. Vegetable Life and Work. Parts 5 to 6. 5. Plant Food and Assimilation. Only plants are capable of originating organizable matter, or the materials which compose the structure of vegetables and animals. The essential and peculiar work of plants is to take up portions of earth and air, water belonging to both, upon which animals cannot live at all, and to convert them into something organizable, that is, into something that, under life, may be built up into vegetable and animal structures. All the food of animals is produced by plants. Animals live upon vegetables directly or at second hand, the carnivorous upon the herbivorous, and vegetables live upon earth and air, immediately or at second hand. The food of plants, then, primarily, is earth and air. This is evident enough from the way in which they live. Many plants will flourish in pure sand or powdered chalk, or on the bare face of a rock or wall, watered merely with rain, and almost any plant may be made to grow from the seed in moist sand and increase its weight many times even if it will not come to perfection. Many naturally live suspended from branches of trees high in the air, and nourished by it alone, never having any connection with the soil, and some which naturally grow on the ground, like the live forever of the gardens, when pulled up by the roots and hung in the air will often flourish the whole summer long. It is true that fast-growing plants, or those which produce much vegetable matter in one season, especially in such concentrated form as to be useful as food for man or the higher animals, will come to maturity only in an enriched soil. But what is a rich soil? One which contains decomposing vegetable matter, or some decomposing animal matter that is, in either case, some decomposing organic matter formerly produced by plants. Aided by this, Grain-bearing and other important vegetables will grow more rapidly and vigorously and make a greater amount of nourishing matter than they could if left to do the whole work at once from the beginning. So that in these cases, also all the organic or organizable matter was made by plants and made out of earth and air, for the larger and most essential part was air and water. Two kinds of material are taken in and used by plants, of which the first, although more or less essential to the perfect plant growth, are in a certain sense subsidiary, if not accidental, vis-a-vis -vis earthy constituents. 
those which are left in the form of ashes when a leaf or stick of wood is burned in the open air. These consist of some potash or soda in a marine plant, some silex, the same as flint, and a little lime, alumine, or magnesia, iron or manganese, sulfur, phosphorus, etc. Some or all of these in variable and usually minute proportions. They are such materials as happen to be dissolved in small quantity in the water taken up by the roots, and when that is consumed by the plant, or flies off pure as it largely does by exhalation, the earthy matter is left behind in the cells, just as it is left encrusting the sides of a tea kettle in which much hard water has been boiled. Naturally, therefore, there is more earthy matter, i.e. more ashes, in the leaves than in any other part, sometimes as much as 7%, when the wood contains only 2% because it is through the leaves that most of the water escapes from the plant. Some of this earthy matter encrusts the cell walls, some goes to form crystals or raphides, which abound in many plants, some enters into certain special vegetable products, and some appears to be necessary into the well-being of higher orders of plants, although forming no necessary part of the proper vegetable structure. The essential constituents of the organic fabric are those which are dissipated into air and vapor in complete burning. They make up from 88 to 99 percent of the leaf or stem, and essentially the whole both of the cellulose of the walls and the protoplasm of the contents. Burning gives these materials of the plant's structure back to the air, mainly in the same condition in which the plant took them, the same condition which is reached more slowly in natural decay. The chemical elements of the cell walls, or cellulose, as also of starch, sugar, and all that class of organizable cell material, are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The same, with nitrogen, are the constituents of protoplasm, or the truly vital part of vegetation. These chemical elements, out of which organic matters are composed, are supplied to the plant by water, carbonic acid, and some combinations of nitrogen. Water, far more largely than anything else, is imbibed by the roots, also more or less by the foliage in the form of vapor. Water consists of oxygen and hydrogen, and cellulose, or plant wall, starch, sugar, etc., however different in their qualities, agree in containing these two elements in the same relative proportions as in water. Carbonic acid gas, carbon dioxide, is one of the components of the atmosphere. A small one, ordinarily only about one twenty-five hundredth of its bulk, sufficient for the supply of vegetation, but not enough to be injurious to animals, as it would be if accumulated. Every current or breeze of air brings to the leaves expanded in it a succession of fresh atoms of carbonic acid, which it absorbs through its multitudinous breathing pores. This gas is also taken up by water. So it is brought to the ground by rain and it is absorbed by the roots of the plants, either as dissolved in the water they imbibe, or in the form of gas in the interstices of the soil. Manured ground, that is, soil containing decomposing vegetable or animal matters, is constantly giving out this gas into the interstices of the soil, whence the roots of the growing crop absorb it. Carbonic acid thus supplied, primarily from the air, is the source of the carbon which forms much the largest part of the substance of every plant. The proportion of carbon may be roughly estimated by charring some wood or foliage, that is, by heating it out of contact with the air, so as to decompose and drive off all the other constituents of the fabric, leaving the large bulk of charcoal or carbon behind. Nitrogen, the remaining plant element, is a gas which makes up more than two-thirds of the atmosphere, is brought into the foliage and also to the roots, being moderately soluble in water, in the same ways as is carbonic acid. The nitrogen, which, mixed with oxygen, a little carbonic acid and vapor of water, constitutes the air we breathe, is the source of this fourth plant element. But it is very doubtful if ordinary plants can use any nitrogen gas directly as food, that is, if they can directly cause it to combine with the other elements so as to form protoplasm. 
but when combined with hydrogen, forming ammonia, or when combined with oxygen, nitric acid and nitrates, plants appropriate it with avidity, and several natural processes are going on in which nitrogen of the air is also combined and supplied to the soil in forms directly available to the plant. The most efficient is nitrification, the formation of nitre, nitrate of potash, in the soil, especially in all fertile soils, through the action of a bacterial ferment. Assimilation in plants is the conversion of these inorganic substances, essentially water, carbonic acid, and some form of combined or combinable nitrogen, into vegetable matter. This most dilute food the living plant concentrates and assimilates to itself. Only plants are capable of converting these mineral into organizable matters, and this all-important work is done by them, so far as all ordinary vegetation is concerned, only under the light of the sun, acting upon green parts or foliage, that is, upon chlorophyll, or upon what answers to chlorophyll, which these parts contain. The sun, in some way, supplies a power which enables the living plant to originate these peculiar chemical combinations, to organize matter into forms which are alone capable of being endowed with life. The proof of this proposition is simple, and it shows at the same time, in the simplest way, what a plant does with water and carbonic acid it consumes. Namely, first, it is only in sunshine or bright daylight that the green parts of plants give out oxygen gas, then they regularly do so, and second, the giving out of this oxygen gas is required to render the chemical composition of water and carbonic acid the same as that of cellulose, that is, of the plant's permanent fabric. This shows why plants spread out so large a surface of foliage. Leaves are so many workshops, full of machinery worked by sun power, the emission of oxygen gas from any sunlit foliage is seen by placing some of this under water, or by using an aquatic plant, by collecting the air bubbles which rise, and by noting that a taper burns brighter in this air. Or a leafy plant in a glass globe may be supplied with a certain small percentage of carbonic acid gas, and after proper exposure to sunshine, the air on being tested will be found to contain less carbonic acid and just so much the more oxygen gas. Now if the plant is making cellulose or any equivalent substance, that is, is making the very materials of its fabric and growth, as must generally be the case, all this oxygen gas given off by the leaves comes from the decomposition of carbonic acid taken in by the plant. For cellulose, and also starch, dextrine, sugar, and the like, are composed of carbon along with oxygen and hydrogen in just the proportions to form water. And the carbonic acid and water taken in, less the oxygen, which the carbon brought with it as carbonic acid, and which is given off from the foliage in sunshine, just represents the manufactured article, cellulose. It comes to the same if the first product of assimilation is sugar, or dextrine, which is a sort of soluble starch, or starch itself, and in the plant all these forms are readily changed into one another. In the tiny seedling, as fast as this assimilated matter is formed, it is used in growth, that is, in the formation of cell walls. After a time, some or much of the product may be accumulated in store for future growth, as in the root of the turnip, or the tuber of the potato, or the seed of corn or pulse. This store is mainly in the form of starch. When growth begins anew, this starch is turned into dextrine, or into sugar, in liquid form, and used to nourish and build up the germinating embryo or the new shoot, where it is at length converted into cellulose and used to build up plant structure. But that which builds plant fabric is not the cellular structure itself. The work is done by the living protoplasm which dwells within the walls. This also has to take and to assimilate its proper food for its own maintenance and growth. Protoplasm assimilates, along with the other three elements, the nitrogen of the plant's food. 
This comes primarily from the vast stock in the atmosphere, but mainly through the earth, where it is accumulated through various processes in a fertile soil, mainly so far as concerns crops from the decomposition of former vegetables and animals. This protoplasm, which is formed at the same time as the simpler cellulose, is essentially the same as the flesh of animals and the source of it. It is the common basis of vegetable and animal life. So, plant assimilation produces all the food and fabric of animals. Starch, sugar, the oils, which are, as it were, these farinaceous matters more deoxidated, chlorophyll and the like, and even cellulose itself, form the food of herbivorous animals and much of the food of man. When digested, they enter into the blood, undergo various transformations, and are at length decomposed into carbonic acid and water, and exhaled from the lungs in respiration, in other words, are given back to the air by the animal as the very same materials which the plant took from the air as its food, are given back to the air in the same form that they would have taken if the vegetable matter had been left to decay where it grew, or if it had been set on fire and burned, and with the same result, too, as to the heat, the heat in this case producing and maintaining the proper temperature of the animal. The protoplasm and other products containing nitrogen, gluten, legumine, etc., and which are most accumulated in grains and seeds for the nourishment of their embryos when they germinate, compose the most nutritious vegetable food consumed by animals. They form their proper flesh and sinews, while the earthy constituents of the plant form the earthy matter of the bones, etc. At length decomposed, in the secretions and exertions, these nitrogenous constituents are through successive changes finally resolved into mineral matter, into carbonic acid, water, and ammonia, or some nitrates, into exactly are essentially the same materials which the plants took up and assimilated. Animals depend on vegetables absolutely and directly for their subsistence, also indirectly because plants purify the air for animals. In the very process by which they create food, they take from the air carbonic acid gas, injurious to animals' respiration, which is continually poured into it by the breathing of all animals, by all decay, by the burning of fuel, and all other ordinary combustion, and they restore an equal bulk of life-sustaining oxygen needful for the respiration of animals, needful also in a certain measure for plants in any work they do, for in plants as well as in animals work is done at a certain cost. 6. Plant Work and Movement as the organic basis and truly living material of plants is identical with that of animals, so is the life at bottom essentially the same. But in animals, something is added at every rise from the lowest to the highest organisms. Action and work in living beings require movement. Living things move. Those not living are only moved. Plants move as truly as do animals. The latter, nourished as they are upon organized food, which has been prepared for them by plants and is found only here and there, must needs have the power of going after it, of collecting it, or at least of taking it in, which requires them to make spontaneous movements. But ordinary plants, with their widespread surface, always in contact with the earth and air on which they feed, the latter everywhere the same, and the former very much so, might be thought to have no need of movement. Ordinary plants, indeed, have no locomotion. Some float, but most are rooted to the spot where they grew. Yet probably all of them execute various movements which must be as truly self-caused as are those of the lower grades of animals, movements which are overlooked only because too slow to be directly observed. Nevertheless, the motion of the hour hand and of the minute hand of a watch is not less real than that of the second hand. Figure 488. Two individuals of an oscillaria magnified. Locomotion. Moreover, many microscopic plants living in water are seen to move freely, if not briskly, under the microscope, and so likewise do more conspicuous aquatic plants in their embryo-like or seedling state. Even at maturity, species of oscillaria, such as in figures 488, 
minute worm-shaped plants of fresh waters, taking this name from their oscillating motions, freely execute three different kinds of movement, the very delicate investing coat of cellulose not impeding the action of the living protoplasm within. Even when this coat is firmer and hardened with a siliceous deposit, such crescent-shaped or boat-shaped one-celled plants as Clostarium or Nericula are able, in some way, to move along from place to place in the water. Figure 489. A few cells of a leaf of Niaeus flexilis, highly magnified, the arrows indicate the courses of the circulating currents. Movements in cells or cell circulation, sometimes called cyclosis, has been detected in so many plants, especially in comparatively transparent aquatic plants and in hairs on the surface of land plants, where it is easiest to observe, that it may be inferred to take place in all cells during the most active part of their life. This motion is commonly a streaming movement of threads of protoplasm, carrying along solid granules by which the action may be observed and the rate measured, or in some cases, it is a rotation of the whole protoplasmic contents of the cell. A comparatively low magnifying power will show it in the cells of Nitella and Chara, which are cryptogamous plants, and under a moderate power it is well seen in the tape grass of fresh water, Valisneria, and in Niaeus flexilis. Minute particles and larger greenish globules are seen to be carried along, as if in a current, around the cell, passing up one side, across the end, down the other, and across the bottom, completing the circuit sometimes within a minute or less when well warmed. To see it well in the cell, which, like a string of beads, form the hairs on the stamens of spiderwort, a high magnifying power is needed. Transference of liquid from cell to cell, and so from place to place in the plant, the absorption of water by the rootless, and the exhalation of the greater part of it from the foliage, these and similar operations are governed by the physical laws which regulate the diffusion of fluids, but are controlled by the action of living protoplasm. Equally, under vital control, are the various chemical transformations which attend assimilation and growth, and which involve not only molecular movements, but conveyance. Growth itself, which is the formation and shaping of new parts, implies the direction of internal activities to definite ends. Movements of organs. The living protoplasm, in all but the lowest grade of plants, is enclosed and to common appearance isolated in separate cells, the walls of which can only in their earliest state be said to be alive. Still plants are able to cause the protoplasm of adjacent cells to act in concert and by their combined action to affect movements in roots, stems, or leaves, some of them very slow and gradual, some manifest and striking. Such movements are brought about through individually minute changes in the form or tension in the protoplasm of the innumerable cells which make up the structure of the organ. Some of the slower movements are affected during growth and may be explained by inequality of growth on the two sides of the bending organ. But the more rapid changes of position, and some of the slow ones, cannot be so explained. Root Movements In its growth, a root turns or bends away from the light and towards the center of the earth, so that in lengthening it bears itself in the soil where it is to live and act. Every one must have observed this in the germination of seeds. Careful observations have shown that the tip of a growing root also makes little sweeps or short movements from side to side. By this means it more readily insinuates itself into yielding portions of the soil. The root tips will also turn towards moisture and so secure the most favorable positions in the soil. Stem Movements the root end of the collicle, or first joint of the stem, that below the cotyledons, acts like the root, in turning downward in germination, making a complete bend to do so if it happens to point upward as the seed lies on the ground, while the other end turns or points skyward. These opposite positions are taken in complete darkness as readily as in the light, in dryness as much as in moisture. Therefore, so far as these movements are physical, the two portions of the same internode appear to be oppositely affected by gravitation or other influences. 
Rising into the air, the stem and green shoots generally, while young and pliable, bend or direct themselves toward the light, or toward the stronger light when unequally illuminated, while roots turn towards the darkness. Many growing stems have also a movement in nutation, that is, of nodding successively in different directions. This is brought about by a temporary increase of turgidity of the cells along one side, thus bowing the stem over to the opposite side, and this line of turgescence travels round the shoot continually, from right to left, or from left to right, according to the species. Thus the shoot bends to all points of the compass in succession. Commonly, this nutation is slight or hardly observable. It is most marked in twining stems. The growing upper end of such stems, as is familiar in the hop, pole beans, and morning glory, turns over in an inclined or horizontal direction, thus stretching out to reach a neighboring support, and by the continual change in the direction of the nodding, sweeps the whole circle, and sweeps being the longer as the stem lengthens. When it strikes against a support, such as a stem or branch of a neighboring plant, the motion is arrested at the contact, but continues at the growing apex beyond, and this apex is thus made to wind spirally around the supporting body. Leaf movements are all but universal. The presentation by most leaves of their upper surface to the light, from whatever direction that may come, is an instance, for when they turn upside down, they twist or bend around the stalk to recover this normal position. Leaves, and the leaflets of compound leaves, change this position at nightfall, or when the light is withdrawn. They then take what is called their sleeping posture, resuming the diurnal position when daylight returns. This is very striking in locust trees, in the sensitive plant, and the wood sorrel. Young seedlings droop or close their leaves at night in plants which are not thus affected in the adult foliage. All this is thought to be a protection against the cold by nocturnal radiation. Various plants climb by a coiling movement of their leaves or their leaf stalks. Familiar examples are seen in Clematis, Morandia, Tropielum, and in Solanum, which is much cultivated in greenhouses. In the latter, and in other woody plants which climb in this way, the petioles thicken and harden after they have grasped their support, thus securing a very firm hold. Tendril Movements Tendrils are either leaves or stems, specially developed for climbing purposes. Cobea is a good example of partial transformation. Some of the leaflets are normal, some of the same leaf are little tendrils, and some intermediate in character. The passion flowers give good examples of simple stem tendrils. Grapevines of branched ones. Most tendrils make revolving sweeps, like those of twining stems. Those of some passion flowers in sultry weather are apt to move fast enough for the movement actually to be seen for a part of the circuit, as plainly as that of the second-hand watch. Two herbaceous species, Passiflora gracilis and P. sequoides, the first an annual, the second a strong-rooted perennial of the easiest cultivation, are admirable for illustration both of revolving movements and of sensitive coiling. Figure 490. Piece of stem of sensitive plant, Mimosa peduca, with two leaves, the lower open, the upper in the closed state. Movements under irritation. The most familiar case is that of the sensitive plant. The leaves suddenly take their nocturnal position when roughly touched or when shocked by a jar. The leaflets close in pairs, the four outspread in partial petioles come closer together and the common petiole is depressed. The seat of the movements is at the base of the leaf stalk and stalklets. Shronchia, a near relative of the sensitive plant, acts in the same way, but is slower. These are not anomalous actions, but only extreme manifestations of a faculty more or less common in foliage. In locust and honey locust, for example, Repeated jars will slowly produce similar effects. Leaf stalks and tendrils are adapted to their uses in climbing by a similar sensitiveness. 
the coiling of the leaf stalk is in response to a kind of irritation produced by contact with the supporting body this may be shown by gentle rubbing or prolonged pressure upon the upper face of the leaf stalk which is soon followed by a curvature tendrils are still more sensitive to the contact or light friction this causes the free end of the tendril to coil around the support and the sensitiveness propagated downward along the tendril causes that side of it to become less turgescent or the opposite side more so thus throwing the tendril into coils this shortening draws the plant up to the support tendrils which have not laid hold will at length commonly coil spontaneously in a simple coil from the free apex downward in Sicyos, echinocytus and the above mentioned passion flowers the tendril is so sensitive under a higher summer temperature that it will curve and coil promptly after one or two light strokes by the hand. Figure 491. Portion of stem and leaves of the telegraph plant. Desmodium gyrans. Almost of natural size. Among spontaneous movements, the most singular are those of Desmodium gyrans of India, sometimes called telegraph plant, which is cultivated on account of its action. Of its three leaflets, the larger, terminal one, moves only by drooping at nightfall and rising with the dawn, but its two small lateral leaflets, when in a congenial high temperature, by day and night move upward and downward in a succession of jerks, stopping occasionally as if to recover from exhaustion. In most plant movements, some obviously useful purpose is subserved, this of Desmodium gyrans, is a riddle. Movement in flowers are very various. The most remarkable are in some way connected with fertilization. Some occur under irritation. The stamens of barberry start forward when touched at the base inside. Those of many polyandrous flowers, of sparmenia very strikingly, spread outwardly when lightly brushed. The two lips or lobes of the stigma in mimulus close after a touch. Some are automatic and are connected with dichogamy. The style of sabbatia and of large-flowered species of epilobium bends over strongly to one side or turns downward when the blossom opens, but slowly erects itself a day or two later. Extraordinary Movements Connected with Capture of Insects The most striking cases are those of Drosera and Dionea, for an account of which see how plants behave and Goodale's Physiological Botany. The upper face of leaves and of common species of Drosera, or sundew, is beset with stout bristles, having a glandular tip. This tip secretes a drop of a clear but very viscid liquid, which glistens like a dewdrop in the sun, whence the popular name. When a fly or other small insect attracted by the liquid alights itself upon the leaf, the viscid drops are so tenacious that they hold it fast. In struggling, it only becomes more completely entangled. Now the neighboring bristles, which have not been touched, slowly bend inward from all sides toward the captured insect and bring their sticky apex upon its body, thus increasing the number of bonds. Moreover, the blade of the leaf commonly aids in the capture by becoming concave, its sides or edges turning inward, which brings still more of the gland-tipped bristles into contact with the captive's body. The insect perishes. The clear liquid disappears, apparently by absorption into the tissue of the leaf. It is thought that the absorbed secretion takes with it some of the juices of the insect or the products of its decomposition. Figure 492 Plant of Dionea muscipula, or Venus's fly trap, reduced in size. Dionea muscipula, the most remarkable vegetable fly trap, is related to the sundews and has a more special and active apparatus for fly catching. Formed of the summit of the leaf, the two halves of this rounded body move as if they were hinged upon the midrib. Their edges are fringed with spiny but not glandular bristles, which interlock when the organ closes. Upon the face are two or three short and delicate bristles, which are sensitive. They do not themselves move when touched, 
but they propagate the sensitiveness to the organ itself, causing it to close with a quick movement. In a fresh and vigorous leaf, under a high summer temperature, and when the trap lies widely open, a touch of any one of the minute bristles on the face, by the finger or any extraneous body, springs the trap, so to say, and it closes suddenly, but after an hour or so it opens again. When a fly or other small insect alights on the trap, it closes in the same manner, and so quickly that the intercrossing marginal bristles obstruct the egress of the insect, unless it be a small one and not worth taking. Afterwards, and more slowly, it completely closes and presses down upon the prey. Then some hidden glands pour out a glary liquid, which dissolves out the juices of the insect's body. Next, all is reabsorbed into the plant, and the trap opens to repeat the operation. But the same leaf, perhaps, never captures more than two or three insects. It ages instead, becomes more rigid and motionless, or decays away. That some few plants should thus take animal food will appear less surprising when it is considered that hosts of plants of the lower grade, known as fungi, molds, rusts, ferments, bacteria, etc., live upon animal or other organized matter, either decaying or living. That plants should execute movements in order to accomplish the ends of their existence is less surprising now when it is known that the living substance of plants and animals is essentially the same. That the beings of both kingdoms partake of a common life, to which, as they rise in the scale, other and higher endowments are successively superadded. Work uses up material and energy in plants as well as in animals. The latter live and work by the consumption and decomposition of that which plants have assimilated into organizable matter through an energy derived from the sun, and which is, so to say, stored up in the assimilated products. In every internal action, as well as in every movement and exertion, some portion of this assimilated matter is transformed and of its stored energy expended. The steam engine is an organism for converting the sun's radiant energy, stored up by plants in the fuel, into mechanical work. An animal is an engine fed by vegetable fuel in the same or other forms from the same source, by the decomposition of which it also does mechanical work. The plant is the producer of food and accumulator of solar energy or force. But the plant, like the animal, is a consumer whenever and by so much as it does any work except its great work of assimilation. Every internal change and movement, every transformation, such as that of starch into sugar and of sugar into cell walls, as well as every movement of parts which becomes extremely visible, is done at the expanse of a certain amount of its assimilated matter and of its stored energy, that is, by the decomposition or combustion of sugar or some such product into carbonic acid and water, which is given back to the air, just as in the animal it is given back to the air in respiration. So the respiration of plants is as real and as essential as that of animals. But what plants consume or decompose in their life and action is of insignificant amount in comparison with what they compose. End of section 19. Recording by Corinne LePage. Section 20 of The Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray. Section 20. Cryptogamous or Flowerless Plants. Even the beginner in botany should have some general idea of what cryptogamous plants are, and what are the obvious distinctions of the principal families. Although the lower grades are difficult and need special books and good microscopes for their study, the higher orders, such as ferns, may be determined almost as readily as phanerogamous plants. Linnaeus gave to this lower grade of plants the name of cryptogamia, thereby indicating that their organs answering to stamens and pistils, if they had any, were recondite and unknown 
there is no valid reason why this long familiar name should not be kept up along with the counterpart one of phanerogamia although organs analogous to stamens and pistil or rather to pollen and ovule have been discovered in all the higher and most of the lower grades of this series of plants so also the english synonymous name of flowerless plants is both good and convenient for they have not flowers in the proper sense the essentials of flowers are stamens and pistils giving rise to seeds and the essential of a seed is an embryo cryptogamous or flowerless plants are propagated by spores and a spore is not an embryo plantlet but mostly a single plant cell vascular cryptogams which compose the higher orders of this series of plants have stems and usually leaves constructed upon the general plan of ordinary plants that is they have wood wood cells and vessels in the stem and leaves in the latter as a framework of veins but the lower grades having only the more elementary cellular structure are called cellular cryptogams far the larger number of the former are ferns wherefore that class has been called pteridophyta pteridophytes in english form meaning fern plants that is ferns and their relatives they are mainly horsetails ferns club mosses and various aquatics which have been called hydroterides i e water ferns horsetails equisitaceae is the name of a family which consists only among now living plants of equisetum the botanical name of horsetail and scouring rush they have hollow stems with partitions at the nodes the leaves consist only of a whirl of scales at each node these coalescent into a sheath from the axils of these leaf scales in many species branches grow out which are similar to the stem but on a much smaller scale close jointed and with the tips of the leaves more apparent at the apex of the stem appears the fructification as it is called for lack of a better term in the form of a short spike or head this consists of a good number of stalked shields bearing on their inner or under face several wedge-shaped spore cases the spore cases when they ripen open down the inner side and discharge a great number of green spores of a size large enough to be well seen by a hand glass the spores are aided in their discharge and dissemination by four club-shaped threads attached to one part of them these are hygrometric when moist they are rolled up over the spore when dry they straighten and exhibit lively movements closing over the spore when breathed upon and unrolling promptly a moment after as they dry see figures four hundred and ninety three to four hundred and ninety eight illustration figure four nine three upper part of a stem of a horsetail equisetum sylvaticum four nine four part of the head or spike of spore cases with some of the latter taken off four nine five view more enlarged of underside of the shield-shaped body bearing a circle of spore cases four nine six one of the latter detached and more magnified four nine seven a spore with the attached arms moistened four nine eight same when dry the arms extended illustration figure four nine nine a tree fern dixonia arborescens with a young one near its base in front a common herbaceous fern polypodium vulgare with its creeping stem or rootstock illustration figure five hundred a section of the trunk of a tree fern ferns or filices a most attractive family of plants are very numerous and varied in warm and equable climates some rise into forest trees with habit of palms but most of them are perennial herbs the wood of a fern trunk is very different however from that of a palm or of any exogenous stem either a section is represented in figure five hundred the curved plates of wood each terminate upward in a leaf stalk the subterranean trunk or stem of any strong growing herbaceous fern shows a similar structure most ferns are circinate in the bud that is are rolled up in the manner shown in figure one nine seven uncoiling as they grow they have some likeness to a crozier illustration figure five o one the walking fern camptosaurus reduced in size showing its fruit dots on the veins approximated in pairs five o two a small piece pinule of a shield fern 
a row of fruit dots on each side of the midrib, each covered by its kidney-shaped inducium. 503. A spore case from the latter, just bursting by the partial straightening of the incomplete ring, well magnified. 504. Three of the spores of 509, more magnified. 505. Schizia pusilla, a very small and simple-leaved fern, drawn nearly of natural size. 506. One of the lobes of its fruit-bearing portion, magnified, bearing two rows of spore cases. 507. Spore case of the latter, detached, opening lengthwise. 508. Adder tongue, ophioglossum, spore cases in a kind of spike. A. A portion of the fruiting part, about natural size, showing two rows of the firm spore cases, which open transversely into two valves. The fructification of ferns is born on the back or under side of the leaves. The early botanists thought this such a peculiarity that they always called a fern leaf a frond and its petiole a stipe. Usage continues these terms, although they are superfluous. The fruit of ferns consists of spore cases, technically sporangia, which grow out of the veins of the leaf. Sometimes these are distributed over the whole lower surface of the leaf or frond, or over the whole surface, when there are no proper leaf blades to the frond, but all is reduced to stalks. Commonly the spore cases occupy only detached spots or lines, each of which is called a sorus, or in English merely a fruit dot. In many ferns these fruit dots are naked. In others they are produced under a scale-like bit of membrane called an inducium. In maidenhair ferns a little lobe of the leaf is folded back over each fruit dot to serve as its shield or inducium. In the true break or bracken terrace, the whole edge of the fruit-bearing part of the leaf is folded back over it like a hem. The form and structure of the spore cases can be made out with a common hand magnifying glass. The commonest kind, shown in figure 503, has a stalk formed of a row of jointed cells, and is itself composed of a layer of thin-walled cells, but is incompletely surrounded by a border of thicker-walled cells, forming the ring. This extends from the stalk up one side of the spore case, round its summit, descends on the other side, but there gradually vanishes. In ripening and drying, the shrinking of the cells of the ring on the outer side causes it to straighten. In doing so, it tears the spore case open on the weaker side, and discharges the minute spores that fill it, commonly with a jerk which scatters them to the wind. Another kind of spore case, figure 507, is stalkless, and has its ring cells forming a kind of cap at the top. At maturity it splits from top to bottom by a regular dehiscence. A third kind is of firm texture and opens across into two valves, like a clamshell, figure 508a. This kind makes an approach to the next family. Illustration, figure 509, a young prothallus of a maidenhair, moderately enlarged, and an older one with the first fern leaf developed from near the notch, 510 middle portion of the young one, much magnified, showing below, partly among the rootlets, the antheridia, or fertilizing organs, and above, near the notch, three pistillidia to be fertilized. The spores germinate on moistened ground. In a conservatory they may be found germinating on a damp wall, or on the edges of a well-watered flower-pot. Instead of directly forming a fern plantlet, the spore grows first into a body which closely resembles a small liverwort. This is named a prothallus, figure 509. From some point of this a bud appears to originate, which produces the first fern leaf, soon followed by a second and third, and so the stem and leaves of the plant are set up. Illustration, figure 511, Lycopodium carolinianum, of nearly natural size. 512, inside view of one of the bracts, and spore case, magnified. Illustration, figure 513, open four-valved spore case of a selaginella, and its four large spores, macrospores, magnified. 514, macrospores of another selaginella. 515, same, separated. Illustration, figure 516, plant of isoetes, 517. Base of a leaf and contained sporocarp filled with microspores, cut across, magnified. 
518, same, divided lengthwise, equally magnified. Some microspores seen at the left. 519, section of a spore case containing macrospores, equally magnified. At the right, three macrospores, more magnified. Investigation of this prothallus under the microscope resulted in the discovery of a wholly unsuspected kind of fertilization taking place at this germinating stage of the plant. On the underside of the prothallus, two kinds of organs appear, figure 510. One may be likened to an open and depressed ovule, with a single cell at bottom answering to nucleus, the other to an anther, but instead of pollen, it discharges corkscrew-shaped microscopic filaments, which bear some cilia of extreme tenuity, by the rapid vibration of which the filaments move freely over a wet surface. These filaments travel over the surface of the prothallus, and even to other prothalli, for there are natural hybrid ferns, reach and enter the ovule-like cavities, and fertilize the cell. This thereupon sets up a growth, forms a vegetable bud, and so develops the new plant. An essentially similar process of fertilization has been discovered in the preceding and the following families of pteridophytes, but it is mostly subterranean and very difficult to observe. Club mosses or lycopodiums. Some of the common kinds, called ground pine, are familiar, being largely used for Christmas wreaths and other decoration. They are low evergreens, some creeping, all with considerable wood in their stems this thickly beset with small leaves. In the axils of some of these leaves, or more commonly in the axils of peculiar leaves changed into bracts, as in figures 511-512, spore cases appear as roundish or kidney-shaped bodies of firm texture opening round the top into two valves and discharging a great quantity of a very fine yellow powder, the spores. The selaginellas have been separated from lycopodium which they much resemble, because they produce two kinds of spores in separate spore cases. One kind, microspores, is just that of lycopodium. The other consists of only four large spores, macrospores, in a spore case which usually breaks in pieces at maturity. Figures 513 to 515. The quillworts, isoetes, figures 516 to 519, are very unlike club mosses in aspect, but have been associated with them. They look more like rushes and live in water, or partly out of it. A very short stem, like a corm, bears a cluster of roots underneath. Above, it is covered by the broad bases of a cluster of awl-shaped, or thread-shaped, leaves. The spore cases are immersed in the bases of the leaves. The outer leaf bases contain numerous macrospores. The inner are filled with innumerable microspores. Illustration, figure 520, plant of Marsilia quadrifoliata, reduced in size. At the right, a pair of sporocarps of about natural size. The pillworts, Marsilia and Pillularia, are low aquatics, which bear globular or pill-shaped fruit, sporocarps, on the lower part of their leaf stalks or on their slender creeping stems. The leaves of the commoner species of Marsilia might be taken for four-leafed clover. See figure 520. The sporocarps are usually raised on a short stalk. Within, they are divided lengthwise by a partition, and then crosswise by several partitions. These partitions bear numerous delicate sacs or spore cases of two kinds intermixed. The larger ones contain each a large spore or macrospore. The smaller contain numerous microspores immersed in mucilage. At maturity, the fruit bursts or splits open at top, and the two kinds of spores are discharged. The large ones, in germination, produce a small prothallus, upon which the contents of the microspores act in the same way as in ferns, and with a similar result. Azola is a little floating plant looking like a small liverwort or moss. Its branches are covered with minute and scale-shaped leaves, on the underside of the branches are found egg-shaped, thin-walled sporocarps of two kinds. The small ones open across and discharge microspores. The larger burst irregularly and bring to view globose spore cases attached to the bottom of the sporocarp by a slender stalk. 
These delicate spore cases burst and set free about four macrospores, which are fertilized at germination in the manner of the pillworts and quillworts. See figures 521 to 526. Illustration, figure 521. Small plant of Azola caroliniana. 522. Portion magnified, showing the two kinds of sporocarp. The small ones contain microspores. 523 represents one more magnified. 524. The larger sporocarp, more magnified. 525. Same, more magnified and burst open, showing stalked spore cases. 526. Two of the latter, highly magnified. One of them, bursting, shows four contained macrospores. Between the two, three of these spores highly magnified. Cellular cryptogams are so called because composed, even in their higher forms, of cellular tissue only, without proper wood cells or vessels. Many of the lower kinds are mere plates or ribbons, or simple rows of cells, or even single cells. But their highest orders follow the plan of ferns and phanerogamous plants in having stem and leaves for their upward growth, and commonly roots, or at least rootlets, to attach them to the soil, or to trunks, or to other bodies on which they grow. Plants of this grade are chiefly mosses, so as a whole they take the name of bryophyta, bryophytes in English form, bryum being the Greek name of a moss. These plants are of two principal kinds, true mosses, musci, which is their Latin name in the plural, and hepatic mosses or liverworts, hepatici. Illustration, figure 527, single plant of physcomitrium piriformi, magnified. 528. Top of a leaf cut across. It consists of a single layer of cells. Mosses or musci. The pale peat mosses, species of sphagnum, the principal component of sphagnus bogs, and the strong-growing hair-cap moss, polytrichum, are among the larger and commoner representatives of this numerous family, while fountain moss, fontinalis, in running water sometimes attains the length of a yard or more. On the other hand, some are barely individually distinguishable to the naked eye. Figure 527 represents a common little moss, enlarged to about twelve times its natural size, and by its side is part of a leaf, much magnified, showing that it is composed of cellular tissue, parenchyma cells, only. The leaves of mosses are always simple, distinct, and sessile on the stem. The fructification is an urn-shaped spore case, in this case, as in most cases, raised on a slender stalk. The spore case loosely bears on its summit a thin and pointed cap, like a candle extinguisher, called a calyptra. Detaching this, it is found that the spore case is like a pyxis, that is, the top at maturity comes off as a lid, operculum, and that the interior is filled with a green powder, the spores, which are discharged through the open mouth. In most mosses there is a fringe of one or two rows of teeth or membrane around this mouth or orifice, the peristome. When moist, the peristome closes hygrometrically over the orifice, more or less. When drier, the teeth or processes commonly bend outwards or recurve, and then the spores more readily escape. In hair-cap moss, a membrane is stretched quite across the mouth, like a drumhead, retaining the spores until this wears away. See figures 527 to 541 for details. Fertilization in mosses is by the analogues of stamens and pistils, which are hidden in the axils of leaves or in the cluster of leaves at the end of the stem. The analogue of the anther, antheridium, is a cellular sac, which in bursting discharges innumerable delicate cells floating in a mucilaginous liquid. Each of these bursts and sets free a vibratile self-moving thread, these threads, one or more, reach the orifice of the pistil-shaped body, the pistillidium, and act upon a particular cell at its base within. This cell in its growth develops into the spore case and its stalk, when there is any, carrying on its summit the wall of the pistillidium, which becomes the calyptra. Illustration, figure 529, Mneum cuspidatum, smaller than nature. 530, its calyptra, detached, enlarged. 531. Its spore case with top of stalk, magnified. The lid, 532, being detached, the outer peristome appears. 533. Part of a cellular ring, 
annulus, which was under the lid, outside of the peristome, more magnified. 534. Some of the outer and of the inner peristome, consisting of jointed teeth, much magnified. 535. Antheridia and Epistolidium, the so-called flower, at end of a stem of same plant, the leaves torn away. Male Antheridia, female Pistolidium, magnified. 536. A bursting Antheridium, and some of the accompanying jointed threads, highly magnified. 537. Summit of an open spore case of a moss, which has a peristome of sixteen pairs of teeth. 538. The double peristome of a hypnum. 539 to 541. Spore case, detached calyptra, and top of more enlarged spore case and detached lid of physcomitrium piriformi. Figure 527. Orifice shows that there is no peristome. Liverworts or hepatic mosses, hepatici, in some kinds resemble true mosses, having distinct stem and leaves, although their leaves occasionally run together, while in others there is no distinction of stem and leaf, but the whole plant is a leaf-like body, which produces rootlets on the lower face and its fructification on the upper. Those of the moss-like kind, sometimes called scale mosses, have their tender spore cases splitting into four valves, and with their spores are intermixed some slender, spiral, and very hygrometric threads, called elators, which are thought to aid in the dispersion of the spores. Figures 542 to 544. Illustration, figure 542, fructification of a younger mania, magnified, its cellular spore stalk, surrounded at base by some of the leaves, at summit the four-valved spore case opening, discharging spores and elators. 543. Two elators and some spores from the same, highly magnified. Illustration, figure 544. One of the frondose liverworts, Stetia, otherwise like a younger mania. The spore case not yet protruded from its sheath. Marcantia, the commonest and largest of the true liverworts, forms large green plates or fronds on damp and shady ground, and sends up from some part of the upper face a stout stalk, ending in a several-lobed umbrella-shaped body, under the lobes of which hang several thin-walled spore cases, which burst open and discharge spores and elators. Rickia natans, figure 545, consists of wedge-shaped or heart-shaped fronds, which float free in pools of still water. The underface bears copious rootlets. In the substance of the upper face are the spore cases, their pointed tips merely projecting. There they burst open and discharge their spores. These are comparatively few and large, and are in fours, so they are very like the macrospores of pillworts or quillworts. Thallophyta, or thallophytes in English form. This is the name for the lower class of cellular cryptogams, plants in which there is no marked distinction into root, stem, and leaves. Roots in any proper sense they never have as organs for absorbing although some of the larger seaweeds, such as the sea colander, figure 553, have them as holdfasts. Instead of axis and foliage, there is a stratum of frond, in such plants commonly called a thallus, by a strained use of a Greek and Latin word which means a green shoot or bough, which may have any kind of form, leaf-like, stem-like, branchy, extended to a flat plate, or gathered into a sphere, or drawn out into threads, or reduced to a single row of cells, or even reduced to single cells. Indeed, thallophytes are so multifarious, so numerous in kinds, so protean in their stages and transformations, so recondite in their fructification, and many so microscopic in size, either of the plant itself or its essential organs, that they have to be elaborately described in separate books and made subjects of special study. Illustration. Figures 545-546. Two plants of Rickia natans, about natural size. 547. Magnified section of a part of the frond, showing two immersed spore cases and one emptied space. 548. Magnified section of a spore case with some spores. 549. Magnified spore case torn out and spores. One figure of the spores united, the other of the four separated. Nevertheless, it may be well to try to give some general idea 
of what algae and lichens and fungi are. Linnaeus had them all under the orders of algae and fungi. Afterwards the lichens were separated, but of late it has been made most probable that a lichen consists of an alga and a fungus conjoined. At least it must be so in some of the ambiguous forms. Botanists are in the way of bringing out new classifications of the thallophytes, as they come to understand their structure and relations better. Here it need only be said that lichens live in the air, that is, on the ground, or on rocks, trunks, walls, and the like, and grow when moistened by rains. They assimilate air, water, and some earthy matter, just as do ordinary plants. Algae, or seaweeds, live in water, and live the same kind of life as do ordinary plants. Fungi, whatever medium they inhabit, live as animals do, upon organic matter, upon what other plants have assimilated, or upon the products of their decay. True as these general distinctions are, it is no less true that these orders run together in their lowest forms, and that algae and fungi may be traced down into forms so low and simple that no clear line can be drawn between them, and even into forms of which it is uncertain whether they should be called plants or animals. It is as well to say that they are not high enough in rank to be distinctively either the one or the other. On the other hand, there is a peculiar group of plants which, in simplicity of composition, resemble the simpler algae, while in fructification and in the arrangements of their simple cells into stem and branches, they seem to be of a higher order. Namely, illustration, figure 550, branch of a chara, about natural size. 551, a fruiting portion, magnified, showing the structure, a sporocarp and an antheridium. 552, outlines of a portion of the stem in section, showing the central cell and the outer or cortical cells. Characeae. These are aquatic herbs of considerable size, abounding in ponds. The simple kinds, Nitella, have the stem formed of a single row of tubular cells, and at the nodes, or junction of the cells, a whorl of similar branches. Chara, figures 550 to 552, is the same, except that the cells which make up the stem and the principal branches are strengthened by a coating of many smaller tubular cells, applied to the surface of the main or central cell. The fructification consists of a globular sporocarp of considerable size, which is spirally enwrapped by tubular cells twisted around it. By the side of this is a smaller and globular antheridium. The latter breaks up into eight shield-shaped pieces with an internal stalk and bearing long and ribbon-shaped filaments, which consist of a row of delicate cells, each of which discharges a free-moving microscopic thread the analogue of the pollen or pollen tube, nearly in the manner of ferns and mosses. One of these threads reaches and fertilises a cell at the apex of the nucleus or solid body of the sporocarp. This subsequently germinates and forms a new individual. Algae or seaweeds. The proper seaweeds may be studied by the aid of Professor Farlow's Marine Algae of New England, the freshwater species by Professor H. C. Wood's Freshwater Algae of North America, a larger and less accessible volume. A few common forms are here very briefly mentioned and illustrated to give an idea of the family, but they are of almost endless diversity. Illustration, figure 553, Agarum turneri, sea colander, so called from the perforations with which the frond, as it grows, becomes riddled very much reduced in size. Illustration, figure 554, upper end of a rockweed, Fucus fasciculosus, reduced half or more. B, the fructification. The common rockweed, Fucus fasciculosus, figure 554, abounding between high and low water mark on the coast. The rarer sea colander, Agarum turneri, figure 553, and laminaria, of which the larger forms are called devil's aprons, are good representatives of the olive green or brownish seaweeds. They are attached either by a disc-like base or by root-like holdfasts to the rocks or stones on which they grow. Illustration, figure 555, magnified section through a fertile conceptacle of rockweed, showing the large spores in the midst of threads of cells. 556, 
similar section of a sterile conceptacle containing slender antheridia from farlow's marine algae of new england the hollow and inflated places in the fucus fasciculosus or rockweed figure 554 are air bladders for buoyancy the fructification forms in the substance of the tips of the frond the rough dots mark the places where the conceptacles open the spores and the fertilizing cells are in different plants sections of the two kinds of conceptacles are given in figures 555 and 556 the contents of the conceptacles are discharged through a small orifice which in each figure is at the margin of the page the large spores are formed eight together in a mother cell the minute motile filaments of the antheridia fertilize the large spores after injection into the water and then the latter promptly acquire a cell wall and germinate the floridii or rose red series of marine algae which however are sometimes green or brownish are the most attractive to amateurs the delicate porphyra or laver is in some countries eaten as a delicacy and the cartilaginous chondrus crispus has been largely used for jelly besides their conceptacles which contain true spores figure five six o they mostly have a fructification in tetraspores that is of spores originating in fours figure five five nine illustration figure five five seven small plant of chondrus crispus or carrageen moss reduced in size in fruit the spots represent the fructification consisting of numerous tetraspores in bunches in the substance of the plant five five eight section through the thickness of one of the lobes magnified passing through two of the embedded fruit clusters five five nine two of its tetraspores spores in fours highly magnified illustration figure five six o oh, section through a conceptacle of delesseria lepriorii much magnified showing the spores which are single specialized cells two or three in a row illustration figure five six one a piece of the rose red delesseria lepriorii double natural size five six two a piece cut out and much magnified showing that it is composed of a layer of cells five six three a few of the cells more highly magnified the cells are gelatinous and thick-walled the grass green algae sometimes form broad membranous fronds such as those of the common ulva of the seashore but most of them form mere threads either simple or branched to this division belong almost all the freshwater algae such as those which constitute the silky threads or green slime of running streams or standing pools and which were all called confervas before their immense diversity was known some are formed of a single row of cells developed each from the end of another others branch the top of one cell producing more than one new one figure five six four others of a kind which is very common in fresh water simple threads made of a line of cells have the chlorophyll and protoplasm of each cell arranged in spiral lines or bands they form spores in a peculiar way which gives to this family the designation of conjugating algae illustration figure five six four the growing end of a branching conferva cladophora glomerata much magnified showing how by a kind of budding growth a new cell is formed by a cross partition separating the newer tip from the older part below also how the branches arise illustration figure five six five two magnified individuals of a spirogyra forming spores by conjugation a completed spore at base above successive stages of the conjugation are represented at a certain time two parallel threads approach each other more closely contiguous parts of a cell of each thread bulge or grow out and unite when they meet the cell wall partitions between them are absorbed so as to open a free communication the spiral band of green matter in both cells breaks up the whole of that of one cell passes over into the other and of the united contents a large green spore is formed soon the old cells decay and the spore set free is ready to germinate figure five six five represents several stages of the conjugating process which however would never be found altogether like this in one pair of threads illustration figure five six six clostarium acutum a common desmid moderately magnified it is a single firm-celled wall 
filled with green protoplasmic matter. Illustration figure 567. More magnified view of three stages of the conjugation of a pair of the same. Desmids and diatomes, which are microscopic one-celled plants of the same class, conjugate in the same way, as is shown in a clostidium by figures 566-567. Here, the whole living contents of two individuals are incorporated into one spore for a fresh start. A reproduction which costs the life of two individuals to make a single new one would be fatal to the species if there were not a provision for multiplication by the prompt division of the new formed individual into two, and these again into two, and so on, in geometrical ratio. And the costly process would be meaningless if there were not some real advantage in such a fresh start, that is, in sexes. Illustration, figure 568. Early stage of a species of Botridium, a globose cell. 569, 570, stages of growth. 571, full-grown plant, extended and ramified below, in a root-like way. 572, a voucheria, single cell grown on into a much-branched thread, the end of some branches enlarging, and the green contents in one, A, there condensed into a spore. 573, more magnified view of A, and the mature spore escaping. 574, bryopsis plumosa, apex of a stem with its branchlets, all the extension of one cell, variously magnified. There are other algae of the grass-green series which consist of single cells, but which, by continued growth, form plants of considerable size. Three kinds of these are represented in figures 568 to 574. Lichens, Latin lichenes, are to be studied in the works of the late Professor Tuckerman, but a popular exposition is greatly needed. The subjoined illustrations, figures 575 to 580, may simply indicate what some of the commoner forms are like. The cup or shield-shaped spot or knob which bears the fructification is named the apothecium. This is mainly composed of slender sacs, ASCII, having thread-shaped cells intermixed, and each ascus contains few or several spores, which are commonly double or treble. Most lichens are flat expansions of greyish hue, some of them foliaceous in texture, but never of bright green colour. More are crustaceous, some are wholly pulverulent and nearly formless but in several the vegetation lengthens into an axis, as in figure 580, or imitates stem and branches or threads, as in the reindeer moss on the ground in our northern woods, and the usnea hanging from the boughs of old trees overhead. Illustration, figure 575, a stone on which various lichens are growing, such as, passing from left to right, a parmelia, a sticta, and on the right, Lecidia geographica, so called from its patches resembling the outline of islands or continents, as depicted upon maps. 576. Piece of thallus of Parmelia conspersa, with section through an apothecium. 577. Section of a smaller apothecium enlarged. 578. Two ASCII of same, and contained spores, and accompanying filaments, more magnified. 579, piece of thallus of a sticta, with section showing the immersed apothecia. The small openings of these dot the surface. 580, Cladonia coccinea. The fructification is in the scarlet knobs which surround the cups. Fungi. For this immense and greatly diversified class, it must here suffice to indicate the parts of a mushroom, a sphyria, and of one or two common moulds. The true vegetation of common fungi consists of slender cells which form what is called a mycelium. These filamentous cells lengthen and branch, growing by the absorption through their whole surface of the decaying or organizable or living matter which they feed upon. In a mushroom, agaricus, a knobby mass is at length formed which develops into a stout stalk, stipe, bearing the cap, pileus. The underside of the cap is covered by the hymenium, in this genus consisting of radiating plates, the gills or lamellae, and these bear the powdery spores in immense numbers. 
Under the microscope, the gills are found to be studded with projecting cells, each of which, at the top, produces four stalked spores. These form the powder which collects on a sheet of paper, upon which a mature mushroom is allowed to rest for a day or two. Figures 581 to 586. The esculent morel, also sphyria, figures 585, 586, and many other fungi, bear their spores in sacs, ASCII, exactly in the manner of lichens. Illustration, figure 581. Agaricus campestris, the common edible mushroom. 582. Section of cap and stalk. 583. Minute portion of a section of a gill, showing some spore-bearing cells, much magnified. 584. One of these, with its four spores, more magnified. Illustration, figure 585. Sphyria rosella. 586. Two of the ASCII and contained double spores, quite like those of a lichen, much magnified. Of the moulds, one of the commoner is the bread mould, figure 587. In fruiting, it sends up a slender stalk, which bears a globular sac. This bursts at maturity and discharges innumerable spores. The blue cheese mould, figure 588, bears a cluster of branches at top, each of which is a row of naked spores, like a string of beads, all breaking apart at maturity. Botrytis, figure 589, the fruiting stalk of which branches, and each branch is tipped with a spore, is one of the many moulds which live and feed upon the juices of other plants, and are often very destructive. The extremely numerous kinds of smut, rust, mildew, the ferments, bacteria and the like, many of them very destructive to other vegetable and to animal life, are also low forms of the class of fungi. Illustration, figure 587, Ascophora, the bread mould. 588, Aspergillus glaucus, the mould of cheese, but common on mouldy vegetables. 589, a species of botrytis, all magnified. End of section 20. Section 21 of the Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray. Section 18. Classification and Nomenclature. Classification in botany is the consideration of plants in respect to their kinds and relationships. Some system of nomenclature, or naming, is necessary for fixing and expressing botanical knowledge so as to make it available. The vast multiplicity of plants, and the various degrees of their relationship, imperatively require order and system, not only as to names for designating the kinds of plants, but also as to terms for defining their differences. Nomenclature is concerned with the names of plants. Terminology supplies names of organs or parts, and terms to designate their differences. 1. Kinds and Relationship Plants and animals have two great peculiarities. First, they form themselves, and second, they multiply themselves. They reproduce their kind in a continued succession of individuals. Mineral things occur as masses, which are divisible into smaller and still smaller ones without alteration of properties. But organic things, vegetables and animals, exist as individual beings. Each owes its existence to a parent and produces similar individuals in its turn. So each individual is a link of a chain, and to this chain the natural historian applies the name of species. All the descendants from the same stock therefore compose one species, and it was from our observing that the several sorts of plants or animals steadily reproduce themselves, or, in other words, keep up a succession of similar individuals, that the idea of species originated. There are few species, however, in which man has actually observed the succession for many generations. It could seldom be proved that all the white pine trees or white oaks of any forest came from the same stock, but observation having familiarized us with the general fact that individuals proceeding from the same stock are essentially alike, 
we infer from their close resemblance that these similar individuals belong to the same species. That is, we infer it when the individuals are as much like each other as those are which we know or confidently suppose to have sprung from the same stock. Identity in species is inferred from close similarity in all essential respects, or whenever the differences, however considerable, are not known or reasonably supposed to have been originated in the course of time under changed conditions. No two individuals are exactly alike. A tendency to variation pervades all living things. In cultivation, where variations are looked after and cared for, very striking differences come to light. And if in wild nature they are less common or less conspicuous, it is partly because they are uncared for. When such variant forms are pretty well marked, they are called varieties. The white oak, for example, presents two or three varieties in the shape of the leaves, although they may be all alike upon each particular tree. The question often arises, and it is often hard to answer, whether the difference in a particular case is that of a variety or is specific. If the former, it may commonly be proved by finding such intermediate degrees of difference in various individuals as to show that no clear distinction can be drawn between them, or else by observing the variety to vary back again in some of its offspring. The sorts of apples, pears, potatoes, and the like show that differences which are permanent in the individual and continue unchanged through a long series of generations when propagated by division as by offsets, cuttings, grafts, bulbs, tubers, etc., are not likely to be reproduced by seed. Still they sometimes are so, and perhaps always tend in that direction, for the fundamental law in organic nature is that offspring shall be like parent. Races are such strongly marked varieties capable of coming true to seed. The different sorts of wheat, maize, peas, radishes, etc., are familiar examples. By selecting those individuals of a species which have developed or inherited any desirable peculiarity, keeping them from mingling with their less promising brethren, and selecting again the most promising plants raised from their seeds, the cultivator may in a few generations render almost any variety transmissible by seed, so long as it is cared for and kept apart. In fact, this is the way the cultivated domestic races, so useful to man, have been fixed and preserved. Races, in fact, can hardly, if at all, be said to exist independently of man, but man does not really produce them. Such peculiarities, often surprising enough, now and then originate. We know not how. The plant sports, as the gardeners say. They are only preserved, propagated, and generally further developed by the cultivator's skillful care. If left alone, they are likely to dwindle and perish, or else revert to the original form of the species. Vegetable races are commonly annuals, which can be kept up only by seed, or herbs of which a succession of generations can be had every year or two, and so the education by selection be completed without great lapse of time. But all fruit trees could probably be fixed into races in an equal number of generations. Bud varieties are those which spring from buds instead of seed. They are uncommon to any marked extent. They are sometimes called sports, but this name is equally applied to variations among seedlings. Crossbreeds, strictly so called, are the variations which come from cross-fertilizing one variety of a species with another. Hybrids are the varieties, if they may be so called, which come from crossing of species. Only nearly related species can be hybridized, and the resulting progeny is usually self-sterile, but not always. Hybrid plants, however, may often be fertilized and made prolific by the pollen of one or the other parent. This produces another kind of crossbreeds. Species are the units in classification. Varieties, although of utmost importance in cultivation and of considerable consequence in the flora of any country, are of less botanical significance, for they are apt to be indefinite and to shade off one form into another. But species, the botanist expects to be distinct, 
Indeed, the practical difference to the botanist between species and varieties is the definite limitation of the one and the indefiniteness of the other. The botanist's determination is partly a matter of observation, partly of judgment. In an enlarged view, varieties may be incipient species, and nearly related species probably come from a common stock in earlier times. For there is every reason to believe that existing vegetation came from the more or less changed vegetation of a preceding geological era. However that may be, species are regarded as permanent and essentially unchanged in their succession of individuals through the actual ages. There are, at nearly the lowest computation, as many as 100,000 species of phanerogamous plants, and the cryptogamous species are thought to be still more numerous. They are all connected by resemblances or relationships, near and remote, which show that they are all parts of one system, realizations in nature, as we may affirm, of the conception of one mind. As we survey them, they do not form a single and connected chain, stretching from the lowest to the highest organized species, although there obviously are lower and higher grades, but the species throughout group themselves, as it were, into clusters or constellations, and these into still more comprehensive clusters, and so on, with gaps between. It is this clustering which is the ground of the recognition of kinds of species, that is, of groups of species, of successive grades, or degree of generality, such as that of similar species into genera, of genera into families or orders, of orders into classes. In classification the sequence, proceeding from higher or more general, to lower or special, is always class, order, genus, species, variety if need be. Genera, in the singular genus, are assemblages of closely related species in which the essential parts are all constructed on the same particular type or plan. White oak, red oak, scarlet oak, live oak, etc., are so many species of the oak genus, Latin quercus. The chestnuts compose another genus, the beeches another. The apple, pear, and crab are species of one genus, the quince represents another, the various species of hawthorn a third. In the animal kingdom, the common cat, the wild cat, the panther, the tiger, the leopard, and the lion are species of the cat kind or genus, while the dog, the jackal, the different species of wolf, and the foxes compose another genus. Some genera are represented by a vast number of species, others by few, very many by only one known species, for the genus may be as perfectly represented in one species as in several, although, if this were the case throughout, genera and species would of course be identical. The beech genus and the chestnut genus would be just as distinct from the oak genus even if but one beech and chestnut were known, as indeed was once the case. Orders are groups of genera which resemble each other, that is, they are to genera what genera are to species. As familiar illustrations, the oak, chestnut, and beech genera, along with the hazel genus and the hornbeams, all belong to one order. The birches and the alders make another, the poplars and willows another, the walnuts with the butternut and the hickories still another. The apple genus, the quince and the hawthorns, along with the plums and cherries and the peach, the raspberry with the blackberry, the strawberry, the rose, belong to a large order which takes its name from the rose. Most botanists use the names order and family synonymously, the latter more popularly, as the rose family, the former more technically, as order rosaceae. But when the two are distinguished, as is common in zoology, Family is of lower grade than order. Classes are still more comprehensive assemblages, or great groups. Thus, in modern botany, the dicotyledonous plants compose one class, the monocotyledonous plants another. These four grades, class, order, genus, species, are of universal use. Variety comes in upon occasion. For although a species may have no recognized varieties, a genus implies at least one species belonging to it. Every genus is of some order, and every order of some class. 
but these grades by no means exhaust the resources of classification, nor suffice for the elucidation of all the distinctions which botanists recognize. In the first place, a higher grade than that of class is needful for the most comprehensive of divisions, that of all plants into the two series of phanerogamous and cryptogamous, and in natural history there are the two kingdoms or realms, the vegetable and the animal. Moreover, the stages of the scaffolding have been variously extended as required by the recognition of assemblages, lower than class but higher than order, viz. subclass and cohort, or lower than order, a suborder, or between this and genus, a tribe, or between this and tribe, a subtribe, or between genus and species, a subgenus, and by some a species has been divided into subspecies and a variety into subvarieties. Last of all are individuals. Suffice it to remember that the following are the principal grades in classification, with the proper sequence, also that only those here printed in small capitals are fundamental and universal in botany. Series, class, subclass, cohort, order or family, suborder, tribe, subtribe genus, subgenus, or section, species, variety. 2. Names, terms, and characters. The name of a plant is the name of its genus followed by that of the species. The name of the genus answers to the surname or family name, that of the species to the baptismal name of a person. Thus Quercus is the name of the oak genus, Quercus alba, that of the white oak, Quercus rubra, that of the red oak, Quercus nigra, that of the blackjack, etc. Botanical names being Latin or Latinized, the adjective name of the species comes after that of the genus. Names of genera are of one word, a substantive. The older ones are mostly classical Latin or Greek adopted into Latin, such as Quercus for the oak genus, Phagus for the beech, Coralus the hazel, and the like. But as more genera become known, botanists had new names to make or borrow. Many are named from some appearance or property of the flowers, leaves, or other parts of the plant. To take a few examples from the early pages of the Manual of the Botany of the Northern United States, the genus Hepatica comes from the shape of the leaf resembling that of the liver. Myosurus means mousetail. Delphinium is from delphin, a dolphin, and alludes to the shape of the flower, which was thought to resemble the classical figures of the dolphin. Xanthoriza is from two Greek words meaning yellow root, the common name of the plant. Simisifuga is formed of two Latin words meaning to drive away bugs, i.e. bugbane, the Siberian species being used to keep away such vermin. Sanguinaria, the bloodroot, is named from the blood-like color of its juice. Other genera are dedicated to distinguished botanists or promoters of science and bear their names, such as Magnolia, which commemorates the early French botanist Magnol, and Jeffersonia, named after President Jefferson, who sent the first exploring expedition over the Rocky Mountains. Others bear the name of the discoverer of the plant, as Saracenia, dedicated to Dr. Sarazin of Quebec who was one of the first to send the common pitcher plant to the botanists of Europe, and Claytonia, first made known by the early Virginian botanist Clayton. Names of Species The name of a species is also a single word appended to that of the genus. It is commonly an adjective, and therefore agrees with the generic name in case, gender, etc. Sometimes it relates to the country the species inhabits, as Claytonia virginica first made known from Virginia, Sanguinaria canadensis, from Canada, etc. More commonly it denotes some obvious or characteristic trait of the species, as for example, in Saracenia, our northern species is named purpurea, from the purple blossoms, while a more southern one is named flava, because its petals are yellow. The species of Jeffersonia is called defila, meaning two-leaved, because its leaf is divided into two leaflets. Some species are named after the discoverer, or in complement to a botanist who has made them known, as Magnolia Fraseri, named after the botanist Fraser, one of the first to find this species. 
and Saracenia drummondi for a pitcher plant found by Mr. Drummond in Florida. Such personal specific names are of course written with a capital initial letter. Occasionally some old substantive name is used for the species, as Magnolia umbrella, the umbrella tree, and Ranunculus flammula. These are also written with a capital initial, and need not accord with the generic name and gender. Geographical specific names, such as Canadensis, Caroliniana, Americana, in the latter usage are by some written without a capital initial, but the older usage is better, or at least more accordant with English orthography. Varietal names, when any are required, are made on the plan of specific names and follow these with the prefix var. Ranunculus flammula, variety reptans, the creeping variety. Ranunculus abertivus, variety micranthus, the small flowered variety of the species. In recording the name of a plant, it is usual to append the name, or an abbreviation of the name, of the botanist who first published it, and in a flora or other systematic work this reference to the source of the name is completed by a further citation of the name of the book, the volume, and page where it was first published. So Ranunculus Acris L means that this buttercup was first so named and described by Linnaeus. Ranunculus Multifidus Persh that this species was so named and published by Persh. The suffix is no part of the name but is an abbreviated reference to be added or omitted as convenience or definiteness may require. The authority for a generic name is similarly recorded. Thus, Renunculus L means that the genus was so named by Linnaeus. Myosurus Dill means that the mouse tail was established as a genus under this name by Delenius. Colophyllum, M-I-C-H-X that the blue cohosh was published under this name by Michaud. The full reference in the last named instance would be in Flora Borelli Americana, first volume, 205th page, in the customary abbreviation M-I-C-H-X, F-L, I-205. Names of orders are given in the plural number and are commonly formed by prolonging the name of a genus of the group taken as a representative of it. For example, the order of which the buttercup or crowfoot genus, Ranunculus, is the representative, takes from it the name of Ranunculaceae, meaning Plantae Ranunculaceae, when written out in full, that is, Ranunculaceous plants. Some old descriptive names of orders are kept up, such as Cruciferae, for the order to which cress and mustard belong, from the cruciform appearance of their expanded corolla, and Umbelliferae from the flowers being in umbels. Names of tribes, also of suborders, subtribes, and the like, are plurals of the names of the typical genus, less prolonged, usually in ei, ini, idi, etc. Thus the proper buttercup tribe is ranunculiae, of the clematis tribe, clematididae, while the rose family is rosaceae, the special rose tribe is rosiae. Names of classes, etc. For these, see the following synopsis of the actual classification adopted. So a plant is named in two words, the generic and the specific names, to which may be added a third, that of the variety, upon occasion. The generic name is peculiar. Obviously, it must not be used twice over in botany. The specific name must not be used twice over in the same genus, but is free for any other genus. A Quercus alba, or white oak, is no hindrance to Betula alba, or white birch, and so of other names. Characters and Descriptions Plants are characterized by a terse statement, in botanical terms, of their peculiarities or distinguishing marks. The character of the order should include nothing which is common to the whole class it belongs to, that of the genus, nothing which is common to the order, that of the species, nothing that is shared with all other species of the genus, and so of other divisions. Descriptions may enter into complete details of the whole structure. Terminology, also called glossology, is nomenclature applied to organs or parts in their forms or modifications. Each organ or special part has a substantive name of its own. 
shapes and other modifications of an organ or part are designated by adjective terms or when the forms are peculiar substantive terms are given to them by the correct use of such botanical terms and by proper subordination of the characters under the order genus species etc plants may be described and determined with much precision the classical language of botany is latin while modern languages have their own names and terms these usually lack the precision of the latin or latinized botanical terminology fortunately this latinized terminology has been largely adopted and incorporated into the english technical language of botany thus securing precision and these terms are largely the basis of specific names of plants a glossary or vocabulary of the principal botanical terms used in phanerogamous and vascular cryptogamous botany is appended to this volume to which the student may refer as occasion arises three system two systems of classification used to be recognized in botany the artificial and the natural but only the latter is now thought to deserve the name of a system artificial classifications have for object merely the ascertaining of the name and place of a plant they do not attempt to express relationships but serve as a kind of dictionary they distribute the genera and species according to some one peculiarity or set of peculiarities just as a dictionary distributes words according to their first letters disregarding all other considerations at present an artificial classification in botany is needed only as a key to the natural orders as an aid in referring an unknown plant to its proper family and such keys are still very needful at least for the beginner formerly when the orders themselves were not clearly made out, an artificial classification was required to lead the student down to the genus. Two such classifications were long in vogue. First, that of Tournefort, founded mainly on the leaves of the flowers, the calyx and corolla. This was the prevalent system throughout the first half of the 18th century, but it has long since gone by. It was succeeded by the well-known artificial system of Linnaeus, which was founded on the stamens and pistils. It consists of twenty-four classes, and of a variable number of orders. The classes founded mainly on the number and disposition of the stamens, the orders partly upon the number of styles or stigmas, partly upon other considerations. Useful and popular as this system was down to a time within the memory of still surviving botanists, it is now completely obsolete but the tradition of it survives in the names of its classes menandria diandria triandria etc which are familiar in terminology in the adjective terms menandrus diandrus triandrus etc also of the orders monogyna digyna trigyna etc preserved in the form of monogynus digynus trigynus etc and in the name cryptogamia that of the twenty-fourth class which is continued for the lower series in the natural classification natural system a genuine system of botany consists of the orders or families duly arranged under their classes and having the tribes the genera and the species arranged in them according to their relationships this when properly carried out is the natural system because it is intended to express as well as possible the various degrees of relationship among plants as presented in nature that is to rank those species and those genera etc next to each other in the classification which are really most alike in all respects or in other words which are constructed most nearly on the same particular plan there can be only one natural system of botany if by this term is meant the plan according to which the vegetable creation was called into being with all its grades and diversities among the species as well of past as of the present time but there may be many natural systems if we mean the attempts of men to interpret and express that plan systems which will vary with advancing knowledge and with the judgment and skill of different botanists these must all be very imperfect bear the impress of individual minds and be shaped by the current philosophy of the age but the endeavour always is to make the classification answer to nature as far as any system can which has to be expressed in a definite and serial arrangement 
so although the classes orders genera etc are natural or as natural as the systematist can make them their grouping or order of arrangement in a book must necessarily be in great measure artificial indeed it is quite impossible to arrange the orders or even the few classes in a single series and yet have each group stand next to its nearest relatives on both sides especially it should be understood that although phanerogamous plants are of higher grade than cryptogamous and angiospermous or ordinary phanerogamous higher than the gymnospermous yet there is no culmination in the vegetable kingdom nor any highest or lowest order of phanerogamous plants the particular system most largely used at present in the classification of the orders is essentially the following series one phanerogamia phanerogamous or flowering plants class one dicotyledones angiospermiae called for shortness in english dicotyledons or dicotyls ovules in a closed ovary embryo dicotyledonous stem with exogenous plan of growth leaves reticulate veined artificial division one polypetali with petals mostly present and distinct orders about eighty in number ranunculaceae to cornaceae artificial division two gamopetali with gimbopetalus corolla order is about forty five caprifoliaceae to plantagenaceae artificial division three apetali or incompleti with perianth when present of calyx only orders about thirty five in number from nictagenaceae to salicaceae class two dicotyledones gymnospermiae in english gymnosperms no ovary or pericarp but ovules and seeds naked and no proper calyx nor corolla embryo dicotyledonous or polycotyledonous stem with exogenous plan of growth leaves mostly parallel veined consists of order nitaceae which strictly connects with angiospermous dicotyls or coniferae and of cycadaceae class three monocotyledones in english monocotyledons or monocotyls angiospermous embryo monocotyledonous stem with endogenous plan of growth leaves mostly parallel veined division one petaloidei perianth complete having the equivalent of both calyx and corolla and all the inner series coralline about eighteen orders division two calycinae perianth complete in two series but not coralline mostly thickish or glumaceous chiefly two orders juncaceae the true rushes and palmi palms division three spadicaflori or nudiflori perianth none or rudimentary and incomplete inflorescence spadaceous of five orders typhaceae and aroidae the principal division four glumaceae perianth none or very rudimentary glumaceous bracts to the flowers orders mainly cyperaceae and graminiae series two cryptogamia cryptogamous or flowerless plants class one pteridophyta pteridophytes class two bryophyta bryophytes class three thallophyta thallophytes end of section twenty one